Graham. No, no, no. Time ever rise being 7 o'clock, Monday, February 3rd, Finance this Committee. I call it to order. Before we go into the agenda, a couple uh, pieces of information, counselors. Uh, as you may recall, uh, at the inaugural day, we were, I, I indicated that we'd be doing a joint meeting. The school committee, Mayor Carpenter, and the two representatives for the Southeastern Regional uh, each quarter. Uh, the first date has been uh, assigned. If you could write it down, please. It's going to be Thursday, February 13th, 7 p.m. at West Middle School in the cafeteria. The next quarter we'll do probably East Middle School, followed by South Middle School, followed by North. So West Middle School, 7 p.m., Thursday the 13th. I hope everybody can attend. Ordinance meeting will be held tomorrow night, 6 o'clock. I know the chair, Ms. Dianeri, will uh, give you a reminder. He'll be here in the chamber. Um, got some uh, information today. Louis Tataglia uh, from the Board of Health is under the weather tonight. I did speak to Councilor Azak. I know she has a resolve. Uh, we will talk, to that, talk about that, but Louis will not be able to attend this evening. Uh, also, uh, as chair, I'm going to inform each and every one of you that I am going to be inviting Mayor Carpenter to appear before the Finance Committee going forward uh, throughout the legislative session for any financial matters that he puts forward. I know the CFO always comes here, but I'd like the Mayor here as well to advocate. I think it puts Jay somewhat at a disadvantage, so I, I will invite the Mayor going forward. I do have a meeting with the Mayor. Uh, we will be having our first meeting, uh, City Council President and, and the Mayor, this Friday, 4 o'clock. We'll be doing a standing meeting every two weeks. Uh, again, the mayor was away in D.C., so this will be our first meeting. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Manny Gomes. As you know, Manny Gomes, as of last Friday, is no longer the Brockton Police Chief, but in his capacity as chief, he came before this committee many, many times, answered the tough questions, and really represented himself well. He is going back to cap he is back to captain status, so we want to wish uh, Manny well and thank him for his service, and we're not losing him. He is here with the Brockton PD. One other thing, I want to read some correspondence into the record, if I could. Uh, it was submitted by the mayor's office to the city clerk's office. Uh, it just came to my attention tonight. I want to inform each and every one of you. Again, it's from Mayor Carpenter, January 28, 2014. As provided by and in accordance with National Law Chapter 60, Section 77B, as well as Section 2-301 of the re revised ordinances of the city of Brockton, I, William Carpenter, in my capacity as mayor, hereby, hereby appoint Benjamin Albanese Esquire as real estate custodian for the city of Brockton. As such, he shall have the care, custody, management, and control of all property acquired by foreclosure of tax title in accordance with said chapter 60, section 77B. I shall fix the compensation, therefore, to be the, quote, buyer's premium, unquote, paid to the real estate custodian conducting the public auction. Said, quote, premium shall be paid by the successful bidder at the customary rate of 10% and shall be in addition to the purchase price of the successful bid of which 20% of said, quote, buyer's premium unquote, shall be submitted to the city into an account to fund ongoing tax foreclosure costs. Sincerely, William Carpenter, Mayor. Before. It has been submitted uh, to the clerk, and I thought for public information you all needed to know that. <clears throat> With that, Madam Clerk, number one of the agenda, please. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Council. Mr. Chairman, if I might, I'd like to take items one, two, and three collectively. Second. Motion has been made by Council Yanari. It's been seconded by Council Cruz to take one, two, and three on the agenda collectively. All in favor, please put your hand up. All opposed? It carries. Uh, one, two, and three. Madam Clerk, if you could please read the agenda, one, two, three, collectively. Appointment. Michael Asak is a special police officer of the City of Brockton for one year term ending January 2015. Invited Michael Azak. Appointment. Julie Marshall as a special office, police officer of the City of Brockton for a one year term ending January 2015. Invited Julie Marshall. Appointment Brett Baker as a special police officer of the City of Brockton for a one year term ending January 2015. Invited Brett Baker. Councilors, uh, all the uh, invited guests are here in attendance tonight along with Lieutenant Donald Mills. I'd ask them to come forward. These are the new appointments. The reappointments we'll talk about later. I, I indicated to Lieutenant Mills they do not need to appear. They've been here many times. But these three individuals, if you could come forward, please, Lieutenant, good evening. Good evening, sir. How are you? Very fine yourself. Very well, thank you. Uh, I'd like to introduce the three newest members uh, the Brockton School Police. Uh, they graduated the academy a short time ago. They're uh, in the last half of their uh, field training. We have a uh, Brockton resident, Julie Myshaw. She comes to us. She's a graduate of uh, Brockton High. Class of 88, Mr. Class Mills. Of yes. <laughs> yes. We might add. Yes. Class of 88, we might add. Uh, bachelor's degree in criminal justice from Curry College. We have Michael Azak. 
He come, uh, resident of Brockton, graduate of Merrimack College, business and finance. Brett Baker, Brockton High graduate, resident, uh, graduate of Bridgewater State University, doing criminal justice. Excellent. Thank you, the three of you. Thank you and welcome. You'll do uh, yeoman's work. We appreciate it. Let's attend a motion. Motion to recommend favorable. Second. 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 Motion's made, properly seconded, uh, to recommend favorable to the full city council. All in favor? All opposed? Motion's carries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council. Have a good evening. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I move that we take items 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 uh, collectively and we move them uh, favorably uh, to the full city council. Second. Motion is made uh, to take 5 through 10 collectively. It's been properly second. All in favor? All opposed? 5 through 10 collectively. Madam Clerk. Reappointment. Daniel Vaughn is the special police officer of the city of Brockton for a one year term ending January 2015. Invited Daniel Vaughn. Reappointment, Kevin A. Smith, as a special police officer of the city of Brockton for a one-year term ending January 2015, invited Kevin A. Smith. Reappointment, Thomas Tuchillis, as a special police officer of the city of Brockton for a one-year term ending January 2015, invited Thomas A. Tuchillis. Reappointment, Janet Frizzell Hancock, as a special police officer of the city of Brockton for a one-year term ending January 2015, invited Janet Frizzell Hancock. Reappointment Theodore Hancock as a special police officer of the City of Brockton for a one-year term ending January 2015. Invited Theodore Hancock. In reappointment, Jason Mosley as a special police officer of the City of Brockton for a one-year term ending January 2015. Invited Jason Mosley. Councils, again, I, I spoke to Lieutenant Mills. I suggested that these individuals need not appear due to the fact that in the past when people have appeared, there's been overtime costs accrued. Uh, that's not uh, going to happen tonight. Uh, Councilor if you could uh, make the motion once again. Uh, move for favorable recommendation. Second. Second. Motion made, properly second, favorable recommendation. All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries. Favorable recommendation to uh, full city council. Madam Clerk, number four, please. Appointment John O'Donnell, 30 Rock Meadow Drive, Brockton, Mass., to the position of member of Board of Assessors, City of Brockton, for a three year term expiring January 2017. Invited John O'Donnell. Mr. O'Donnell, are you here tonight? Good evening, sir. If you could come forward. Council, any questions for Mr. O'Donnell? I have a question. Council Dubois. Thank you very much. Hi, Mr. O'Donnell. How are you? So, um, can you tell me a little bit about the process? What does what what would you do in this position if you were appointed? What what would be your responsibilities? I'm assessor. Assessor. Mr. O'Donnell, if you could just come a little forward. For assessor for the city. Yeah. What are you looking for? I want you to explain what your what your job would be. Uh, doing mass appraisals on properties in the city. Okay. And what what's what's your background um, and what makes you qualify for the position? I've been a residential appraiser for 28 years. Okay. So so that's what you do for your business. Will you be keeping your other job I'm during a, this? My business will be closed. Excuse me? My business is being closed. What was your business? What was the name of it? O'Donnell Appraisal Associates. Okay. And, um, let's see. I don't see. Do you own a lot of property in the city? What's a lot? I don't, do you own, do you own how yes, many I pieces do. of land do you, property do you own in the city? Nine. Nine pieces of property. Are they, are they all rental or what, what do you do with, do you manage them yourself? Yes, I do. Will you be continuing to manage those properties? Yes. You will. Will you be um, working on assessing those properties in your official capacity as the city's assessor? I'm not sure how that works. No. Is this a full-time position or a part-time position? They're my own properties. No, the, the assessing position that you've been hired position. for. A full-time position. <clears throat> I thought, I, I thought when I looked at your resume, I thought it said something about you um, having a portfolio of 75 properties, including child care centers. That's a part-time job I have. Excuse me, I'm sorry. It's a part-time position. And will you be continuing to do that? Yes. So you'll be continuing to manage a portfolio of 75 properties, including child care centers, industrial commercial properties, single family homes, and condominiums? Yes. And would you be working on appraisals of those properties? No. You won't be appraising those properties. Are all those properties in Brockton? None of them are. None of them are in Brockton? No. Okay. And so you won't be giving up your, your role as a property manager? No. Okay. And, but you own nine properties in Brockton right now that you don't, who manages those? I manage them. 
So you manage those and you'll be continuing to manage those? Yes. But you won't be, um, you won't be assessing those? No. Okay. I have a couple questions for the mayor about this position, if I could. Mayor Carpenter. Sure. Good evening, Councillor. Hi, Mayor Carpenter. Thanks for coming here. Your first time. It's wonderful to have you. It was nice to be invited. Thanks. Um, can you tell me how the assessor's position came to be open that you're filling? Sure. This is a three-year appointment by the mayor. And uh, one of the, we have two full-time assessors and one part-time assessor. One of the former, one of the positions when I came into office was expired. And what was that person's name that was in that position? I believe it was Mr. Cohen. Mr. what? Cohen, I believe. C-O-H-E-N. Mr. Cohen. Cohen. Right. But his, his term had expired prior to me coming into office. It's a mayor's appointment for a three-year term. And that's why I've brought uh, Mr. O'Donnell's nomination to the council for approval. So that's similar to um, the treasure collector and the DPW commissioner and the building well, commissioner who's, no, all, 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 limited, who's all, all of those appointments are also vacant, right? I mean, also um, their appointments have expired. So in that similar fashion? I would say that what they have similar is their expired terms. Absolutely. Uh, this is not similar to a department head position, though this is not a management position. Uh, this is someone who has a specific job of being the assessor. So I would say it's not a department head. It is an expired term. We have a lot of expired terms besides those three positions you mentioned. I would venture to say that somewhere between one-third and one-half of all the board and commission members in the city are also expired, and we're doing a great deal of due diligence right now to uh, make decisions on those positions and, and begin systematically sending you up uh, nominations. Were there performance issues with Mr. Cohen that made you replace him? I wouldn't discuss a personnel matter publicly. But you did replace him? I made the decision as the mayor to appoint someone I think is eminently qualified to the position. I've known Mr. O'Donnell for over 20 years. Uh, he's a very well-known and well-regarded uh, assessor here in the city of Brockton. And I'm also told that he, in fact, uh, trained our current senior assessor, Mr. Sullivan, when he came into the business. So if I have an opportunity to appoint a long-term Brockton resident who's highly qualified, who in fact even trained our current senior assessor, I think it's a great opportunity for the city and I'm, I'm very pleased that he accepted my offer. Um, did Mr. O'Donnell contribute to your campaign? I think he may have. I don't know. Did you? Yes. I believe he did. All right. He's been a friend you. of mine for over 20 years. If he Thank didn't, you. I would have been upset with him. Sure. You know, friends. Thank you right. very much. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Yep. President. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor, any other questions? Councilor Cruz. I actually, just like to make a statement. I've known Mr. O'Donnell for many, many years, and he's very well known in the real estate and banking communities locally, and one of the most respected assessors. And in fact, Mr. Sullivan himself had mentioned to me that he learned from Mr. O'Donnell the business of uh, and the uh, hows and why fours of uh, assessing. So, I think it's a great appointment, and I recommend favorably. Second. Motions have been made by Council Cruz, properly seconded by Councilor Stanisky, is a favorable recommendation. All in favor. All opposed? Motion carries. Family recommendation, full city council. Thank you for coming, Mr. O'Donnell. Madam Clerk, uh, number 11 on the agenda, please. Order. Transfer $20,295 from the Personnel Department Personal Employee Benefits Unemployment Insurance to the Law Department Personal Services other than overtime. This transfer is to provide funding for an additional position of part-time assistant city solicitor. Invited by John A. Conn and Chief Financial Officer, Philip Nazarell as solicitor, my increase personnel director. Conn, good evening. Good evening, Councilors. Uh, the last time there was a finance committee meeting, I indicated that this order was calculated incorrectly on the basis of a part-time uh, city solicitor. What they're looking to do in the office is to increase the full-time. Uh, the order coming up next is for the full-time, and so I would recommend that this particular order be recommended unfavorably. Councilors, entertain questions to CFO. Motion recommend unfavorably. Motion recommend unfavorably. Motion made. Recommend Actually, unfavorably. Can't do that. Can't do that. Motion, excuse me. Motion recommend favorably in the hopes it does not, pa does not pass. Right. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. second. Motion's been made, uh, properly seconded. Uh, it's a favorable recommendation. Hopes it does not prevail. All in favor of the motion? All opposed? 
Motion uh, does not prevail. Number 12. Order, transfer $35,295 from the Personnel Department, Personal Employee Benefits, Unemployment Insurance to the Law Department, Personal Services, other than overtime, in order to provide funding for an additional position of full-time city solicitor. Invited John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Philip Nazarella, Solicitor, Marion Cruz, Personnel Director. Ms. Condon, Mr. Mayor, if you'd like to, yes, nobody mayor. objects. Anybody object to the Mayor? Anyone object to me addressing this? Like in a general law. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just to this one specific item. <laughs> yeah. uh, Mr. President, thank you. Members of the Council, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the invitation to appear here this evening. And I do appreciate the consideration that was extended to return this to the finance to give me the opportunity to address the, uh, the full FinCom. So thank you. Um, the matter that is here, the by ordinance, the solicitor's office consists of two full-time and two part-time solicitors. Currently, we fund one full-time and two part-time solicitors. Um, I'll outline my reasoning to you in just a moment, but I want to be clear to clear up any confusion that there might have been as to whether this is a full-time or a part-time position. Um, I feel there is a critical need for additional help in the solicitor's office, which I'll outline to you in a moment. Um, but what we're asking for approval for here tonight uh, is to, uh, not an appropriation, but to transfer $35,295 into the solicitor's budget to finance a full-time solicitor for the balance of the fiscal year. Now, we do have two part-time solicitors. It's my intention to offer our two existing part-time solicitors the opportunity to move up to the newly funded full-time position if they would like to. I think that's the right thing to do. One of them has been with us for a long time. They both perform very well. I think you give your own people a chance to move up if they perform well. Um, if, so if one of them should move up and take the full-time position, then we would be hiring a part-time solicitor to replace the part-time solicitor who had just moved up. In the event that neither part-time solicitor would like to move up, then we would be hiring one full-time solicitor. In either event, the funding issue for the council is exactly the same. It's the funding of the equivalent of the one full-time solicitor. Um, the reason, there, there are a number of reasons why I'm asking the council to allow us to uh, transfer the funds to fund this for the balance of the year. Um, Certainly, we begin by talking about the cost savings. We are spending a ton of money on outside legal counsel. Um, I'll give the solicitor or the CFO a chance if you'd like the exact figures, but basically about $600,000 per year in outside legal fees. $50,000 per month we're spending in outside legal fees. If you look at it hourly, a staff attorney in the solicitor's office would be earning about $60 an hour. We pay an average of $225 per hour for outside counsel. We can get a lot more work done for a lot less money by having our own attorney in-house. Uh, in addition to that, um, I think there's a management advantage by having sufficient legal counsel uh, in-house and having more availability to offer in-house counsel available to particularly department heads, we can better manage our legal liabilities if we do a better job of, um, of offering legal advice before decisions are made instead of after decisions are made. And I think that the attorneys that we have there right now are extremely busy. I've witnessed it firsthand. And uh, I think having an additional person in that office would make us more capable of having an attorney available to answer day-to-day -day questions that come up. So from a management standpoint in terms of reducing future legal costs, I think it's the old announce of prevention versus a pound of cure. Let's have plenty of counsel on hand that's uh, much more affordable than the outside legal counsel. Let's see if we can avoid situations that cause litigation by having good advice up front. Um, I'd also like to bring to the Council's attention some immediately upcoming demands on our law office, our solicitor's office. 
um, we will be soon reopening collective bargaining with all of the city unions. Uh, that requires an attorney present at, at every single collective bargaining session. In particular, the police patrolman's union will be reopening negotiations with soon. As you know, those are ongoing negotiations that have not been resolved for a long time with a very large union, and that is going to be a very time-consuming and demanding negotiation. If I don't have another attorney in-house right now, we don't have any extra legal house available. If I don't have another attorney, we're going to have to use outside counsel for all of these labor negotiations at the average of $225 an hour versus $60 an hour in-house. Um, so I think that creates an immediate demand. Um, also, a couple of other issues uh, that we face that have changed since last year. Since the last budget was done, another function of the city solicitor's office is providing legal counsel when the city goes to um, housing court on code enforcement issues. That's police, fire, DPW, Board of Health, building department, all regularly have business in the housing court around enforcement actions. Um, about six months ago, the presiding judge at the housing court ordered that all City of Brockton employees in housing court on business representing the city must have city legal counsel at their side. The past practice had been these folks had gone to housing court on their own and only on occasion when there was a complex legal issue would they ask the solicitor to bring a, an attorney. Um, just that alone is two days a week. That's an assistant solicitor in housing court every Tuesday and Wednesday now. That was not the case when this budget began. Um, that alone is a half a solicitor right there. That's a half an assistant solicitor just on the housing court issue alone in addition to all the other demands that I described to you. And, and one final thing that's not the driving force of this but I'd like to make you aware of is as you all know, you know, we really uh, have an issue in the city with vacant and abandoned property. And one of the remedies that's been developed over the last couple of years is the formation of the receivership task force that in conjunction with the Attorney General allows us when we identify really bad long-term vacant properties to go through a receivership process for the city to eventually take title of those properties. Um, and the Attorney General offers us assistance in housing court with those and those are, that's a process that takes like a year and several visits to court just for one property. Um, what I've discovered is that a number of the properties that we have that the receivership task force would like to go forward on are owned by HUD or Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae and the Attorney General will not offer the assistance to take another governmental agency to court in a legal proceeding. So therefore, it, that would fall back to the city solicitor's office and currently those properties are not being pursued because of the fact that we don't have any additional staff available and don't want to continue to spend more money on outside legal counsel. So I, I think that there's a very compelling case uh, that uh, in terms of reducing and managing the cost of outside legal counsel, in terms of better management, uh, and in terms of being more cost effective, uh, that we really do need to fund this one additional position in the solicitor's office and uh, that's why I've requested the ability to transfer the $35,295 to fund the balance of this year. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilor Neary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Councilor. Thank you for uh, coming here this evening to address these, uh, these concerns that were before us at the, at the last meeting and um, some questions needed to be answered. Oh. And, um, I'm pleased to do it. Thank you. And uh, I, I'm one that's always going to have some questions when it, when it comes to the financial structure of, of any and all departments, especially having sat here for a good many years and, and other years somewhere else. So I have just a little bit more, I guess, I don't know, years of experience when it comes to the municipal part of how the budget uh, proceeds forward and how we spend the money. So, and I'm not putting that out to anybody that, you know, hasn't had those years, but uh, I, I truly understand um, you know, when I see uh, a difference in cost to a department and, and uh, what I probably want to make point to, and, and you can answer it, maybe Mr. Condo will be able to answer it as well, but, you know, over the years when uh, we were asking for this particular department to be increased, we were always told we couldn't because there was never funding to do it. 
and all of a sudden now we're, we're into a new administration and all of a sudden we're coming into play that we have uh, this funding that we can move around and, and, and take care of adding a position to, you know, to this particular department. Um, and, it, and it bothers me because, again, for, for all the times that, you know, we had, you know, budget uh, situations and we had to tell departments to work within the bone and uh, believe me, none of us wanted to spend that kind of money for, for outside legal services, outside legal fees, but, you know, what, what were we able to do at that point in time, that's what we had to do. Um, but I guess my, my biggest concern is, you know, we're taking the money from the personnel department, from the employee benefits, so I begin to wonder, and Mr. Conner probably can answer this better than, than you, Mr. Mayor, but, you know, how much, you know, extra money do we have in that particular line item that we can move it around? It, that concerns me. And, and it'll concern the taxpayer, too, because that's what it comes down to. So I, I don't know who, which sure. one well, wants to answer Well, I'll, I'll allow Mr. Conner to answer the specific question that you have, but I would just like to say that I do share your concern, and I know our departments are running on bare-bone budgets. And, you know, one of the, another reason to go along with the ones that I outlined is I'm already beginning to work on the upcoming budget and looking forward, right. and I'm looking at this uh, huge expenditure for outside legal counsel and saying we've got to find a way to reduce that in the next budget, and, and that's certainly one of the driving forces behind uh, wanting to increase by one staff attorney. So I share your concern. I think we are in for a very tough budget. I think we'll all have a lot of tough decisions to make together. Um, and uh, that's, that's certainly one of the reasons driving this management decision. Uh, but I'm, I'm looking at the legal work that has to get done, the people that we have there to do it, and what the cost is going to be, particularly around collective bargaining, um, housing court, and some of these other things that have to be addressed, that if I have to use outside counsel at almost quadruple the rate, I, I just don't think that's going to help us in the budget next year, Council. So I think that in terms of philosophy, you and I are on the same well, and page. I, and I think that we are, Mayor. And, and, but um, I'll, I'll allow Mr. Condon to answer but I, but specific I just, questions. But I just want to be careful as we yeah. move forward. And I, and I also I can't speak for prior administrations. Yeah. That no, and been and, here for and I understand that. But, yeah. but as you're preparing, you know, as, as a new administration is preparing, my, my greatest concern is that once you start to you know, give a little leeway to what you think you need to do in a department, all other departments are going to begin to look and say, gee, over the years we never got, now how come certain departments can? And that you're going to have to wrestle with as, as the mayor, because it's your budget, it's not right. the city council's, it's yours that, that comes before us. But I'm just, I'm just concerned that, you know, are there going to be uh, some other types of situations like this, and am I going to see that we're still going to take money out of the personnel department employee benefits line item, I mean... Yeah, I'll, I'll let, let me let Mr. Condon address the specific issue regarding the line item, if I could, Council. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Council. So Thank you, Mr. Condon. The, the appropriation is coming from the unemployment compensation component of the benefits budget. And before we uh, submitted the appropriation request, I had a conversation with Maureen Cruz, and she believes that based on where uh, the utilization of that budget is, so far, uh, that there is at least $65,000 available uh, for transfer. Okay. So after we take the 35, whatever we take from the, what's the amount we are taking out of there? The 35,000, correct? Yes. So there'll still be a, a somewhat of a balance left there, but not at, at least $30,000 more that could be transferred. And in addition to that, as we move through the year, unless something comes up during the balance of the fiscal year, I think there'll be other dollars available in that line. Okay. Transfer. I, I just want to make I just want to make sure of that. Um, thank you, Mr. Conn. Just one other thing, if I might, Mr. to the mayor, if I could, because I know you you're adding a, a position and. and um, you know, I, I commend you for, you know, at least making the offering out to the people that are within the department if one, some, somebody wants to move up. Uh, you know, I appreciate that part. Um, I think what people need to understand is the fact that, um, you know, in the city solicitor's office, it's pretty much controlled by, by the mayor because you have the right to make those appointments. And I know at the last meeting other people were concerned about what type of, um, you know, what type of uh, uh, application was going to be put out uh, or online or, or um, you know, how are we going to advertise for the position. And I don't think you're going to be looking to advertise because usually in a city solicitor's position you already have right. somebody in mind. And, and I would think that that's sure. somebody that you so, know. And so you touched on a couple of things. Uh, you're absolutely right. The, for folks that aren't aware, the solicitor's office, uh, just like the mayor's staff, is completely at the mayor's discretion and unlike most appointments that I would make that I would be conferring with the council and would be subject to council approval. So um, you're right. I, I think that probably 
Um, most folks are surprised that I've retained the staff from the prior administration. Correct. Um, and so I'm not looking to make change. I am looking to make a lot of changes in a lot of areas, but only where I believe it's warranted, not just for the sake of making change. And I've been very favorably impressed with the work of a couple of the attorneys in the office there. Um, so I have not made the change. Um, I think there's going to be uh, no shortage of folks who are interested in, a, in a, either a part-time or a full-time right. solicitor's job. I think the city is full of good lawyers. I probably know hundreds of them just myself, including members of the council. Um, so uh, no, I don't, ex I don't anticipate this is the type of position that would require a, a worldwide search. Uh, but that does not mean that that would be my style in all positions we look to fill. I think there are going to be some critical positions coming forward that we, we will invest some time and effort and money into conducting um, extensive searches for qualified right. candidates. But hearing you correctly, you already have somebody in, line, in mind for this no, particular the position has not been offered to anyone. Okay. And first of all, I don't even know if I'm looking for a full-time or a part-time person okay. because, as I said, I, I do want to, I, I think that... Um, uh, I think loyalty is a two-way street, and if we have a couple of really good part-time people there, then they should be offered the opportunity to move up to full-time first. So once I know whether we're looking for a full-time or a part-time position, I'm sure my phone will be ringing. And I would probably say it would take probably within the year's time before we really actually would see some type of a... Um, uh, what am I going to say? What's the word I'm looking for? Not a decrease, but yeah, well, a yeah, decrease I, I the mean, legal I, fees to... I think, the, I think the immediate impact, Counselor, is the right. fact that, uh, you know, we have a ton of collective bargaining on our doorstep right now, and uh, if I don't have another staff attorney, I'm, I'm, the solicitor is going to be forced to hire even more outside counsel than the 600000 a year we're spending now. So I, I think this is um, preventative management to see if, if I can keep the legal um, counseling for collective bargaining with an in-house attorney at about one-fourth of the cost, that's going to help us in the upcoming budget. Very good. Thank okay. you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Stewart. Thank you. Um, Mayor Carpenter. Good evening, Councilor. Good to see you. Yeah, great to see you. Yeah, same here. And I'm, as I've said to you uh, many, many times, I'm very supportive of your initiative and you know, see my role as making certain that you are as successful as possible as mayor of the city because if you're successful, um, the city is successful. Um, and so I'm inclined to you know, support this as I indicated in the last um, FinCom meeting. I just had questions around uh, the overall picture. So I would like to know in addition to this position which uh, requires additional funding, so we're talking about 35000 up to the fiscal year and then I'm assuming it's 80,000 or whatever it is for the next fiscal year. So if we're looking at the remainder of this fiscal year and then next fiscal year, what's the total amount of the cost to the city of the new positions that you're proposing overall, uh, the negotiated positions that we have you know, read about in the paper? Uh, what does that figure look like? Sure. Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you that I, just trying to think quick off the top of my head, I believe all of the types of positions that you're describing are on tonight's agenda. So, I mean, uh, I'm here to talk about this and then talk about the staffing of my office and then talk about uh, the staffing uh, to lead the Brockton Police Department. So those are the three areas where I anticipate uh, asking uh, for some transfer of funds uh, to get us through the balance of the, the year. Uh, I wonder if we could talk about, I mean, I'm, if, if the chair will allow this. So, so I, I, we're I ask for a vote on this item before the other items unless we can postpone the vote. But I'd like to get the bigger picture before a vote. Well, I, think, a I think the whole big picture is right there in front of you. I think it's, it's, uh, it's this. And then uh, the next item I think that we'll come to is uh, the request for some money to fund my office for the balance of the year. And in terms of the uh, possible need for some funding around the change in leadership of the police department, that won't be on tonight's agenda in terms of asking you specifically for a, uh, a transfer of funds. Um, we don't even have a position that exists yet. Uh, however, I mean, that's, I think your question was what else can I anticipate? My answer is that it's all on the table tonight. So tonight I'm asking for approval on the staffing of the solicitor's office and the staffing of the mayor's office. And then just to answer your question, and I think it's been on the front page of the newspaper several times, 
uh, you know, we are uh, back here tomorrow night to present to the ordinance committee uh, to testify in favor of an ordinance that I've filed. So what's so. that total number? Or maybe Jay Condon, Mr. Condon can give, give me that number. And I'm looking for not the total number, but the difference in what the only the numbers cost we're going to have are the two items that are in front of us tonight, uh, well, because I don't even know what the what's the projected total number, number though. Well, we have we have some sense of what those numbers would be. Sure. The um, city solicitor position is thirty-five thousand. Fifty-four on there. Yes. Yeah. The total requested funding that we'll be reviewing momentarily for the mayor's office is fifty-four thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and That's I don't know which way we're going to go regarding the <laughs> police department. The settlement agreement with Captain Gomes, uh, there was no change in funding. Where the cost would come would be if we were theoretically to um, to pass the ordinance, and I were to appoint a. Uh, civilian commissioner of police, uh, then about 50,000, Jay, is that a fair number? Or? Right, depending on the timing, and I don't anticipate that's any time soon, um, it would be, uh, you know, 50,000 or less for the prorated balance. It depends if we're, if we're passing this in, you know, March or May, so mm -hmm. I, it's hard to give you an exact figure on that one, but certainly we've been talking about our intentions in that area for some time. Right. And then so that's for the remainder of this fiscal year. And so the, the impact... Yeah, I don't... Have we talked about anything else? I don't think so. No, I, I don't think there would be any other uh, intended, anticipated requests unless something came up unanticipated. And I would certainly contact the council and begin a conversation. So we're at like $150,000, basically, is what I'm seeing in terms of from now until the end of the fiscal year. Well, right now, what I have in front of the council tonight is about $89,000, I think, total between the two departments, um, and then the potential to be one more request coming right. that might be anywhere between 25000 and 50000 depending on the timing. And then for the police, the, the commissioner position, all right, so the 35000 that we're looking at from now to the end of the fiscal year for the, the additional... This is for the solicitor's office specifically. That, that yeah. will obviously continue until in, into the next fiscal year and, and until that position, yeah. if it happens not to exist. Then the, the additional 54000 for your staff would also continue into and next year. That's just, and, and just uh, to clarify, Council, that's actually not all for my staff. A portion of that is separation expenses for folks that were not retained. So okay. I think roughly about 40000 or so of that is towards my staff and the balance is separation costs, right. and so which is a one-time expense and typical of any time there's a change of administration. And I, I personally don't think that the, the salaries of the staff are exorbitant, so that's not... That's no, and, not I, and we'll be prepared to review those when we get to the next item. Right. So, but then, so that amount of $40,000 we're talking about then possibly being $80,000 above what well, is typically spent in an office for next fiscal year, correct? I, I think in fairness, Councillor, I would say that um, I'll be bringing an entire budget forward to the, to the City Council, you know, for consideration. And uh, I would anticipate there'll be cuts in some areas and, and, you know, the Council will do their due diligence in looking at the entire proposed budget that I, that I bring forward. So, um, but certainly the onus is on me going forward to the next budget to convince the council that these positions are being funded responsibly and I do consider myself to be accountable to this council and when it comes budget season I'll be here to review the budget proposal for as long as it takes. Right. No, fair enough. So I just want to make certain that my questions are answered about that number. Sure. So we're no, going, I, so we're, so so other, we're going other than the three items we've discussed, I don't anticipate any other requests of this type. I have a question about the um, Commissioner of Public Safety position. I. It's just my not quite understanding uh, the process. So with... Okay, I'll keep I think uh, that's tomorrow night. Well, I, know. Well, <laughs> well, I have a question Council, about... I'm going to give you a little leeway on this. Yeah. I'm going to give you a little leeway, but the order is the 35 grand relative to the law department, but I'll give you some leeway. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I think we also may have a resolve later tonight that somewhat touches on the, the topic also. So the, the cost of the... So with the... With Captain... With, Former Chief Gomes is now being captain and right. that's been negotiated and right. he's back at his captain rate mm -hmm. for, n right. I'm thinking about next fiscal year. Mm -hmm. So the uh, addition of this potential so commissioner position, 
there. really does substitute what would be a normal police chief position, so there's not an additional cost. Correct. I, I think that um, when we get done going through all of this t tomorrow night and, and in future discussions, um, I think it really boils down that the, the net financial impact is that I will be adding one captain to the Brockton Police Department, and that's the cost of a captain is what the cost of all of it when you get done trying to break it all out and add it all up and see how the pieces fit. Um, the money that was due to Captain Gomes for the upcoming year is, you know, it's due to him. We're, we're obligated to pay it. And uh, he's continuing to work for us, which is to our advantage. Um, so he's sliding into an open captain slot, and, uh, and he'll be paid the same rate he was going to be paid for the upcoming year. So it's the cost of adding that captain. This, the proposed salary for the civilian police commissioner uh, is actually less than what Captain Gomes was earning as chief. And they, they come very close to offsetting the difference between the captain's pay and the chief's pay. They do. Okay. Yeah, but I'll, as we get to that point, I think it's a little premature right now, but as we get to that point, you know, we'll certainly review that in detail with the council. Okay, so then very spe specifically to this item, um, I know you indicated that um, there were some new demands on the solicitor's office, which in part sort of um, has propelled this idea. But I think in the last FinCom meeting when I questioned Mr. Condon, who's here, I asked him about cost reductions, and I believe he said there would not be really a cost reduction. Well, I, I think it depends how you want to define a counselor, because um, right now, if we do not do this, then there's going to have to be an increase in spending for outside counsel, because whether we like it or not, we're going to be opening negotiations with unions, and there has to be a, uh, an attorney representing the city every time we sit down, and also working and advising between bargaining sessions. Um, but I do look at this as a cost savings management tool yes. long term going forward, but it's a little hard to quantify for you right now because of the fact that we know that there are <coughs> some additional demands coming up in the near future that would if not for this, will cause us to have to go up even higher on outside counsel, which I don't want to do. We're, we're spending f an average of $50,000 a month on outside lawyers, and I'm really looking to try to contain that with the long-term goal of reducing it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, okay. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Council Stewart. Council Bonds. Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You said that uh, you've already started to work on next year's budget. And you Very said preliminary, that, yeah. Okay. And you said that um, you've and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but as I understood you, you said that you've projected some reduction in the outside um, legal fee, legal costs. That's, that will be our goal. When I, as I'm starting to look at this budget mm -hmm. and say where are areas that we may be able to cut back and, and do with less, this is certainly an area that will get attention. Okay, and I guess asking for the, the moon, I guess, Right now, as you stand there, what, how much do you see as a projected um, well, here, decrease? Well, here's the, the issue, as I just tried to um, share my thoughts with Councilor Stewart. If we don't do this, our outside legal expenses are going up. Right, but I didn't ask what we well, I, well, don't do, but just well, what do you, how do you anticipate the, the cost going down, just, just from what you've looked right. at so far? The immediate savings will be what we will not have to spend by increasing outside legal counsel right now, because we have to open negotiations with unions, we need a lawyer sitting at the table, and we don't have any available uh, staff to, to handle those duties. So what I'm trying to do is proactively look at this need and not spend more than the $50,000 a month we're already spending. So you're looking at a negative to prove you're positive? I'm not sure what exactly about that. I, I, I guess what I'm saying is that in the short run, we are going to have a, uh, a significant need for additional legal counsel because we have collective bargaining coming up, because of some of the other things I outlined, like having to have a lawyer at housing court two days a week now that we didn't have to do previously when this last budget was done. Um, so what I'm trying to do right now is address those immediate needs as cost effectively as I can, and that's by hiring a staff attorney at $60 an hour instead of farming it out to outside legal counsel at an average of $225 an hour. Long term, 
I would like to reduce that outside legal expense, absolutely. How much with spending? I don't like spending $50,000 a month to outside attorneys, uh, but I think that that will be something we'll work on in the upcoming budget. It, it, that's really, I think, Councilor, that will be driven by what we project the legal needs will be, you know, coming up in the next year. We've got a lot of litigation going right, on right now. If you right could just take a little bit step back, you talk right into the mic and All some right. councils can't hear you. Thank I'm you, sorry. sir. Is that better? Yes. Okay, um, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. There's no windscreen on this. Um, so just so I'm clear, the office is set up to house two full-time and two part-time assistant solicitors, right? By ordinance, those are the positions that exist by ordinance. But right now, the, we only have staffed one full-time and two part-time. Okay. So How I'm, long has that been like that? I think several years, I think. Okay. Right before my time. I think for as long as we can currently remember, that's been the staffing. And has that been because um, additional funds requested have been denied? Well, I'm, I'm just I'm <coughs> kind of going on what um, Councilor Ineri said, that every time that these requests have, have come before the Council before, it was denied. So I just I wanted to find out how long the situation has been this dire because that's how it sounds. It sounds like this is, you know, if this doesn't happen well, right I, now. Well, I, it's not I think happen. what I'm trying to say, Councillor, and I, I've only been here for months. So I'm, I'm looking at the current situation, right? And I can see that we're spending six hundred thousand dollars a year. We spent like five hundred and seventy-nine thousand last year. We're at three eighty-five year to date for this year, which I think, if you project it out, will actually put it a little over six hundred thousand for this year. Um, so I can see that's what we're spending now, and I also see immediate needs for additional legal counsel over and above that, and I just think this is a, uh, a much um, more cost-effective and much uh, more management-wise way to address it is by filling this additional solicitor position. Okay, and, but practically, uh, Attorney Nasrella, how long has... Is this because when they've asked before, they've been denied? That's all I want to know. Like, no, I, Councilor Yenier, I, I don't think, I'll, I'll let Phil step, but I don't think that's exactly what Councilor Yenier said. Just so. a point of order, if I Councilor might, Yenier, point of order. just so that my fellow colleague under, understands um, this, you've got to understand that the mayor prepares the budget, mm -hmm. and any time we spoke to that present mayor in regards to putting more people into the legal department, if that particular mayor did not want to honor that, that's what that mayor did, okay, okay? and felt that the best route to go was what, what and how it was staffed, and used outside legal counsel. Okay, so it was the discretion of the mayor. Right, exactly. At the time, exactly. whoever the sitting mayor was. Okay. No problem. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. What Council Leonary has just stated, which is correct, over the years, the cost of legal services has dramatically escalated from what may have been three or four administrations ago. So has the number of cases which the city deals with. As I indicated last time I was here, we're dealing now in forums that we never dealt with before. Where there are claims in uh, mass commission against discrimination. Housing court requires attorneys where there weren't attorneys before. Um, vacant house projects that we're doing. We're in a number of areas which require full-time attorneys. I can't ask the part-time attorney to work a full-time day. Right. I mean, so that's that. primarily the reason why we're here before this council. Okay. And if, if I, I guess if I just could, one more. If... The, one of the current part-timers, if they don't want to take the full-time position, is there someone in mind to take that position? I just want to know. No, there is not. Hmm. Okay. But it's, it's like the mayor said that uh, his staff and the solicitor, solicitor staff are left to his discretion for appointment or something like That's that, correct. right? That's correct. Okay. I just it's want to the make mayor's sure. appointment. Okay. I just want to make sure. Just to be clear. I just want to be right. clear. Right. Yeah. So to be clear. I mean, I'm sure that there are several people in the back of my mind that I would intend to have conversations with once I know exactly what we're doing. Uh, and I also think that um, I wouldn't make any appointment <coughs> without Mr. Nesrallah also agreeing on it, because even though it's my appointment, the reality is that Attorney Nesrallah manages that department, and I wouldn't, I, I don't see a scenario where I would try to force someone on him to work for him that 
he didn't agree was a good hire. So I believe it will be a joint decision between the solicitor and myself. And, and you know, by statute I get the final call, but I, I believe it will be a joint decision. And I'm, I, I probably have several people in the back of my mind I would talk to once I know whether it's a part-time or full-time position. Okay. But, Thank but you. I have not offered a position to anyone at this point. Right. Okay. Thank you, sir. Are you good, Counselor? Yes, thank you. Councilor DiNapoli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Councilor. Uh, I'd like to speak to uh, Attorney Nezzarello. I have some questions on the law <laughs> office. Good evening, Mr. Nezzarello. We, we did speak this afternoon. Thank you for the return phone call. Um, on your budget, uh, you, you appropriated about $628,000 in change for outside legal fees. and. I guess the mayor just stated that uh, you're up to what, about 500 now? Three, 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 three eighty-five. Right. Okay. Are you, when you go to court, when your attorneys go to court, and when you go to court, are you finding that the courts are tying you your hands instead of getting the thing accomplished the first time? You have to go back two or three times, and this is where you're spending a lot of time. That's a function of the way the system works. Sometimes matters are accomplished in a court session. Depends on what the session is. If it's a, if it's a jury trial, we have several cases now pending in the law office, which may uh, go into a jury trial and paneling a jury, uh, standing in court all day long, and that could be a three to five day matter full time. A part time lawyer cannot do that. So, but that's just the function of the system. One could go to court on a 15-minute matter but have to wait two or three hours to be heard. You're tying up a lawyer full-time, basically, for those smaller accomplishments, or you're taking a full-time lawyer and tying them up full-time. So it's basically a request that we need more bodies to perform the functions and cover the various forums that we have to cover. Now, you, you, you said that you go to housing court now, where before you didn't... After go to Prior to that, the code enforcement would be able to handle a lot of the housing court matters. The uh, presiding justice okay, thank you. indicated he wanted an attorney representing the municipality as opposed to the code enforcement officers. So the courts put more of a burden on your office. That's correct. Great system we have, huh? Okay. Um, the other thing I wanted to uh, bring up was... Let's see, we discussed that. On the, on the outside uh, uh, matters uh, that you hire attorneys to do outside legal work, can you give me an example with what you would, uh, where you are, uh, I guess you have two part-timers that, that work under you, and I'm sure you go to court also, is that correct? That's correct, in which... Incidentally, is, is not on paper the ideal way the city solicitor should not be in court if he's managing and administering what's going on within the office and his attorneys. No more than a district attorney tries cases, nor should the city solicitor. But I'm in court many times because I, re I even though I am part-time, I feel more of a strain to impose the request on another assistant city solicitor that's part-time to spend full-time uh, sessions in court. So yes, the answer is I am in court as well, which oftentimes will leave the office vacant, and it's a busy office. We uh, are dealing with all the various boards, appeals from zoning, planning, <laughs> conservation, questions that need to be answered in advance of them going into session. So as the mayor correctly stated, we can try to minimize the lawsuits that are generated out of the activity that happens in the city. Okay. The mayor also stated that you have to, uh, you're going to need someone to, uh, to bargain with some of the unions. Yeah, um, actually, there are two of our lawyers that end up in mo impact bargaining uh, sessions that go on for at least a year, and they're basically gone for most of the year. How many unions do you have to negotiate with the city now? How many are left? Jay. Ten, eleven. There's 11 unions that, 11 that, are, that are on... That and there are only two of our lawyers, because that, that's all we have, that uh, have to participate in all of that. So out of... Uh, so how many, how many unions have settled? Just the, the fire and the police? Senior? No, no. No? Just the fire? Fire only? Yes. So you have the rest of the city to negotiate? Correct. And prior to um, uh, my acting as solicitor, 
we used to have outside counsel at the, actually it was $275 an hour representing the city. My office has taken over that task and has been able to eliminate that. And there's probably a lot of other areas we can delve into and minimize the cost by inside house counsel doing the job as opposed to outside. But we need the physical bodies to be able to address that. Now, the police haven't had a contract in how many years? Uh, off the top of my head, I'm not sure. Pardon me? I'm unsure off the top of my head. As long as the fire department, I believe, it was over three? July 2010, so it's three years. Okay, thank you, Ms. Cruz. Okay, you're in a little dilemma there, Mr. One. Nazarella. A big one, yes. Okay. Well, the dilemma is if, if I'm not successful in the council um, acquiescing or accepting this request, the work has to be done anyways. It's not, uh, I don't have the benefit of a private practice in the sense that I can refuse work. We have to address every issue that comes over the door. Every department, every agency that deals or is involved with the City of Brockton eventually passes through the <coughs> law department. If it's contract review, if somebody slips on the pavement, or if it's uh, the bargaining sessions, it comes through the law department. If we can't physically address all of those issues on a timely basis, the work has to be sent outside. So it's either the, the 250 to 275 an hour is paid, or the in-house counsel at $60 an hour is paid. Either way, the work has to be done mm -hmm. for the, the sanctity and safety of the city. Well, I, I agree with you. I'm in the wrong business. I shouldn't have been an attorney. 200 bucks an hour when I work for a quarter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council. <laughs> Council Stadensky. Thank you, Mr. President. Wait till you see what my plumber gets. <laughs> Keefick, good evening. How are you, Philip? I, I have just two questions. My first question to was going to be about what your office does, but you gave us a pretty good rundown. I'm familiar with uh, uh, what they do. Uh, the second one, though, is uh, I'm going to ask you, and I think I hope Mr. President will give me some leeway, I'm going to ask you to lobby for us uh, as far as getting a, an attorney to work here with some environmental training to assist us in a big fight that we have. Anything you do, much appreciated. Thank you, Mr. President. Good point, Council. Thank you. Council Cruz. Thank you. Um, actually, my question's kind of been answered, but, and I don't know if it's for you or for, for Jay, but I voted for this last week. I mean, I know how uh, you need help up there terribly, but we're trying to do this as a saving, so we're not doing outside counsel. Why did we do an interdepartmental transfer instead of transferring at least at the beginning out of the uh, outside counsel budget? I think I would defer to Jay if I would on that. Uh, on the basis of what work they've got going on now, I didn't see that there was a mechanism where that outside council budget would be reduced in terms of demands on it in this fiscal year. There are some uh, outside cases which are um, best left in the hands of the people who are holding the responsibility right now. And truthfully, I wasn't certain that we could, I could honestly say this money can be taken from outside council and law, moved to the personal services budget and not have to come back later in the fiscal year to re replenish what sure. was taken. Whereas I knew from the unemployment compensation line, there was money budgeted there at the beginning of the fiscal year because it was a, um, an election year and because there were a number of holdovers in some of the department head areas who might not be replaced and the mayor's staff might end up being replaced. And so when we got to this point in the fiscal year, it was it's pretty clear that some of that money hasn't been expended yet and may not be expended during the course of the year, so the money was available for transfer, so it was a, a safer way to go. But it wasn't going to the stabilization fund. It was taking money from already appropriated funds, not from the law department budget, it's true, but from already appropriated funds. I just couldn't see that for certain we would be able to make that savings in this fiscal year. We'll take a hard look at next fiscal year. Okay, so it's really more about the workload. It's not really about the savings, uh, and I guess, I think I know where Councilor Bonds is trying to go. It's it's money that we're, go we're going to spend above and beyond what we've already appropriated anyways. Oh, I think it's about the money as well. I, mean, I believe there will be, some, I'm positive, there will be savings realized, not only because we're, we're having in-house counsel instead of sending it out, but it also maximizes the level of efficiency and management within the office. Um, I'm not only responsible for watching what goes on inside the office, but all of the various outside counsel, 15 to 20 different lawyers and law firms, uh, all of the work that they do is overseen by me 
and all the ultimate decisions as to whether or not there's a resolution, a settlement, or further litigation is made by me. So I have to still stay rather intimately involved with the cases uh, to try to minimize that cost and make the right decisions at the end. If more of that work is retained within the law department, it's clearly more efficient for me to oversee and far less expensive for me to manage. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Council Dubois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. Hi, Councilor Nassarella, Solicitor Nassarella. I'm just going to start with efficiency, Change. okay? Mm -hmm. So right now, the City Council is looking at a request to add a full-time City okay. Solicitor who will get full-time benefits and that full-time city solicitors, and I'm going to talk in 12-month chunks because when you talk in five-month chunks, it's just, it, it kind of um, mixes the real picture. So let's just assume that that full-time city solicitor is going to make around $80,000. And let's just assume for discussion it's going to be between 25 and 29 percent is going to be their benefit cost. So we're just going to say that around between $100,000 to $110,000 in a 12-month period is going to be new dollars in your department. Um, and that could be, could be off by a couple, couple bucks, but I bet it's not too far off. Right now, I'm looking at a solicitor's department that have three part-time attorneys, including yourself, all, all utilizing, all being able to get full-time benefits. So you're, you're working part-time, getting full-time benefits, which cost the city a considerable amount of money. So if we're going to talk efficiency, why didn't you come here and say, I'm going to make all three part-time attorneys in my office who are making full-time benefits I'm going to make them all full-time. And then the only cost that we would be discussing right here as a city council is the salary cost for making that part-time person a full-time person. Because, well, let me just finish, because when you're keeping a part-time attorney making the argument, I can't make a part-time attorney work full-time hours, that sounds all well and good from someone that doesn't know how many hours an attorney really works. So I work in a law firm, and those attorneys are salaried attorneys. So like the part-time attorneys or salaried attorneys get full-time um, benefits for part-time work, those attorneys work way more than 40 hours a week. Any professional in today's day and age, you can just read it in, the, in, in any type of magazine. If you're getting a salary, you're, you're working more than 40 hours a week. So why not say, like any other private law firm would do, I am going to make you work a full-time day. If you don't want to be a full-time citizen solicitor, find another job, and I love the city solicitors you have, so I hope that wouldn't happen, because I okay, know... That includes me as well. Of course. I think you're great. So, but when I, just efficiency-wise, if you're looking at three part-time people making full-time benefits, why not just say either work full-time or find a different job? Why not say that? Because you raise the issue about efficiency, the response will be about efficiency. Efficiency, to me, is having more staff than less staff. As I stated earlier, I need the bodies to address the various forums we have to be in. Uh, your question somewhat evolved into about the finance as well, which uh, Mr. Condon would answer. But as far as efficiency, numbers are significantly important when we're talking about the efficiency of running the office because you need people there, men or women, lawyers, that can address the various issues either on the phone the transactional work of doing the contracts, reviewing the documents, or physically going to court. So if I take what exists now and made them all full-time, it doesn't solve the problem as much as having more bodies. Well, no offense to our disagreement, but I have, you know, and my background is in administrative management, and I completely disagree with you. I can understand the value of having another attorney that might have a different work set than the attorneys that are currently on staff. But if you take a part-time person and make them full-time, and then they work more than 40 hours a week, that, like most professionals do, I don't know how many people here that are professionals that don't work more than full-time, I mean, more than, more than 40 hours a week if they're not getting uh, overtime. Everybody does. I mean, I think I work 60, 70 hours a week in my day job, and I only get paid for 40. So if we're just looking at the brass tax of efficiency, adding another employee with a full-time benefits package and potential for investment in the pension system doesn't seem to be efficient in my opinion. But I appreciate your opinion and I have a lot more questions. 
Thank you. Okay. So right now um, you were talking about outside legal counsel. Um, so there is there was appropriated, if I wrote this down right, $628,000 into the, your budget for outside legal counsel. And I voted for that. I think it was a great choice. I'm happy about that. Not to say that we can't have more attorneys on your staff, because I can understand the value for that. And I just heard that we've spent around $385,000 of that, so that leaves $243,000. So if we're just looking at the $385,000, if we had a full-time city solicitor on staff, what outside counsel, what was the majority of cost for this $385,000? What, what cases, what types of cases really took up the majority of that $385,000 in outside legal counsel? Well, one of those <coughs> cases is uh, actually where you're a defendant as well. It's uh, the lawsuit against uh, the city and some of the sure. city councilors. That has taken up a substantial amount of money. Yep. We have... Um, Lawsuits, I think you're familiar with in your ward, an environmental law case where we have outside counsel dealing with that. That's, that's in Ward 7, but I understand. Uh, I'm sorry, that. Ward 7, that's correct, but you and I have spoken about that one. Uh, there are some uh, cases with the MCAD or federal court in Boston because of being in Boston and the anticipation that w it will be a significant chunk of several days, we've had to uh, assign outside counsel there. As I uh, believe I indicated last time I was here, I believe the attorneys in my office for the most part and for most areas have the skill level to address the issues that come before us. We just don't have the time frames to be able to do that. And so we defer to outside counsel. Could you provide myself and my fellow counsels a breakdown of costs of this $385,000 on what, what cases this money was expended on? Sure. That will be, make us understand a little bit more of where we're going. Because when we're talking, I just want to be clear that these numbers, this $628,000, um, not that we're talking about, and we've spent 385000 of that with five months to go, um, next year that number is going to be lower, most likely, because we're not going to have a lot of the attorney's fees about the Energy Facility Siting Board. I'm assuming that's going to oral arguments in March. So once the oral arguments start, the decision that's going to be made um, then kind of negates the need for outside legal counsel because either it's going to be affirmatively voted or it's going to be negatively voted. And either way, either we're going to have the power plan or not have the power plan. It's at the st Supreme Judicial Court. So we're at the very final stage of that. So just by the nature of that going away in the next fiscal year, won't there be outside attorney fees decreased with that as well? Well, that's if, if one can predict what the future will be with all the other areas of litigation. I didn't anticipate the one that's in Ward 7. Uh, that's a major case. I haven't anticipated some of the uh, other high liability cases or the cases that have brought us in federal court that um, have major financial consequences to them. So it's very difficult to have a crystal ball in this business, uh, being in a litigious society, who's going to sue, for how much, and uh, the biggest unanticipated factor is what the consequences are. Judgments that come in that just aren't sustained by the evidence that, that's uh, on the table. So, so I, I could not predict, I would like to think what you just stated is true, and it, it is as a matter of logic, but as a matter of reality, the, the legal fees could still soar even though we've removed a significant uh, driving factor. Okay, so just to catch up some of my fellow counselors, then I'll move on to my next line of questions. Um, the Ward 7 lawsuit that you're talking about is at the old uh, pool and the people that purchased it said that the pollution on site was there when they purchased the property and the city is saying no it wasn't and um, the people that purchased the site are now suing the city saying you've got to pay for the cleanup and the cleanup was like oh how much around hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars or what is this law how much is the money about that about seven hundred and fifty thousand seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars that this this um, this company is looking for now Environmental law is extremely tricky, right? We all know this. And the environment is tricky. Some people still don't believe in global warming, if you can believe that. And all some people think power tricky. plants don't emit pollution. But 
what we know about the $750,000 lawsuit is you need a good attorney in there making the case, right? And you're telling me that you're going to hire an attorney for $80,000 that you want to have expertise in municipal law so they can help with union negotiations and everything else, and that this wonder person is also going to be able to be the environmental attorney that we need defending the city <coughs> at a $750,000 lawsuit? How can these be the same people? Can I answer that? Please. You're picking out one particular case that is of extremely um, unique, high-level nature. In the attorney that is representing the city, the outside counsel, formerly worked for the government as the chief prosecutor in environmental law. The many of the other cases that deal in environmental law within the city of Brockton don't rise to that level of complexity or depth or time frame or financial consequence. That's what the in-house lawyers could address, and I believe successfully. I understand. But if you take a case of high complex, high level complex, like the one you mentioned, and at this time I wouldn't want to get into a public, but you and I both know what it's about. Yes, that required that particular lawyer, but the other dozens of cases that aren't of that level, the in-house lawyers can handle. I, you know, I agree with you. And to be fair, I wasn't the one that brought it up first. I think you mentioned that lawsuit um, that you said was in my ward, mentioning it about the Only potential. for the purpose of indicating the various ranges of an array of cases that exist in a lot of times. But that type of lawsuit would still need an outside attorney to defend the city's best interests, right? That particular one, yes. Okay, so we're still going to need outside attorneys. Okay, that's good to know. And right now we've spent $385,000 in outside attorney fees. So our budget is an extremely large budget. So $385,000 put into attorney's fees, outside attorney's fees, to get the right person to do the job. I personally am not upset about spending those dollars, but that's just my opinion. What about the Barboza case? So just recently I read an article about the city having to pay $60,000 to a family where because the police were found to be um, use excessive force or something like that where they barged in the house, they threw a woman who just had a C-section on the ground, brought her down to the station, arrested her parents, grandparents arrested, and the judge in Boston says the police used excessive force and the city has to pay the, these, this poor family that possibly had some excessive force, the judge says, not me, put against them um, $60,000 in fees. Now, who was the attorney that did that? Was that inside counsel? or was oh, that, that was outside counsel. Would you think that that case could have been handled by an inside attorney if you had one more attorney on staff? Yes. You do? Well, because it was in federal court. It was a very, very time-consuming case. We actually participated in assisting in some of the discovery and, and working that, but it was a, a very laborious, time-consuming uh, case, which is not yet completed. And that's why I haven't commented on it, because it is still in litigation. Good. Now, will, will, you, will that case be enumerated in the $385,000 breakdown that you're going to send us, how much you spent on each case for outside lawyers' fees? Yes. I would, I'm really excited about getting that information. And then I know I had other, inf other questions before I moved on to efficiency. So $80,000, $25,000 for, um, for benefits. And I, again, am stuck with the problem that we're talking about professional positions that are not hourly workers. We can talk about, I know attorneys a lot of time, billable hours, how much you pay an hour, all this other stuff. But in reality, attorneys are one of the original professional positions that you could have. You can be a doctor when you grow up. You can be an attorney when you grow up. You can be the president of the United States. I mean, these are important jobs. These aren't jobs that the average person can take. And because of their professional duties, most of the time they're on salary. And I'm sure that's why they, um, so why not just make these people full time? I think it would be easier for me, because I'm not voting to support this, it would be easier for me to vote to the support this if you were making part time positions who are already getting full time benefits full time. It seems like a luxury to have this boutique city solicitor's office with not the city solicitor himself, because I understand you, your, your value is your years and years of skill 
and expertise. So the idea that you're working a part-time position, we're probably gaining more than a full-time person's intellect and capacity in your part-time. So I'm not, I'm not talking about you, but you have staff attorneys who are also wonderful that are working part-time when we are paying them full-time benefits. I would just be, I would be more inclined to vote for this if we were making those part-time positions that we're already paying full-time benefits to, that are already being vested into the pension system <coughs> full-time. So I hope that you could come back with that kind of offer because that would be something that I could potentially support. Thank you. Your counselor, and your, your, there is logic to your, your argument, and I, and I accept that and appreciate it. But again, my focus is on the efficiency level um, as well as the budget, but the efficiency level, I'm a firm believer I need more bodies to address the issues in the workload that we deal with. I think that's Thank fair. You. And I just have one final question for um, uh, Mayor Carpenter, if sure, I could. Counselor. Thank you so much. I appreciate the new <coughs> eyes that you're putting on the city, and I appreciate your efforts. So thank, thank you. you. So just to, I know that we're going into other money items uh, about the, the new dollars that you're proposing to spend um, that aren't budgeted right now. So just a, a quick roll down, and then I'll be done, and then we can move on and then come back to it when the other um, expenditures come up. So $80,000 around for 12 months of a city solicitor, $20,000 for their benefits, $140,000 for a commissioner, $70,000 for separation costs for the old chief. Um, when I'm looking at your budget, $504,000 spent for the mayor budget with you, $400,000 spent with Mayor Balzotti, that's a whole nother $100,000. So though people are talking about the $70,000 number that we're trying to get over, I'm seeing upwards of $300,000, $270,000 more just, just in appropriations in the last couple of weeks. So I'm just wondering where is it going to stop? Like right. how well, many all, I, new expenditures are we going to be talking yeah, about? I don't agree with all of your numbers, but I don't want to argue each one with you. I think that each of those matters that you referred to are going to be considered individually in front of the council, and we can have a full discourse on exactly what the numbers are as each item comes up. The item that I have here in front of you tonight is for a $35,000 transfer. I'm not spending any additional money. I'm asking you for the opportunity to move some money from one account to another for the balance of this fiscal year. When I bring the budget to you for next year, Counselor, we'll have ample opportunity to, to review the entire budget and, and justify and decide together where the best places are to, to spend the money in our overall budget. So, I mean, it's easy to look at, at each one of these items and say, project, well, that will cost that, that will cost that. Um, that's not what I'm here for right now. That's the budget process when I bring you a full budget in June. And we may be adding positions, we may be removing positions. It's too soon to tell. What I'm asking for cooperation with here tonight is simply addressing a couple of immediate needs that we have. And we've identified existing money that was already um, allocated in your current budget and I'm asking for the opportunity to transfer some money from one account into another. And I appreciate that. And that really, I, I mean, I don't <coughs> mean any offense by any of these questions, but I've been elected by the people I represent to ask the tough questions. Me too. And I pride myself on doing that because why else on earth would I be here? I could be at home with my family eating and working out. So here I am, and I really want to just understand for myself and for the people that I represent what's going on. And I don't mean to be crass or rude about this, because when I first got elected, I had the same thoughts as you did. And maybe we're going to come to the understanding that everything has changed now, and it's okay. But when I, we talked about money that wasn't spent in line items, and money that was available to be used elsewhere, the response I always got was the money Money that isn't spent in line items rolls over for free cash, and it is the basis of fiscal stability to begin the next budget cycle to have money in the free cash. I used to call it padding the budget. I still sometimes think that it's padding the budget, if you want my opinion. But up until recently, that was always prized as a fiscal way to be able to make sure that we have money 
for next year's budget. And this money that we're talking about, you not, it's, not, it's money not spent, <coughs> really, what happens next year? What happens the year after? What happens, you know, what if you're mere 20 years? What happens in 20 years? How are we going to have that money reserved to pay for these people's salaries moving forward? And I don't want to be a part of layoffs if we don't need to be. So that's why I'm asking well, these difficult questions. And neither do I, Council, and that's why we're trying to start making tough decisions now in February instead of waiting till June. So I think on that basis we do agree. Thank you. Um, I think that in terms of this particular item that's in front of the council right now uh, that I've outlined I think a, a, a very sufficient and convincing case as to why it makes good management sense and good financial sense long term to address the tremendous need we have for legal counsel in the city um, by filling an existing full-time position that exists but has, is not funded and the cost of doing that is $35,000. Without this, I will be faced with increasing outside counsel and we will go over that budget of 600000 that you allocated and I, I'm trying to avoid that. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council. Council uh, Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you for being here oh, tonight. Good evening, Councilor. I believe one of the questions that I have, and I think it's a question that a lot of citizens in this city actually do have, and it's the fact that uh, the fear that we have is that once we appropriate this, uh, these funds for you to, to, to do what we need to do uh, at this time, that there's no going back. Can you physically or presently look into our eyes or the cameras that are filming us right now and say to the citizens of this city that the budget that you will propose for the upcoming year in the, uh, in the, le in the law department will be reduced, at least the line, the line item that hires outside counsel. Right. I, I think be, that, that it will um, be reduced by at least the amount of money that, we, that you're asking us to, uh, to appropriate? I think that um, that would certainly be the goal. Um, I think it's way too early in the process to make that kind of a guarantee to you, Counselor. What I can guarantee is that if we do not do this, our budget will be back before June 30th asking you for money for more outside legal counsel because we'll be over the budget on outside legal counsel. Um, so I think that, you know, it's my job as the CEO to come here in front of the council and make the most effective logical argument I can make as to how I think we should address the ever-growing need for lawyers and legal counsel in the day-to-day -day operation of city government. Um, and, it, you know, at the end of the hearing, I'll take your decision. I'll go back and run the city as best I can. So. If the council decides it's not a good decision to, to add an additional staff attorney, then, you know, as the solicitor said, the need or the demand for the legal services is not going to change just because we don't want to hire an additional staff attorney. Um, we're going to have to spend more money on outside legal counsel, so it won't be a matter of it going down. It'll be a matter of it going up. We've got contract negotiations with 10 unions coming up. At least one of those is going to be very time consuming and, and I hope not too protracted, but it's a complex negotiation as one of the other councilors pointed out, three and a half years without a settlement uh, and, and now we're going to take that on again with a fresh start. Every single time we're sitting with one of the unions, there has to be an attorney sitting there representing us. Um, there's also legal work that's done between bargaining sessions. Um, so there's going to be an increased demand, a significantly increased demand for additional legal counsel. I think this is the best way to handle it. But Mr. Mayor, I think um, one of the issues is that, you know, budgets have been negotiated in the past. Contracts have been negotiated in the past. I mean, this city has been around for uh, over 200 years. Uh, contracts have been negotiated. It's nothing new. It's not like we're going through a new process that's never but happened I, I before. I do think, Councilor. But, but let me let me just finish okay. my point real sure. quick here. Uh, the issue that I have is the fact that we're say, you know we're basically saying here that you need to bring in this position because you're looking to reduce cost of outside legal service. Right. What I'm saying is that why is it that you cannot make a commitment saying that in the six hundred thousand dollars budget? I think I, I believe that's what Council. Uh, uh, Denapoli was saying that if $600,000, I believe, why is it that you cannot make a commitment to say, look, I'm going to reduce that line item by $110,000 or whatever the uh, the amount of money that it will be to fund that that.
proposition that you're proposing. Sure. Because it's a lot easier to sell it to the citizens and the taxpayers of this community, knowing that, you know, we're not going to sit here. Because some of us ran on the fact that, you know what, we're not going to. We're not going to burden the taxpayers in this community with one more dime if we if we don't have to. Well, I, I'm pretty so, sure, Council, I ran on that also. So, so the thing is, but the way it's going right now, it's it's like if you come to us asking for X, Y, and Z dollars, and then we don't see any savings down the down the pipeline in the sense, you know, what are we doing? You know, we are uh, as the as the holders of the books in the city, it's up to us to basically do that and make sure that this thing isn't being, you know, spent out of whack. Because if there's additional monies to be uh, to be spent in the city, there's plenty of places that I can think of that we can spend those dollars and cents uh, in, into this community. So my whole thing to you is basically a commitment. You know, if you're saying you come into this body looking for support for this position, and I agree with you as far as allowing you to have a position, but I also want some sort of a a guarantee on our end that we're actually going to be able to save the taxpayers of this city some money. I mean, if the if it's just to create a position for the sake of creating a position, you're not going to get that. Right. But so if it's a if it's a savings that we're looking at, then why not? But I also have one more. Well, point. can I can I respond to that? Yeah, one? Go ahead. Okay, yeah. sure. So uh, first of all, I'll tell you that uh, during my two terms on the school committee, this was a position that I advocated for on the school committee, where they don't have a staff attorney and they spend about $250,000 a year on outside counsel. And I, and I felt that there could be a savings there by having an in-house staff attorney who provides a lot of advantages uh, and also could s require much less outside counsel. It would be very easy for me to stand here, counsel, and just say, sure, yeah, I'll knock it down 100000 The reality is that if, if, um, if the counsel chooses not to fund this position for the balance of this year, then I'm going to have to either overspend the budget and be coming back looking for you for more money for outside legal fees before the end of this year, or I'm going to have to look at some of the pending litigation and see can I eliminate some of this outside counsel. Um, and I don't think that we really want to do either of those directions. I think this for $35,000 is a much more prudent way to go. So if you ask me if I am committed to holding the line on taxes, reducing expenses in the upcoming budget, absolutely. Can I take this one specific line item, not knowing exactly what all of the legal demands are going to be on the city over the next five months in this budget, and then project out to what may arise between now and June that would project out to the future budget, I think that would be irresponsible of me, Councillor. So I, um, I think philosophically we agree, and I'm looking at this long term that this will affect savings. 60 bucks a year for someone in-house versus 225, 250 an hour for someone uh, outside. I know this is more cost effective, and I know there are benefits to having council right in-house. Um, but I, I just don't think it's quite as simple as just saying, sure, I'll knock 100000 off the budget next year. The goal was to reduce it in the long term. In the short term, we have negotiations with 10 unions coming up that are going to be costly. And if I don't have an in-house attorney to do it, then we're going to have to hire outside counsel to do it. We don't. Not having a lawyer for those negotiations is not an option. We've got to send a lawyer to housing court every Tuesday and Wednesday now. We did not have to do that at the time this budget was formed last year. That's a half a solicitor position right there. We don't have a choice. We have to send that lawyer over there every Tuesday and Wednesday. So I will, um, you know, ultimately, whatever decision we make here, I will accept the instructions of the council. I'll do the best I can with it. Um, but I, I think this is absolutely the best way to go. But, but Mr. Chairman, uh, also, uh, it seems that the city spends a great deal of time in litigation. Uh, I mean, it's, it's evident from the conversations that we've had here that there's, there's a great deal of cases that could have possibly been resolved in, in sitting down, talking to individuals about it, because to me it makes absolutely no sense to spend eighty, a hundred thousand dollars on legal fees for a lawsuit that ended up costing the city $65,000. So is there going to be some sort of a, a serious commitment from the law department to basically look into these cases and on a case-by-case -case basis, because I honestly, I'm not an I'm not an attorney, and nor, nor do I profess to be uh, one. But uh, but I do I can I can add and I can count. And, and to me, if we're sitting here just litigating every single case that comes through our doors, when in fact we know for a fact that in some cases they're black and white, 
you know, and it doesn't have to go to court. Can we somehow put a considerative, a considerative effort in a sense in kind of resolving some of these issues so that they don't become so costly to the city and to the taxpayers in the city? And then maybe we don't have to sit here and worry right. about spending the hundreds of thousands of dollars that we spend in uh, but, but it has to be an effort because I, I, I sense in talking to citizens in this, co in this community that, you know, if you file a lawsuit against the city, be prepared to go to Boston for, you know, to, to, to the federal courts, be prepared to go into Plymouth into the Superior Court. It's like, it seems like nothing is resolved internally long before it becomes a major issue. So I, you know, it's a recommendation, as Councilor Studensky said, that I'm making to you and to your staff to somehow look at this thing, because not everything has to be fought and fought in court, I believe. You know, we, the, there's mediation for everything, so what's wrong with mediation from the city standpoint as well, too? But, but going back to my original point. Well, can I, can I respond quickly sorry, to yeah, your statement there? Um, it has been, in my 28 days as mayor, it's been a revelation to me as to how much litigation is going on with the city. And I knew there was a lot, but there's even more than I realized. So I can assure you um, that we've already begun a review process where on a regular basis I am asking the solicitor's office to get me up to speed on various matters that are being litigated and I'm absolutely you know, doing that for a number of reasons. One of them, as you suggested, to see if there are some things that can get resolved so that we just don't have this ever running meter of attorney's bills. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you want to say we, we need to, as a management strategy, try to find ways to not have as much litigation. Absolutely. And I, I think that's one of many arguments for having sufficient staff attorneys on hand. I think if we had the money for it, I'd love to have an attorney sitting in the mayor's office. I'd love to have an attorney sitting over in the police department all day so that when people are making decisions, they get some quick legal advice right on the spot so they hopefully make decisions that don't cause us to get sued later. So I... I I, I agree with the concept, and I, I think part of the answer is, is in-house attorneys that are available for consults uh, during the day. When we have an outside lawyer at $200, $250 an hour, you know, you, you call them up on the phone, you wait to get a return phone call if you're lucky the next day, you get them on the phone, next time there's another conversation, you call them again, every time there's a phone conversation, the billable hours are running up. When you have a staff attorney down at the end of the hall, you get a quick question, you run down the hall and ask the question. So I, I, I think in many ways, it, you know, the staff attorney makes more sense. And, and I also get Councilor Dubois' point that there are some of the litigation does have to be handled by outside specialists. I'm not saying that there should, there should not be outside legal counsel. Of course, there has to be because sometimes there's some really specific background and expertise necessary to adequately represent the city. And when you identify those situations, then you do go get the best outside counsel you can. Yeah, but uh, again, as I'm saying, is ba it's basically like this. If you take, if, for instance, a case that comes, goes up to Boston to the MCAD, it, the MCAD rules against the city that the city is at fault at, at one particular aspect. To me, it makes very little sense to continue to push on against the recommendations of MCAD you know, on a particular case where you know that perhaps the next thing, the next best thing <coughs> for the taxpayers and the <coughs> citizens of this city is to s pull the parties aside, bring them into a room somewhere and try to negotiate a settlement with them instead of going to court, spending money on legal fees, and <coughs> then the end result will be now the courts are telling you to pay this X, Y, and Z amount of money of monies that the city could use to put someplace else. So that's why I'm leaving that to you yeah. and to your department. And, to, I, uh, uh, and I don't want any complaints with MCAD, and I hope that uh, in our administration you'll see changes in policies and practices that will hopefully lead to a dramatic reduction in those types of complaints against the city. Uh, and uh, if a complaint is warranted, we should settle it. And, and uh, so I don't want those types of complaints, and I think we will be proactive going forward in trying to take internal steps to reduce those types of complaints and, and uh, litigation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor Rodriguez. Councilor Denapa, you had a follow-up question? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Mr. Nizzarella, a couple of questions for you, sir, and yes. they'll, they'll be gentle. All right. In 2012, uh, outside uh, 
services, you were appropriated 312000 I don't know if you came back in front to ask for more money, but that, that number has doubled in, in two years. Uh, that was one. The other, the other one here is on the uh, part-time city solicitors versus a full-time city solicitor. Your full-time city solicitor is, what, 84000 and change, right? Depends on what step they're at. It's, it's oh, a range oh, between uh, 80 No, it would, it, that's, yeah, that's fine. Um, we don't need the exact t dollar work. Uh, and your part-timers are at uh, 48 plus. Is that correct? First of all, going back to the full-time, it starts at 73,000. Uh, oh, yeah, well, I'm just looking at what is appropriate in my book. Okay, what we're paying for a full-timer right now. And the part-timer is at 48, is that correct? Correct. So it's the, it's not. Uh, what are the part-time hours? Uh, twenty-five hours a week. Twenty. Uh, that's part-time is twenty-five hours right. a week. So that that gives them the benefits because they're, they're over uh, the twenty-five hours a week, and they're entitled to benefits. I think well, I, okay, that that's fine. All right. So why don't I can see where Council Dubois is going, where. For a few dollars more, we, we, we put on full-time people instead of part-time people. Well, again, uh, as I was explaining earlier, the issue is not, some, not the length of time. It is the amount of people to address the various issues that we have in the various places we have to be. We have, on a given day, and this is going to happen very shortly, we're going to have to be two lawyers are in bargaining sessions for full sessions. Another lawyer is going to have to be in a housing court. Another lawyer is going to have to be in a state court, be it land court, district court, federal court, superior court. And, you know, it goes on and on and on. So it's the number of bodies that I need to cover the range of places we have to appear in. When your attorneys go to, let's say they're going to bargain with uh, the, uh, one, of the, one of the unions, and the bargainings go on for five hours, okay, and they work part-time. Does that mean at the end of uh, four and a half hours in that daytime it says, well, see you later, it will continue this tomorrow? Or do they stay and you give them credit for the 25 hours? How does that work? No, I, I don't give them credit. We usually assign the full-time person in there, the part-time person stretched. We had a person working part-time about a year ago that uh, left the office because, you know, the hours were, the, the, the push and the demand was so increased that she ended up in a private firm uh, doing substantially better. Can we just get the situation? We, the city council so no, I, I can't keep juggling on a week-to-week -week basis, credit this person for that, and, and, and juggle time schedules. It's not that easy. Okay. So it, and it's not possible because oftentimes I'll be called into court, we're called into court, unannounced, not scheduled. It could be to defend a motion. Uh, you know, and a lawyer has to be available. Okay, if so there's a, uh, a motion on a restraining order, a temporary order, an attorney has to be into court. That's not scheduled. Sometimes you get less than 24-hour notice, but a lawyer has to be available. Okay. But you do see a savings by putting another part-timer on? I do. I see not only a savings in monies, but also uh, more as important is an increase in the efficiency and maximize, maximizing the operation of the office. So this position... Which results... What always results in a minimization, minimization of the liabilities the city faces. Okay, so this position will be until June 30th, correct? To the end of the physical year right. at, at this particular 35295 So when the, budget, when, the, when the budget, when you bring us the budget in June in front of the council, okay, we're either going to keep this position or I want to see the, the $428,000 fee go down, we should see a savings. If not, Mr. Nazarella, I'll get rid of, I'll cut one or I'll cut the other. And at the same token, then I'll have to cut the representation we have uh, with outside counsel and bring it back into in-house to represent many of the cases that we're, we're currently representing. No, I, okay, I'm going to give you a chance to save the city money. In fact, the, the case, uh, Brockton Power, I have 15 different lawyers representing the numerous defendants. We can slice that and bring it back and have in-house counsel represent the various defendants. That would be a savings. 
it would be time consuming and eat up most 99 percent of the time the law department has, but if we have to move in that direction, that, will be, that would be an option. Okay. I'll give but again, you if you're asking me, is that the most efficient way, probably not, but if you're uh, clashing efficiency with economics, you're giving me little choice. I'm trying to create an efficient office where there's less liability than there would be otherwise. Okay. And I also should point out, uh, for a city this size, we have probably less than half the lawyers uh, in a law department than some communities that are half the size of Brockton. The town of Newton has approximately 10 to 14 lawyers on staff. I won't compare Newton with Brockton, but that's fine. Okay? But I'll, I, I won't listen, compare the I'm gonna, I can compare I'm, the type of legal gonna, services Mr. in the Nesrell, world. I'm going to give you the opportunity. Legal services. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you thank very much. Thank you, Mr. DiNapoli. Um, Council Monaghan, you didn't speak. You wanted to speak? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, through you, Mr. Chairman, to my uh, colleague, Council Dubois, just a question. I'm just trying to understand something on the part-time thing. You're saying they should be full-time. Are you saying that the whole office should be full-time and add another full-time person, or are you thinking that bodies-wise they can cover it as being full-time? I think I was clear on what I said. I think that it's part-time. and why, I don't understand. I, when, okay, I'll explain it to you. No, what they're I'm saying is they're asking they, for full, they're, he's asking for bodies, an extra person to be at the place. I don't know why you're questioning me. No, you were saying, why aren't we making them full-time? I'm just asking you, why? I think I made my point that you have part-time people that were paying full-time benefits and full-time investment pensions, and they could be made full-time, and I'm a professional person, and I work more than 40 hours, and they're attorneys, and they're professional people, and they could work more than 40 hours, and we wouldn't have to pay overtime Thank you, in counselor. the professional world. Thank, Thank you, Counselor. You. Uh, uh, counselor Bond, you had a Counselor Bond, are you good? Uh, yeah, I'm not too bad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I was just trying to understand. I was trying to understand that I, I, my understanding is that he needs more bodies to physically be at different places, courtrooms, what have you. And uh, Sharon Israel, could you just? Is, is that what you're basically getting at? You need the bodies to be, to physically be at different courtrooms here, there, or what have you. Is that's, this what that's you're a primary reason. It's not the sole reason. Right, but, but I'm saying reason. that's why you that's really. Correct. That's correct. Okay, and one more thing, and Mr. Connor can answer this. Are you coming back every year? We, you're coming back for more money for uh, Mr. Connor? Mr. Connor. Just trying to do this quick. Are, are, we, are they always coming? I'm, I'm trying to even remember myself. I thought they are, but is, is a lot of time coming, been coming back every year for more money? Yeah. For more money for outside council. We're putting more money into them. Every year, out of general fund or what have you, have they been coming back on a regular basis? They for came back in uh, fiscal 2012 uh, and asked for an appropriation, I think, of about $300,000, doubling that budget. I think Council Denapoli mentioned that. That was okay. increased through a supplemental appropriation. And since mm -hmm. then, fiscal 13 and fiscal 14 has been continued at about the $600,000 level. All right, but they haven't kind of had a, actually come back for they more. They haven't come back for more okay. since then. But the first time it was 300000 mid-year. After right. that, it's been in the budget itself. Okay, thank you. That's all. Thank, Thank you, you Councilor. Councilor Bonds, and a follow-up. Um, I, I, no. Thank You're you. all set, Councilor. Councilor Dubois had a follow-up. Thank you. Um, Attorney Nassarella, I'm wondering how many people on staff right now are bar certified in the federal court? Uh, I believe uh, three are. Uh, so yourself and the two other people. So that's everybody in your office. That's, no, uh, that's the fourth, the <laughs> additional person is not <coughs> Attorney Fisher. She's so, okay. So now I'm confused. You you have I thought you just had um, Kate and Kate, Caitlin, and then there's another person that I never met. So when did that person get hired? Uh, she was hired approximately six months ago. In July, last July. Okay, so now, see, I was on the mistaken uh, thought that you had two part-time city solicitors. No, now uh, you have three part-time city solicitors, all making full-time benefits. No, no. So what do we have? You tell me. I have three assistants. There are two part-time, part one full-time. Okay, so I was under the mistaken thought that it was yourself and two part-time city solicitors. No. Wh and there is myself as a part-time solicitor. Okay. There are three assistants, one full-time and two additional part-time. Well, so there is only one full-time 
assist them. Thank you. And my last question is for Mayor Carpenter. So I'm a straight talker, and sometimes it gets me in trouble, and sometimes it's great. But I heard you talking to um, um, Councillor Rodriguez, and um, you, in my mind, implied that if we don't fund this position, you would have to take money away from outside legal counsel and stop litigation to redirect it. So are, are, you, so are you saying, just let me finish, if, are you saying that if I were to vote yes, on this appropriation that you would commit to letting the Energy Facility Siting Board appeals that are scheduled for the final stage before the SJC go through because that's all funded through outside legal counsel? Because that would be the well, First thing. of all, let me, let me clarify my answer to Council Rodriguez because you're taking one piece out of the entire answer. My answer was that I'm going to manage the city the best I can based upon the decisions that the council makes around funding. So if this request is, is denied, then as the CEO, I'll make the best decisions I can to address the needs of the city. And I think what I said was that we would either have to overspend what's budgeted for this year and we'd be back probably for additional money for outside council before June 30th because of the impact of the contract negotiations in the housing court, or I would have to try to find a way to cut back on outside legal fees. I'm not even at the point yet, Council, that I've been briefed on all the outside litigation or all the litigation that we have. We've begun a process where they are briefing me on various cases as we have time. And if I hear about a piece of litigation, I ask to be briefed on it. Um, you know, but quite honestly, in 28 days with all the other time constraints we've had, you know, we fit in the briefings when we can. I just, but I just, I'm, I'm not going to micromanage the um, law department for the solicitor. So this, this, is, this is my only concern because we have 11 elected officials and to a person, as far as I know, everybody wants the Energy Facility Siting Board um, outside legal counsel expenses to be paid and utilized just try to get an answer to your question. Oh, no, I'm not even done with my question yet. So if you, you could just no, you let asked, me... You asked me a question about the energy facility siting board. I just wanted to be clear, Council, to make sure that I didn't answer incorrectly. Um, the attorney is planning to make those arguments in March, and I have not given him any instructions to the contrary. So that would be, who would be making those arguments before the Energy Facility Siting Board? That would be an existing outside counsel, Greg McGregor, he's an environmental specialist in that area, that's been representing the city all along, is uh, expected to make the arguments, I believe, sometime in March. And are we, have we already paid him? We pay him as we will as we're billed. So would this be one of the potential outside legal fees that you would cut if, if you don't have the staff in the office? No, I think if you're going to ask specifically about oral arguments that are due to be made in March regarding, um, Phil, help me with the, the word, it is energy. And it's still yeah. board appeals before right, the Supreme appeal Judicial between Court. The SJ, before the SJC. Um, I think as a practical matter, my take is an awful lot of money has already been spent preparing for that, and it probably would not be a good business decision to cut it off at the knees at the last minute. So no, I, I, I would anticipate that those arguments will be made in March regardless of what happens here tonight. But I certainly, going forward, have to look at the whole big picture and, and uh, in terms of long-term decisions. Legal expenses are one of a number of factors we have to take a look at. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillors, as, as Chair, I just want to say that as long as I've been on the Council, we've been very fortunate here. Uh, we had uh, Attorney Jim D'Ambrose, uh, who served under, under Mayor Harrington, and of course we have Phil Nazarella. And within the legal community, uh, Attorney Nazarella is, is really held in high esteem. So we're very fortunate to have him uh, and the attorneys that serve under him as well. Um, I am happy, Councilor, that you did ask that question, Councilor Dubois, relative to get a breakdown, because I think it's extremely important, and I thank you, Attorney Nazarella, for agreeing to do that breakdown. I also would ask for a breakdown relative to what the Mayor said on the receivership program with the AG. Uh, I've done about a half a dozen of these in another community with the AG. As the attorney for that town, I did nothing. The AG did everything. So, 
Could I address Excuse that, Excuse me, sir. Yeah. So in terms of what you said about uh, HUD and, uh, and, and Fannie Mae, I'd like to just get a breakdown on how many out of the percentage what that is, because that's important. And I agree with you. The AG would have to remove themselves on that one. Right. And what, what, I, what I said, Council, just to be clear, is that I'm aware that there are a number of those properties yep. that we are not proceeding with the receivership. So the work is not being done. We're not proceeding with the receivership on those HUD and Fannie and Freddie properties. Because the AG has to sit out. Because the AG sits out and we don't have the available staff to provide the in-house attorney to do it. I think we're all very concerned with those um, really difficult, vacant, abandoned properties that are candidates for receivership. Right. So no, I, understood I, what you I said was there. pointing that out as an additional need. They're not getting done right now because we don't have available staff. Right, I understood that. I just want to, I'd like to get the council, as FinCom, I'd like to get a, a number of what that is, if you okay. can do that. Sure. Thank you. I entertain a motion, councils. Motion to recommend favorably. Second. Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded as a favorable recommendation to move to the full city council. Mr. I'll, Chairperson, can I have I'll, a. Is that on the motion? On the motion. Can I have yes, a, a roll call vote, please? Uh, Madam Chair, we're going to do a roll call vote on this one. So the, the uh, motion before us, properly seconded, is a favorable recommendation to the full city council. Madam Clerk, if you could please read the roll. Shirley Azak. Yes. Shana Barnes. Yes. Timothy Cruz. Yes. Dennis Tanapoli. Yes. Michelle Dubois. Yes. Dennis Aneri. Yes. Tom Monahan. Yes. Moises Rodriguez. Yes. Jazz Stewart. Yes. Paul Studinsky. Yes. Robert Sullivan. Yes. Matter, uh, matter has enough votes. It's a favorable recommendation to the full city council. Madam Clerk, number 13. Order appropriation, $450,000 from the Executive Office of Public Safety and Security, fiscal year 2014, Shannon Community Safety Initiative Grant. To the City of Rockton Police Department, invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer. Corner, good evening. This is a Shannon grant uh, money. It's a grant. Uh, there's no cash match, but there's a match using additional uh, already appropriated city funds. The bulk of this money goes to outside agencies like the YMC, Main Spring House, uh, those kinds of agencies. Motion to recommend favorably. Motion is made properly. Second, favorable recommendation. All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries. Favorable recommendation to full city council. Thank you, council. Madam Clerk, number 13, please. Mr. Chairman. 14. Uh, uh, Councilor. I'm sorry, it was 14. Councilor. I'd like the motion to have uh, number 21 taken out of order. We have a number of residents Second. here. Thank you. Motion's been made by uh, Councilor Lodge Stewart, seconded by Councilor Dubois, relative to take, I'm sorry, Councilor, what was the number? 21, Mr. To take Mr. number Chairman. 21 out of order. All in favor of taking number 21 out of order? All opposed? Uh, it, it, it passes. Council, uh, a clerk, Madam Clerk, if you could please read number 21, please. Resolved that the City Council of the City of Brockton go on record urging Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to cease all no-fault evictions and foreclosures until new FHFA Director Mel Watt has time to review all policies of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac invited Steve Meacham, City Life Coordinator, Emma Grigsby, City Life Organizer, Michelle Dincheco, Brockton BTA member, Ronell Remy, Brockton BTA member, Loretta Minor and Albert Minor, Brockton BTA members. If those individuals could step forward to the podium, please. Good evening, sir. State your name, please, for the record. Steve Meacham. I'm an organizing coordinator with City Life Vita Urbana. I want to thank you all for having us here. I'm here with a number of members of the Brockton Bank Tenant Association. Thank you for your patience and thank you for inviting us to speak. Uh, we are asking you tonight to approve this resolution, non-binding resolution, that urges Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to cease no-fault evictions and foreclosures until the new conservator that oversees their operations has time to review their policies. I'm going to state really briefly why, we're, why this motion, why at this time. Uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are the two giant uh, government-supported enterprises that own over half of all the mortgages in America. They are 79 percent owned by the people. Unfortunately, despite those statistics, they have been among the most intransigent banks in trying to find solutions with homeowners other than foreclosure and eviction. In particular, they will not do principal reduction, they will not accept rent after foreclosure, and they will not sell back properties to the former owners. Um, gradually, a number of Wall Street banks even have started doing those things. Uh, after the Attorney General settlement two years ago, 
And more recently, there was a giant settlement with J.P. Morgan Chase for $13 billion, and another one with Aquin Services for $2 billion. And a lot of that money is designed to go to helping struggling homeowners with principal reduction. In particular, many of you are aware here that in uh, Brockton and many other places in Massachusetts, a lot of our members have gotten their homes back by getting remortgaged by Boston Community Capital, which then buys the property from the bank and sells it back to the owner. And this has worked really well where the bank is willing to negotiate. Fannie and Freddie, which I'll remind you own half of all the mortgages in the country, refused categorically to negotiate with Boston Community Capital. And that wasn't always true, but Ed DeMarco, who is the head of FHFA, which oversees Fannie and Freddie, Ed DeMarco gradually asserted his kind of ideological opposition to this and stopped Fannie and Freddie from negotiating with BCC. This led to a huge national effort all across the country to get Ed DeMarco replaced. Uh, President Obama nominated co former Congressman Mel Watt to replace Ed DeMarco. He was approved December 10th of last year and sworn into office January 6th, I think it was, this year. So Mel Watt has been brought in to oversee Fannie and Freddie. He is likely to change almost all the policies that Ed DeMarco enforced, including lack of principal reduction, including taking rent, including selling properties back to the former owner. But in the meantime, there are a lot of, you know, the bureaucracies move forward uh, and are difficult to change all, in a, all, all at once. Meanwhile, there are many, many, many evictions going forward in the housing court of Brockton and elsewhere of people who have been foreclosed by Fannie and Freddie and people who live in buildings, former tenants who live in buildings owned by Fannie and Freddie. A lot of these evictions are going forward even though the very policies which necessitate those evictions are about to change under Mel Watt. For all these reasons, we are urging the council to pass this non-minding resolution, send it to Mel Watt and other places, to our senators, um, urging Fannie and Freddie to stop no-fault evictions and foreclosures until Mel Watt has a chance to review all these policies and probably make all these evictions unnecessary in the first place. That will also prevent uh, uh, vacant buildings owned by Fannie and Freddie, which you we were addressing previously. So thank you very much for listening to us and having us here. I think there are a couple other people in the Bank Tenant Association, Association who want to speak. Mr. Meacham, we appreciate you being here. Counselor. Uh, Mr. Chairperson, um, Mr. Meacham, I, first of all, clearly um, we, we all know the struggles that Brockton has had with foreclosure, which is why I believe this resolve is, is important, as you mentioned, unbinding. Um, and not to forget to mention that uh, Fannie and Freddie have received over $180 billion of taxpayer uh, bailout. Um, and uh, so in some respects, they are evicting the folks who are paying their, their bills. Can you explain to me, uh, explain to us what a no-fault eviction is? Good question. Uh, a no-fault eviction is an eviction that's uh, brought in court without any stated cause. So in a no-fault eviction that Fannie brings, the reason for the eviction in summary process hearing is stated as the person didn't get out when we told them to, basically. You know, after, respond, after we gave them a notice to quit, they didn't leave. So they're not alleging non-payment of rent. They won't take rent. They're not alleging destruction of property or anything like that. They just want to clear out the building. Uh, state law now prevents foreclosing banks from evicting former tenants. Fannie and Freddie are saying that they have the right, nevertheless, despite state law, to evict former tenants because they're a federal agency and not bound by state law. Similarly, uh, there was a law passed last year, uh, rather in late 2012, that prevents a bank from selling to somebody like Boston Community Capital and putting a rider on that sale that says they can't resell to the owner. That was ruled illegal. Again, Fannie and Freddie say they're not bound by that because they're not because they're federal agencies. So a lot of these bad policies by Fannie and Freddie were enforced and necessitated by Ed DeMarco, who is now gone. And uh, with the, with the you know, S Senator Markey and Senator Warren were very active in that effort. And, uh, and so I think that just, it just doesn't make sense to have these evictions go forward around policies that will not exist in a few months. And I know others are coming up to, to speak on this issue, but can you give us a sense of how many other communities have taken all this resolve uh, in addition to possibly Brockton voting in favor of it. The City of Boston passed a resolution unanimously a couple of months ago urging Fannie and Freddie to stop no-fault evictions in that city. The City of Lynn uh, passed an ordinance opposing no-fault evictions. They took a, it was a stronger than just a non-binding thing. But we're, gonna, we're s slowly bringing it to all the places where we have people active. And uh, I know that Brockton, the City of Brockton has been very concerned about this issue because of the the weight of the foreclosure crisis in the city. And uh, I think that even though this is a non-binding resolution, it will have a material effect on the policies of Fannie and Freddie and is designed to support Mel Watt and his efforts to change policy. 
I agree with you. And I think it's always important for our colleagues in the federal government to know that local communities are paying attention to this issue. And so this uh, is symbolic in some, in some respects, but also, as you mentioned, very material in its impact. So I know you have others who, wanna, who want to present. These are some prepared comments. It also includes the Boston Resolution and a press release of a, of, a, of a rally we had in front of a homeowner's yard in Brockton that has been approved by Boston Community Capital for a new loan, but Freddie Mac won't negotiate. Council of Store, there are other invited guests that I, you I think want to so. come forward. Are others coming to, um, to speak? Thank you. Good evening, uh, Councilmen and ladies. Thank you for having us. Uh, and I just want to say... Ma'am, if you could just state your name for the record, please. My name is Emma Grigsby, and I live here in Brockton. Thank you. Uh, I'm a city life organizer and also a part of the Brockton Tenant Association. And we have lots of members here in Brockton and in other areas that they have been approved for loans by BCC. But because of Fannie Mae and Ed DiMarco, seriously, the head that was the head of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Uh, they will not <laughs> sell to Boston Capital, but in the meantime, Boston community, in the meantime, they sell to investors uh, for less than what the former owners have even offered, which is unfair. It's another way that they are being mean, just mean to people that got into trouble, and we know how the trouble came, that the average citizen did not ask for it, that the banks caused it, you know, and the country, we bailed them out, and now their continued effort is to evict, and it's not fair. So we need this resolution to try to hold them at bay for now until the new manager of Fannie and Freddie can institute new rules. And we thank you very much for hearing us and hopefully you'll rule in our favor. And thank Ms. you, Mrs. Mrs. Minor. Um, and also just so that it's clear to my colleagues, you mentioned what's known in the industry as moral hazard, where the banks uh, are purposely not um, refinancing to the, the individuals who got into foreclosure to begin with, even if it's costing that bank more money because they want to make certain they're teaching those, uh, those okay. previous owners a lesson. Yeah. And that's becoming and, common practice uh, in the industry. Some of the other banks now, after four, are working with the people. Meanwhile, the bank that is supposed to be ours, the People's Bank, you know, uh, they refuse. They will not work with the people at all. So we do need to send a message to them that that's unacceptable. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, please come forward, state your name for the record. Good evening, all. Um, my name is Ronald J. F. Remy. I live at 105 Southwest Street, Brockton, Mass. Uh, I love this place so much. And I'm fortunate to see all of you. I didn't know this, this worked that way. I've seen you guys on TV, but this is the real thing. <laughs> <laughs> this is, that, that's nice, yeah. Thank uh, you for watching. Yes, sir. <laughs> we, look, we look a little fatter on TV, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I have a simple story. Uh, I had a bad mortgage at first. And I was running uh, left and right, you know. From the, the time I signed the deeds of the house, I knew it was bad. So I spoke with my uh, broker at the time. He told me, because of your credit history, this is the only way I can help you. You have to sign it. If you can live in the house for a year, 
then I can take the PMI out of your uh, mortgage after a year, then it would go down on, what, on the number, as I told you before. So I agree uh, after, we sp uh, after we spoke a while, so I signed it. So, but I told him, then how, am I, how, how am I gonna be able to, to handle it? He said, don't you have family members? Don't you have brothers, mothers, you know? Bow from them, try to, to hold it. So I've done that. And then after a year, I call him, it was not so. Can you hold it another year? So at that point, I was not even speaking to my mother, to my brothers. <laughs> Imagine, I've got kids, you know. For me, for Christmas, I call mom. She would not answer the phone, just because I could not repay her. I mean, I, I come from Haiti. I've seen misery. I live misery. So I came here. I thought this was the, the best thing in life. This is the greatest country in the world. I mean, I've never seen things that bad before in my life. I've been in this, in this country for over 27 years now. I've got a nine-year-old daughter. Sometimes I could even afford milk for her. How do you tell her you cannot buy milk and you have a job? Or cheese? I, I mean, it goes on and on. Or sometimes all of us got calls in the house because we cannot heat the house. Imagine that. And I live in America, and folks think I, I'm living the dream. And I've seen all these things, and I've seen folks, you know, they got the belt out. We help them. We pay taxes to help them. And when it comes for them to help us back, they're kicking us out. You need to leave. I've got calls, you know, sometimes I, I, I would tell uh, the kids, just say I'm not there. Imagine you're trying to tell them not to lie, and then at the same time you're telling them to lie to protect you. If someone come and knock on the door, you cannot open the door. You're afraid of everything. I mean, this is jail after a while. That's how I saw it, you know. Until I met these folks, you know, at City Life. And then they taught me there is another way. You're not supposed to, to live in fear. No, those Gestapo tactics, you know, they stop. If you understand, this is just fear. And I learn and I grow with them, and now I'm not afraid anymore. Now I know I, I need to fight, and I'm asking you good folks, you have to help us out, because we are the little guys, you know. Those big corporations, they can do that to us if you let them. So our fate is in your hands, I mean. I hope you can do something for us. I want to stay in Brighton. I love the city. It's like I, I was not born here, but, but I was made for here. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. I can't say enough about it. So I have to stay here. Thank you, Mr. Remy. Thank you. I have a question for Mr. Remy. Oh, yes. I am um, closed in December, and then my house was auctioned a few days after. And all this went so quickly. I, I don't understand why it happened so quick. And then I, I had phone calls asking me when I want to move out. Uh, they would negotiate for me uh, $3,000 a year. They could get me a place, go anywhere as soon as possible. That, that's all the calls I, I get. So I don't know. That's Fannie. That's yeah, that's Fannie Mae. Mr. Remy, Wait, Council Dubois had, had a question for you, if you didn't mind. Council Dubois. Council Hi, Dubois. Mr. Remy. So, so you were foreclosed on in December. Yes, ma'am. And, and so your family and you are going to move out? Or are you negotiating with Boston Sun Capital? Yes. Or? So That's what they're negotiating on your behalf? On my behalf, yes. Yeah. Well, I'm really sorry that that happened to you because I've heard time and time again where people get into these, if I assume, if I understand what you were saying, you got into a high interest rate mortgage in the hope that you could pay on time for a year and then be able to refinance. Yes. And that was what was happening. I mean, I had some friends doing that same thing and house flipping and they thought they were going to make a lot of money. But a lot of people got caught in the gap here, and you were just trying to house your family members with this, yes. right? Yes. Indeed. It's very sad that you got taken advantage of like that, so I'm sorry. Big time. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. President. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Mr. Remy. You're welcome. Just one quick thing for 
Mr. Remy could afford his house yeah. Yeah. at, the, at his current just... value. And Fannie's going to bring an eviction action against him. Mm -hmm. It's needless, and that's why, that's, that's exactly the policy that Mel Watt's going to change. It's going to be unnecessary for Mr. Remy to move I know. once Mel Watt changes those policies. And so we're asking you to just stop the evictions until he reviews the policies. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Your name for the record, please. Hello. Good evening, uh, councillors. Uh, my name is Romeo Forbes, and I'm a uh, resident of Brockton uh, for 10 years. I uh, reside on Center 7 Hillberg Avenue. Uh, in my case, to make uh, for purpose of time, uh, uh, bought my house in 2004, and at the time, uh, didn't know who was the uh, immediate uh, mortgage holder was until 2013. But uh, servicer was always Bank of America. And things was good. Got the house at $320,000 at a high time in those times. And up until 2009, I had an uh, equity of over 60000 Was appraised again at, in 2008, it was appraised at 380000 So I did a refi with an option arm, hoping to go into multi-family multi along with a single. Um, my course of work is a field, te uh, field technician for uh, Xfinity, Comcast. So I, had, I, had a good I have a good career going at the time until the bubble burst in 2008. I continue to manage my, uh, my mortgage at $2,350 until 2009 March, when I have a big pay cut at that time. Also, because of the bubble, company had cutbacks and no raises, dropping from a household of $110,000 down to $75,000. And I have my wife lost her job at the hospital for uh, at uh, MGH. Now it's only myself with four children, and now on an income of sixty thousand dollars. So that was the push, and I called for Bank of America for assistance, and they told me about the whole program. And with that whole program to be qualified for that, I was told, Mr. Forbes, you are not behind. You have to get behind at least three months before we could even talk to you. I made a second phone call at the time. In good instance for myself, I have a good structure in terms of even knowing lawyers and hand as in my church community. So I was advised that the next time you make a phone call, get something on record for yourself. So by mid by about August of 2009, I called and said, could I make, pay the big mortgage and you hold back on the small mortgage? That I could continue to do. At that time, that was 1685. And there was a second mortgage. Um, they did not agree. And then I was told, get back, get behind three months, sign up for the whole program, and we'll assist you with some modification. I got that on record for myself. Not that they would hear that in court, but it's good for me to have in case I need to retain someone to speak to. So I started doing my own research. And then they, they, they came out with this um, taking advantage of with, the, uh, with, with different loans that is not right in terms of your income to debt ratio and what the house is worth. So to speed that along, in 20, I fought them and went with them, sat down with them, two different occasions, and on the second occasion, according to my income, I was the, at this time in 2012, I met City Life, and I became a member. And I met with the um, with Bank of America, and what was proposed on, on, on file, according to income, was $900 a month. And when they, when, when, when they looked at it, and I sat and spoke with them, they came back with a response, 
with a denial over $1,200 in annual income that they could not do it. And from there on, we continued to fight. I went forward in, in getting forensic, um, forensic um, paperwork done on the property and how transaction was being done. Came to find out no one know who has the deed. The deed with the loan, different names with different entities between Bank of America and Wells Fargo. So with that being done and with the, with, with, with the um, with City Life behind me and the forming of BTA, I discovered new strength, continue to fight because I love Brockton myself. I work in the city. I do a lot of things in the city, but my money and everything else is spent in Brockton. My family time is in Brockton. And everything with my son and my daughter to Brockton High School is an excellent high school for me and my children. And I would like to see this Brockton re rebuilt on family to a great extent. So with all that being said, we went to court at the housing court when, when after I was, the house was foreclosed on, on August, August 2013. And I put forth to them what I found in, in forensic after we teamed up with uh, True City Life and BTA with the Harvard Legal Aid. That was great assistance all the way through with the lawyers that have assisted me on, 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 on my home and our argument stands strong and through the court, court process as we know my situation is a little different being that it's not Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac but Bank of America was also one of those banks that was in some form of agreement that would give the opportunity to a homeowner if the numbers prove to be worth looking at in terms of um, the real value of the property now to what the mortgage was written on then. So through the court system, went through the mediators and with the lawyers, two leading lawyers for Bank of America, we sat face to face, we discussed the matters, put the papers down. At the time, they decided that they could not go below $275,000. We said the property is not worth that. So after doing the, the, the structure and the different um, demographics of property around within a two or three mile radius, I said on my street alone, we have four properties, not including mine, single family that has been on the market for over two years, um, abandoned, not being taken care of, that's bringing down our, our community in terms of safety and just livelihood. So the thing with that, they went back and looked at that. We decided that we could not go over um, $175,000 max. For a long story short, they came back with us. And with BCC in the mix, being approved me and stuff like that, the great thing is the property was retained by BCC for $140,000 and it was resold back to me for $175,000. So it's a success for myself, yeah. for BTA, and for City Life. And, and until this day, I'm still working. I've never been out of work, never asked for a handout, only working by myself with my four children, still at 60000 a year. But at least now, I could afford the property. I've been doing it for a year. I have a surplus that could continue paying and looking to just get better. And I'm just here to support the, uh, the, my, my team, and I will never stop fighting for those who are less fortunate because we're not here looking for a handout. We are looking for opportunity in rebuilding our community. Yeah. And I'm hoping you guys will just support us on that. Thank you for sharing that story, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, so um, thank, thank you all again for your, your work and your stories and coming out in public and sharing what oftentimes are personal stories that people 
don't want to share with others, but it's it's a true inspiration to folks who are watching. I'm certain I know you get a lot of energy from each other to continue the battle, and I'm confident that this council will vote in in favor of this resolution to um, uh, to to support your efforts. So, on that note, Mr. Chairperson, I'd like to to motion to have this favor favorably back to the full city. Second. Okay. Motion's been made by Council Stewart. Uh, it's properly seconded by Council Stanisky. Favorable recommendation to full city council. All in favor? Mm -hmm. All opposed? Motion carries. Favorable recommendation to full city council. Uh, council Bonds. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to um, ask that we take number 18 out of um, succession. Second. Motion's been made by Council Bonds. Seconded by Council Dubois to take number 18 out of order. All in favor? Please raise your hands if you're in favor. All opposed? Motion carries. Madam Clerk, 18, please. Resolved that the new ownership of the Brockton Rocks be invited to be appear before a committee of this council to discuss the plans to revitalize the ballpark and the baseball team. Invited Chris English, owner of the Brockton Rocks. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Clerk. Actually, uh, the owner, Mr. English, is, is not available, so we have in his stead uh, Mr. Andy Crosley and Everybody recognizes Mr. Mike Canina from the Shaw Center, and I, I would just like to have them, um, as I mentioned before, when I put this resolve in, uh, the, the Rocks, everybody recognizes the Rocks had some challenges um, over the last couple of years, um, but the new ownership and new management team that they have over there, they are committed to revitalizing that area. And I, in speaking with um, Councilor Ianeri, where it's in his, his area. Um, nobody wants that to go dark, so we definitely want to hear about the new initiatives that the new management team that they're putting in place, um, and some of the plans that they have for uh, the summertime, which is fast approaching, and getting everyone um, excited and invigorated to come back out to the stadium. So, Mr. Canina, uh, thank you for being here. Mr. Crosley, welcome back to Brockton, and uh, we thank you. I had the distinct opportunity of meeting Mr. English, uh, as some of my colleagues have. A great guy, really has a passion for baseball, and going to do some good things for Brockton. So. Again, if you could follow what the council said, maybe give us some updates. Updates. Good evening, councillors. My name is uh, Andy Crosley. Thank you for uh, inviting us here to address you tonight. I was a former front office worker and general manager of the Rocks from 2003 to 2007, and just came back in uh, November when Chris English purchased the team. Chris is in New York tonight uh, and sends his regrets. He he did he really wished to be here, but. Uh, Michael Canina, uh, my friend and colleague, has been a stalwart uh, front office uh, executive with the Rocks for 11 years, since 2003, through uh, multiple ownership groups. So along with Chris English, Michael and I are the other two members of the new management team uh, that bought the team in November. And uh, as, as you know, you are all probably aware of that event and saw some coverage of it in the Brockton Enterprise, but we know that the uh, condition and usage and programming of Campanelli Stadium is a matter that's of uh, interest to the council, so we wanted to let you know um, about the private investment that's been put into the facility uh, this winter and about some of the plans for the upcoming season. Michael has been supervising the day-to-day -day, um, progress of the renovations this, this uh, winter, so I wanted to ask Michael if he'd give an update on what's being done over at Campanelli. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you for having us here tonight. It's, it's really exciting uh, being in the venue for 11 years and, and having a, a mindset of what the greatness the venue could achieve and then getting Andy back and someone like Mr. English to come in. And he's, he's already put in a half million dollars worth of improvements that our fan base and, and Brocktonians in the city are immediately recognized. Uh, we did over the infield. Uh, we did a, a brick backstop like at Wrigley Field behind home plate. He repainted the entire concourse. Um, so it had gotten rusty through the 10 years, but uh, you know the bones of the facility have been fantastic. Yeah. And a project that we'll be doing in the spring is a rocks monster. So we'll have a, a green monster out in left field, which um, you know it's going to be really exciting not only for Brocktonians and, and for the rocks, anyone who plays at the stadium, like the uh, Brockton High School baseball team. Uh, we're in negotiations with UMass Boston to have it be their home field again this season, also Newberry College. And then a little bit of an emphasis back into the special events. Uh, Kevin Falk used to play for the New England Patriots, did his celebrity softball game there for uh, quite a few years. There will be back this May. Um, Andy has a, a few other events with he's working on with the community that we're really excited about. And, and then 
really having uh, Mr. English and his funds and his belief in what the venue can do is going to allow us with the expertise that we have on our staff and the staff that we're going to continue to grow to allow us to expand on the successful uh, special events that have taken place during the past and bring them in-house as opposed to, you know, always waiting for someone to come to us. I really feel to bring the rocks back to the community asset that we all took so much pride in over the years, there's really two things that we're trying to accomplish. One is to really make Campanelli Stadium into a great family entertainment destination for people throughout the region so that we have people coming into Brockton here on the evenings, here on the weekends, who view this as the place that they want to spend their, their time and their money uh, for family entertainment. And the second is within Brockton to really restore a sense of community pride in the team and the ballpark. So we have three events that I just wanted to make you aware of tonight that we're very excited about for this summer. Uh, the first is as soon as uh, Chris English purchased the team in November, uh, Chris Hall, who's the commissioner of the Futures Collegiate Baseball League and a Brockton High School graduate, by the way, um, prevailed upon the other owners to award the 2014 All-Star Game to Brockton. So we will be hosting the 2014 Futures League All-Star Game on Thursday, July 24th. That will bring uh, dozens of major league scouts from all over the country to Brockton, in addition to citizens and officials from the nine other league cities around New England. And we really looked at that All-Star Game as a great opportunity to go back and re-engage with the youth of Brockton. And so we've created a great program with Brockton Public School Department called uh, Artists and All-Stars, where the logo for the All-Star Game this year will actually be created in an art contest among the eight uh, junior high schools here in, uh, or middle schools rather, here in Brockton, uh, with the cooperation of Kathy Smith and the Brockton Public Schools and the Arts Department. So we're very excited about that, and we're going to take the logo that's designed uh, by the kids have it professionally executed by an ad agency in Boston, and then spend a considerable portion of our marketing budget here within the city to um, exhibit the student's design. Uh, the other thing that was remarkable is that Brockton High School and Cardinal Spellman have not played each other in baseball in more than a decade. Um, so we worked with Coach Bresnahan and Coach Maloney at, at Spellman and Brockton High to uh, create an intercity classic baseball game. They'll play each other for the first time this year on Friday, May 16th. But we're going to give the kids an ex the experience of playing in a real fully produced game. So that game will be free to the entire community, of course, like all of the high school games are. But we'll have a, a post-game fireworks show afterwards. We'll have video board uh, headshots of the players on both teams. And uh, Mayor Carpenter has graciously agreed to be the public address announcer for that game as well. Uh, what's, the, what's the date on that, Eddie? That is fr Friday, May 16th. And we're looking for, uh, we're looking for prominent uh, alumni from both schools to take part in the festivities. So we've already asked Councillor Barnes to serve as Spellman's uh, first base coach for the first inning <laughs> of the game. I don't know how to do that. Whatever. Uh, so, you know, those, those programs, the, the Spellman-Brockton game, which we hope will become an annual tradition, the Artists and All-Stars program, these are the kinds of programs that I, I think, you know, now that we've restaffed the team, we have six employees now, whereas at this time last year we had only two. Um, it's the kind of community re-engagement that we think um, really is going to be very meaningful and restore a sense of pride in the team. So we wanted you to hear that from us firsthand. And, um, you know, we thank you very much for your time tonight and, and uh, really look forward to showing off the, the renovated park to you uh, when we open up on June 3rd. Thank you. Councilor. Um, no follow-up questions. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Councilor. Thank you. Please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for filing this. Uh, uh, the stadium looks great. I've been up there as the other day Chris English announced, and of course we had a wonderful fall up there recently that uh, I attended. But uh, any uh, concerts going to be uh, on, this, on the schedule this year? Right now we're in discussion with um, a Grammy award-winning producer who is looking at four of the teams in our league, Brockton, probably the most prominent. Uh, to do a summer concert series. So those negotiations started a couple of weeks ago. And I, I think what was exciting is it got Mr. English very excited about that aspect. Um, and he's coming to grips with the fact that he also owns a conference center and event center. Um, he was there for the mayoral ball and he had a blast. Um, so what I think what we're going to see is a culmination of the venue putting all its tools together and producing great events. Good, because, I mean, the ones we've had have been great, but, uh, well, last year they weren't really poured on, but uh, 
uh, seems like that that's kind of fallen by the wayside. So hopefully we can get that going again with some some real names. So that's great. And Mr. English has been he's exactly what we needed. Uh, you know, a baseball person, a local person who has some of his own money. We like that part. Yeah, we so <laughs> we like that also. <laughs> Good luck. Thank you, Councilor Stadensky. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, uh, Councilor Cruz. Uh, the cords will be invited, I'm sure, up there. But, uh, I wasn't going there. <laughs> they can't I, afford us. General, I, I, I want to start very quickly. I'm not going to ask you a question, but I want to give you both kudos for all you've done. Fantastic. The venue, Shaw's, Mike, uh, what you've done out there. And uh, I know, and a lot of people may not know, we have the, probably the best groundskeeper in any league, Tom, Tom Asset up there. And uh, it, it's a great-looking place. I go by a lot and uh, walk up in that area and get a good looking. Just want to thank you for all you've done. It would be a pleasure to have this new gentleman in town. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Monahan. Thank you, uh, Councilor Sullivan. I'm Mr. P uh, Chairman. Sorry about that. Um, yes, good evening, gentlemen. Thank you again for uh, it's a really excited that they bought the state, uh, the rocks, and really did, made a lot of good improvements right. up there. Um, is there any thought to bring it back independent baseball, or are you still uh, dedicated to the collegiate league? Or is the league that the Rocks were formerly a member of is called the Can-Am League, and it's no longer in existence as of December 2013. So the challenge with returning to independent baseball would actually be finding an appropriate league uh, that the Rocks could take part in. There is one league in independent baseball which is active in the Northeast. It's called the Atlantic League, and actually Mr. English is a founder of that league and an investor in the Long Island franchise in that league. <laughs> but those are very large cities that, that we'll take wait. part. Um, and uh, the amount of games and the, uh, frankly, the expense base of running that probably wouldn't be sustainable here in Brockton. Uh, and with the territorial rules of affiliated professional baseball and us being so close to Pawtucket, it would not be possible to get an affiliated team. Um, so right now our focus, you know, while, while the future could bring a return of independent baseball, our focus right now is on trying to become one of the finest uh, collegiate baseball teams in the country. And we certainly have the stadium to uh, support that goal. Okay, thank, and I think uh, m maybe Council Sullivan might win him over. He's been trying to get a softball game between the uh, council and the mayor's staff for the past uh, four years. Maybe uh, he can uh, talk uh, Mayor Car Carpenter into doing it. We did have one game. We won the trophy. I don't know where it is. But we did. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Consigliere. If I might, Mr. Chairman, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, uh, gentlemen. And Andy, welcome back. It's a, it's a great pleasure to see you back here. Uh, you know, back in the city of Brockton, and uh, Michael, as always, a great job. You always have done a wonderful job there. Um, and as my uh, colleague had mentioned, yes, the stadium does sit in Ward 3. I'm very proud to, to have it there. Um, and I'm looking forward to when I come up to, you know, to see it as it's been under some reconstruction, but also looking forward to, uh, to the new season as well with you. The only thing that, um, and Michael knows what I'm probably going to say, the only thing that, that always concerns me is if we get to the part where we're going to have concerts, I just want you to take into consideration you are within a neighborhood, so work accordingly and work <laughs> yeah, with me up. as the ward council because sometimes it can get out of, yep. just get out of a little bit of thrust to the volume that, that the concert could be. So that's most important, as you know, for that neighborhood. Well, the council might not be aware of this, but I live right down on Linwood Street, so my wife has me keep that in mind as well. You're still, <laughs> <laughs> you're still there, but any, in any case, thank you, and uh, good luck. Best of luck to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before council, does anybody other council have any questions before council makes motion? I just had three quick questions. Are you going to be able to have a, a Cape Cod League at the stadium this year at all? We Any spoke with the Cape League last year, and they had some interest in playing at the venue. One of the um, things we were trying to work out is an exhibition game. Yeah. And right now, they haven't been that keen on that idea. Um, I think they don't want to take the chance of losing to a team in the FCBL. But we're still working on it. And at a minimum, you know, we'd make our facility available for a pure Cape League game. And what about, I, I saw a BC Notre Dame game up there years ago. Uh, does BC have any interest in coming out here? You know, I'm not sure why uh, Boston College interest waned in coming to the venue. They would play uh, two or three games a, a year there and um, some pretty high-profile games that were televised. Um, I can tell you I can look into it with the, with the coach over there and see if there's any interest in coming back. Yeah, we great. have a pretty full uh, agenda in the spring with, with now having UMass with the high school in Newberry. Essentially... Campanelli Stadium has become the home field for UMass, Boston, and Newberry College, which is fantastic to think that we're going to start mid-March with baseball at the venue. 
It's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I love the, the Spellman Brockton High idea. I think it's yeah. awesome. That's great. Maybe you could even consider a, a Stonehill versus Bridgewater State because there's a lot of Brockton alum that went to those schools as well. So that's my humble suggestion. Councilor Bonds. Uh, at this time, I would like to recommend that the council bring this forward to the full council favorably. Second. Thank you. The motion's been made by Councilor Bond, seconded by Councilor Denapoli. Favorable recommendation. All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries favorable. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Thank you for the thank time you. as well. <coughs> um, Madam Clerk, number 14, please. Order appropriation $12,000 from the Massachusetts Executive Office of Public Safety and Security, Highway Safety Division, Fiscal Year 2014 Traffic Enforcement Grant to the City of Brockton Police Department, EOPS Fiscal Year 14 Traffic Enforcement Grant Fund, invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer. Mr. Condon. Even Councilors, uh, this is uh, for a couple of uh, different periods where with the state you'll be providing either click it slash ticket or drives over or get pulled over uh, grant enforcement. So Motion to approve for second. recommend favorably. Motion to made, Councilor uh, Cruz, seconded by uh, DiNapoli. Favorable recommendation, all in favor, all opposed. Motion carries favorable, full city council. Thank you, Councilors. Madam Clerk, 15, please. <coughs> Order appropriation, 51,400 from the Massachusetts Executive Office of Public Safety and Security, Highway Safety Division, Fiscal Year 2014, Sustained Enforcement Step Grant to the City of Brockton Police Department, EOPS, Fiscal Year 14, Traffic Enforcement Grant Fund, invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer. Uh, Councilors, this is an intersection-based uh, traffic enforcement grant where the uh, data being used for the highest uh, level of um, violations is going to be uh, targeted for uh, enforcement. Motion to recommend Second. favorably. Second. Motion made by Councilor Stanislaw, properly seconded by Councilor Yaneri. Favorable recommendation. All in favor? All opposed. Motion carries favorable. Full City Council. Thank, Thank you. you. Madam Clerk, 16, please. Order transfer of 54200 from the finance personal services other than overtime, 30000 and from personal employee benefits unemployment insurance, 24200 to the Office of the Mayor personal services other than overtime in order to provide funding for the transitional cost and compensation to the staff of two mayors, separation costs for the outgoing administrative staff, and added salary costs for the new mayor's staff. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer. Mr. Mayor. Can I make a quick comment? Uh, sure can. I just want to share with the councilors also that I'm, I'm very excited about the new owner for the Rocks and the, the turnaround at Campanelli Stadium. When I, uh, within a couple of days after the election, I think the first thing I did as the mayor elect is I was involved in renegotiating a new lease with the Rocks owner, uh, Mr. English. And I've got to tell you, I went into that very skeptical based upon some things that have happened there in recent years and the inability of the prior owners to not always meet their obligations. And uh, but over the course of a few days, I was also very impressed with Mr. English. And I think for the first time ever, we have a local owner who has some financial wherewithal behind him to do things. And I think that, you know, when they talk about their investment of half a million dollars, Half of that, a quarter of a million, is being invested into the stadium, which the team doesn't even own. So I, I, I think that we've um, really gotten a great commitment from these new owners, and I'm really optimistic, and I hope that we'll all get together and try to support the events that are going on up there, because if the stadium does well, that's going to be, it's going to be good for the city. It's <coughs> going to be good for all of us. So thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So on this matter, um, this was postponed from the previous finance committee meeting uh, that I apologize. I was out of state and I understand that there was some information requested by counselors that was not available that night. Uh, so we've made an effort to bring that information to you tonight. Did, did you all get the handout? Yes. You have it? Okay. So in, in front of you, um, you have a listing of every, uh, this is now referring to um, my office staff and the mayor's office. And you have a listing of all of the individuals working there with their job titles and their salaries. Uh, I will remind the counselors that when we all met individually back in December, I did uh, let all the counselors know that we would be asking to fund one additional position in the budget this year for the mayor's office. And that was based on a recommendation from members of three previous administrations that the mayor's office was critically 
understaffed and not well positioned to provide the necessary services. Um, we've done this, I think, uh, very uh, professionally and economically. If you look at the individuals in their positions, uh, two of those folks were retained from the previous administration at their current salaries with no change. Three of the other positions were slotted at exactly the same salaries that similar positions were being paid under the prior administration. Um, the chief of staff's salary was slotted at uh, what Mayor Balzotti's first chief of staff, Mr. Thompson, was making with a 5% adjustment that all the members of the mayor's staff had received along the way. So it's in essence funded at the same level that the prior chief of staff was. And in fact, Mr. Buckley took a reduction in income at that number to, to take the job. Um, and I think also as you review those titles and individuals and salaries, uh, you'll see that all of the folks that I hired, other than the chief of staff, are all at salaries below $50,000. And I think very closely aligned with the same types of salaries that were being paid by the prior administration. So um, that's my overview of it, um, but I will certainly um, respond to individual questions. Uh, Council Bonds. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. First. With regard to the, the duties <coughs> of your uh, staff, number four and number six, not using their names, just the, the titles, Director of Constituent Services and Director of Community Relations, what are, what's the difference in those? Yeah, well, quite honestly, with the volume of, of work that comes in on a daily <coughs> basis and all the various things we're asked to do, these are job titles with job descriptions. There is a lot of crossover, and I think that you know we're we're taking a team approach that everyone yeah, is doing yeah. duties that aren't necessarily in their job description on a daily basis. Um, so, so what are they doing? Then right. it's different so from me, one another. Let me try to try right. They are a little bit different. Um, the director of constituent services is really the first point of contact for people who either walk into the office or call the office looking for services. The director of community relations is a person who tends to be more in and out of the office and very actively out in the community for part of their time along with being in the office. Uh, he's also, well, almost everyone on the staff is doing nights and weekends to some extent, but that particular job probably even more so. Um, so I, I think the two positions are similar, but there is a distinction between constituent services and someone who represents the mayor's office in the community. Uh, the other um, thing I would mention to you, Councillor, as you look at those, um, sometimes language needs cause crossover also. So of, of the folks that, that I hired, other than myself and the chief, are all multilingual. So as an example, if someone came in for constituent services, but was looking for assistance in, in Haitian Creole, then um, you know the director of community relations would probably jump right in and, and help that person because of the, uh, the language services. So we all do have defined responsibilities and areas to be held accountable for, uh, but clearly the intent is also for a lot of crossover for folks to help out other folks when they need help. My goal and what I've said to not just the folks in my office, but as I'm getting to know around uh, people around City Hall. In my view, every single person who works for the city is constituent services. And I think sometimes, you know, we lose sight of that a little bit. But I, I actually believe that we're, we're all constituent services, both in my office and throughout city government. Okay, uh, thank you. And then for the uh, business and government liaison. Yep, that's, um, that's the new position. And um, I, I think this person is, is uniquely positioned to really address a couple critical needs that we need to do a better job of. Um, if we're going to be successful going forward addressing services and budgets, I feel we have to do a better job in coordinating with county, state, and federal agencies for programs and projects and funding that we might be able to bring to the city. Um, and a couple examples of this with this individual uh, he and I this morning were in Boston meeting with representatives of, of HUD, including the New England Regional Director of HUD and about six department heads that she put together. We spent a couple hours with them in Boston this morning exploring HUD programs, 
things that are anticipated to come out in the future, looking for more CDBG funding. We had conversations about code enforcement, um, about funding a Main Street manager position. So this person is, is going to be the primary person that has responsibility for building and developing those relationships between the mayor's office and the various government agencies at all levels. Um, a, um, another example of that would be uh, a week ago we were in at the State House uh, testifying um, in front of a, I testified on a bill in front of the uh, legislature that would potentially reduce borrowing costs for municipalities, municipalities if it was uh, adopted. That bill was co-sponsored by Representative Cronin. Um, so it gave me an opportunity not to just be up there and testify on that bill, but I also met with a couple other members of the legislature while I was there that day. This person is the person who went with me and is helping me with a lot of those relationships. This particular person just graduating with a master's degree in public administration and has been working in the State House for about four years and has a lot of know-how in terms of state agencies, how the legislature works. He was most recently working for the Ways and Means Committee. So that's the government piece of it. And then on the business side of it, I think I, we all would recognize that public safety and economic development are the two biggest mm. challenges facing this city. I'll be back in front of you in the very near future to talk about um, the, the city planner's office uh, that you've already endorsed, but I want to have some conversations with you about how we implement it. Um, but one of the big things that's come out of our work on how do we make the city more business friendly, how do we develop a culture where businesses want to expand or open here, um, and one of the complaints was from business owners across the city and developers thinking about coming in is that there was not great responsiveness from City Hall and um, businesses don't feel as though there's, they have a go-to person at City Hall. So this person is also taking that responsibility of being the primary point of contact in city government for businesses that are already here and also businesses that are contemplating coming here or expanding. And, you know, as we look at our budgets and going forward, uh, you know, we need to expand the tax base. Uh, the, the pressures we're under to try to balance this budget each year are just getting tougher and tougher, and we've had a shrinking commercial tax base, and I believe one of many keys to getting that commercial tax base to expand and um, in generating investment here in the city is doing a better job coordinating city government with the needs of businesses in the city, and uh, this person is taking responsibility for that. I'll give you a quick example of a program that we're launching this week that this person is heading up, and that is that um, we are partnering with Google on a program that will, Google will offer a free website with one year of free hosting through the mayor's office to any small business in the city. It's a great opportunity for a lot of our small businesses. If you think particularly about a lot of businesses in the main corridor in the city, businesses that are women-owned, minority-owned, immigrant-owned, a lot of these types of small businesses that I feel are really the keys to our future economic growth in the city, um, the opportunity to, to get a website for a business without having to pay for it and get a year of hosting, I think is a tremendous opportunity and shows this, the city's commitment to small business and can help these small businesses survive and thrive. Um, this person is spearheading that project and it'll be a big project and you'll be hearing a lot about it over the next few weeks. Okay, so going back, um, <clears throat> agencies like um, Neighbor Works of Southern Massachusetts, they would have to go through this gentleman in order to advocate for the CDBG funds that they get or um, any kind of HUD relationships that they've already no, built? No, uh, I, no. I gave the meeting with HUD today as an example of something that he's working with me with developing the relationships amongst various people within HUD, specifically to CDBG, which just held recently, there's a public hearing each uh, year where right. any stakeholders that would like to apply for those funds. So no, he's not in a position of, of recommending or not recommending specific requests. I will be sitting uh, with the interim um, director of the BRA to review those requests in the near future. I think uh, February 14th, I want to say off the top of my head. Right, right. So he, so for instance, 
Rob Jenkins won't have to go through him to do what he's been doing no, for five no. years. Uh, Robert was with us at that meeting this morning also, along with Paul Morris. So it's just another person to do what's been done? No, not the same thing, because um, I think that BRA's approach is more of an administrator mm -hmm. of the CDBJ funds that we um, receive. They get allocated, right. I, I'm, I'm looking for this person working with me to be more of an advocate to bring additional funding and identify additional programs that can benefit the city. I gave that as one example of something that we did today where um, a government liaison. We, we need someone who's going to really develop relationships. We met, I think, five other directors of various things from HUD uh, in addition to the New England director. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's going to be a lot of follow-up and ongoing conversations and identifying other funding sources and uh, also uh, doing research on a couple things that uh, HUD may be offering a little bit later in the year that we want to be well positioned to go after when they come out. So they would, so this gentleman would be like a lobbyist to the governor on the funding that they get lobbyist from the federal government? Lobbyist, relationship builder at all levels, county, state, and federal. I mean, I just think it's something that is a focus of mine to try to improve in the mayor's office is, um, you know, I think I need to be in Washington a couple times a year face to face with people down there. Obviously, you're familiar with the, the congressman's office. So on my recent trip to Washington, I spent an hour meeting uh, with Kevin Ryan, the congressman's chief of staff down there. He told me. Yeah. So, I mean, I think this is the type of thing in relationship building, giving him a chance to know me better so that when an opportunity comes up uh, that there may be s some funding that we may be able to get or a program and we're looking for some extra help, I think I'm more effective calling the congressman's chief of staff if we know each other and we have an ongoing relationship than I'm just a voice at the end of the phone that he's never heard of before but now all of a sudden we're looking for help with something. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Councilor Yanieri. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You Mr. Mayor, I just want to get I just want to get my numbers correct, mm -hmm. because when I look at the sheet, I see past administration had five people, five staff members, and now you have seven. Right. There are two more bodies. Okay. But one of them is being funded out of the Comcast cable account, 80 percent. I okay. thought it was 100% originally, but it's 80%. Okay. So that money is, is essentially not in this. Um, and where I got that model, Counselor, because um, you're, you're absolutely right, I went back and looked at several previous administrations and tried, because every mayor changes it a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's never exactly the same from administration to administration. Uh, so I tried to go back and review the last three administrations uh, and... and uh, this particular model that is the closest to mine uh, is what Mayor Units was using and he also used the same technique of funding one position out of the Comcast money. Okay. Um, how much I think the person I put in that job really justifies that position because you know that person has worked for years at BCA and really gives us an opportunity to develop I think a lot more that we can do to benefit the community with BCA. Okay, and, and how much money is in that account that, that we're able to use, you know, money from it to pay for I payroll? I don't know. I think it's about 400000 Let me check. Oh, really? How much is it? should spend more. It says about a million. million. Okay. And that money is, and that money... Uh, but it has very specific strings on it I'm, attached I'm, to I'm it. Sure it pro I'm sure it probably... It can't just be spent. I've... I've I sure did probably does. It, we, we, might, we might not want to talk it too loud because when people pay their cable bill, like myself, I mean, it's it's nothing uh, yeah. nothing to sneeze at. To be truthful with you, I, um, I spend a lot of money too. I, I mean, so how long uh, has this money been building up, Jay? I guess I'd have to refer yeah, that. To I, can I let Jay answer? Yeah, that? I'll definitely, Mayor. He would know the history much because than because I. I'd like to know the history of it. Uh, yeah, to be and I will also. You. But if I can make one comment before we let Jay answer. I will tell you that we, ha we have already met with Mr. Lindy a couple times and you know he has some pro proposals he wants us to consider. I have some ideas around a, perhaps a community radio station, be part of BCA, a non-commercial community radio station. Okay. So I think we do have some ideas to be able to use some of that money for the purpose it was intended, which is to benefit the ratepayers, as, okay. as you pointed out, who put the money in there 
as a piece of their cable bill each month. But right. let me turn I it over to Mr. That. Condon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If we could, uh, because I think it's a little bit of news to right. to us. I don't well, think it's something we discussed. Actually, discuss every, every, every year, year there's a revolving fund that's authorized by the City Council, and the report that comes to the City Council indicates the balance that's in the fund. Okay. The revolving fund uh, began uh, during the Harrington administration when there was a new renewal for Comcast, and the license fees were increased, and those license fees go to this dedicated fund. The first $550,000 of it is restricted to the appropriation to support the uh, community access uh, group. <coughs> After that, dollars, and that's appropriated through the mayor's budget, after that, the amount that builds up is just basically restricted to cable-related activities. Okay. And I think there's a limitation on it of $250,000 per year. But if it isn't spent, and for many, many years that full amount hasn't been spent, it just rolls over into the next year. It, so it just stays in there, yeah. but it can be utilized. I mean, the, as the mayor said, this yeah, is specific Yeah, for only stuff. restricted purposes. It has to be cable-related activities, which is why uh, the individual that's in that slot, his, his responsibilities are, are cable liaison, and, and the use of the revolving fund has to support his work, which is in direct cable-related activities. If he does work for something else, it has to be paid out of the general fund. And, and what are some of the other things that it can be used well, for? Can be used to, for, for example, if you wanted to upgrade this facility so, here, it okay. could be used for that. If you wanted to put some capacity for cable broadcasting out of the high school or Massasoit Community College, it could be used for that. Out of the mayor's office itself, it could be used for that. Equipment upgrades, I think uh, <laughs> Newbies are already looking at making some purchases for, uh, for additional equipment. So it, it basically is not just for programs, but it can also be used for equipment, but it has to be restricted to the use for cable activities. Okay. And, and paying personnel or payroll, it's, it's, it's one of those? It, it is permitted, and okay. the uh, requirement is if you're going to pay uh, a salary out of that fund, you have to pay the benefits out of the fund as well. Oh, the benefits so, come out of it as well? Yes, okay. Right. All right. Uh, while, you're there, while you're there, Jay, just a, a, another question, because I, I think when we were talking about the other matter that was before us in regards to the solicitor's office, I think I had asked at that point in time in regards to the, um, the line item of personnel department and, uh, coming out of the benefits unemployment insurance, and, and I thought we had talked then that you you'd mentioned, you know, roughly there's like $64,000, whatever, in that right. account. There'd be like something like 30000 left, and now I... As I'm going through here and I look, I guess I didn't look hard enough in my glasses. It must have been steamy. But in any case, now I see we just blew through that whole line item by, by using the other money right here, personal benefits, unemployment insurance here for transfer as well. Am I correct? Yes. There was a, the, the so the account's gone? No, 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 it's not gone. What, what I said was that when we looked at this in January, based on the level of usage of that fund, there was at least $65,000 that was available. A lot depends. Uh, I know there's an issue in front of the council, which is what are going to happen on the other uh, holdover uh, department heads. If they don't get reappointed, they'll be entitled to unemployment compensation. So will there be a demand on that fund that they get reappointed? I don't know what's going to happen there yet. I mean, the mayor hasn't made his decision. So it could be that there will be more monies available out of that uh, line item, but it depends on what happens. But at this particular time, when I look at it, it's like there's there nothing was, left yes, in the, the line the, item. The director of personnel made 65000 available, and I guess about 55 or 58 of it's been used in these two line items. Okay. Well. All right. Well, in this case, the balance of it is coming out of my office where there's a vacancy. Uh, I, I don't care how we look at it. It's almost like what I said just a few weeks ago, and, and I don't care how anybody takes it, but every time you increase cost, it still increases tax dollar money. I don't care. You know, it's, it's just, and that's just what we're doing. We're, we're continuing to do that, and, and I don't know. It's, it's going to be tough to digest. It really is, and the taxpayers, I don't want to listen to them this year. Seriously, I mean, we, you know, seriously, because when I do, I'm going to refer him right back to everybody here at City Hall. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council. Council DiNapoli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, part of my question was answered. I mean, you shocked me. We have a million dollars in the cable, and we're looking at cameras that are outdated. Okay. Is this, con is this controlled by the mayor's office, the yes. spending for that? Yes. The revolving so, fund is controlled by the mayor's office. So, okay. So, how do we... So that means that Mayor Carpenter can uh, appropriate money to upgrade some of the system? Yeah. And the revolving fund has a restriction that you can't appropriate more than 250000 every year, uh, but that's in the mayor's control. That's what the revolving fund okay. that the council approved says. To the extent that you don't spend what's in the revolving fund and you reauthorize it for a subsequent year, whatever the balance is gets rolled over, and that's how it's built up. Jay, how much goes in the account every year from Conc uh, for Infinity, whatever? 
they keep changing their name. Comcast, yeah. How, how much goes into the account? How much do we get from the cable company every well, year? <laughs> 700,000 roughly, I think. I mean, Franchise I, fees, 700,000 a year? I think it's about 700, 550 or so gets appropriated every year to support uh, Mark Lindy's organization. And what's on top of that comes into this revolving fund, and if it doesn't get spent, spent. in many years it hasn't been, it rolls over. It rolls over. So now there's about a million bucks in it. At this point, yeah. yeah. And it's accruing interest, I would hope. It's in an account, yeah, but at this, at this time, you don't accrue much interest. No, in I, listen, 1% of a million dollars, it's yep. more than I make, Jay. Yeah, uh, well, I'm not right? going to comment on your salary, Counselor. That's no, <laughs> what, your salary here, 1%, <laughs> is, is exactly what the figure is. So, okay, all right, so, so the mayor is allowed to use part of the funds to pay, to yeah. pay, uh, Pay one of the uh, to the extent that the individual works on cable-related activities, he can pay that salary out of that account. Yes. Okay. Very good. Well, we learned a lot tonight. That's for sure. We have money. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> thank you very much, Council. Council Cruz. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, actually, most of what I had, but it, it keeps going back to that. So, Mr. Rateau, we're going to pay 80% of his salary out of the cable fund. I believe that's and, the plan, yeah. And he's going to spend 80% of his time on cable issues. That's cable-related issues. Uh, okay. And you're saying that his benefits also have to be paid out of the? The state law, which governs revolving funds, say that if you're going to pay a salary out of a revolving fund, you have to pay the benefits as well. Okay. And at this point, and that's a little bit off, off the topic of what we're here, but so at this point, we would need, we need to change that cap on the revolving fund anyways. We're putting in... We couldn't possibly ever spend the amount of money that's in the revolving fund, if I'm understanding you right. If we can only spend up to $250,000, we could never spend that's what's right. there. That's right. That's what the authorization has been every year. But you could change the authorization amount and, and tap into the I mean, we certainly do need some upgrades of, yes. of, right. but some, yes. of quite a bit of the, uh, the, the items that are used by BCA in here. I mean, no question, anybody that watches this on home, right. I'm not handsome, but I'm not as bad as I look on that, <laughs> these cameras. Um, don't it's, flatter uh, yourself. <laughs> you know, for quite a while, it was, they couldn't even s turn the TV on in the hallway for any overflow crowd because right. there was no <laughs> receiver out there. And, and, uh, and theoretically, we could never spend the amount of money going in. No, you can always change your authorization. Well, the that, authorization. Well, that's yeah. what I'm saying. We would have to change your authorization. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Council Dubois. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Condon, when did the revolving com fund come into play? Uh, began during the Harrington administration. So it didn't exist before. Correct. Who managed the money before? There wasn't a revolving fund. But who managed the money that came to the didn't cable company? Didn't come into company? the city. The money still came to the city. When, I, I'm not sure exactly how it worked. That's a long time ago, Councilor. But it Harrington didn't come wasn't that long ago. You've been here for how long? I mean, he's only been out of office eight I mean, what is it? Yeah, all I'm saying is I don't remember years. the specific accounting for yeah. it before, but it did not come in the way it's coming in now. I believe what happened before, it was managed by the cable company to facilitate community access to the community, community cable programming. Well, yeah, but it, well, it wasn't and coming it was, in through the city, so I wasn't looking at it, so yeah, I'm not sure how it happened. but you were involved in the creation of the revolving fund. No, no. I was not involved in the negotiation of that license uh, contract. It was completed with the assistance of outside counsel to Mayor Harrington and it was concluded they asked for the creation of this revolving fund and so that with, came to city council. Within the revolving fund there's authority that was created within the revolving fund to allow to hire a staff member in the mayor's office? The revolving fund says it can be used for cable related activities and is under the control of the mayor's office. Thank you very much. Um, mayor Carpenter? So I've seen your... Well, can, I, can I just give you a, a follow up on your last question also? Sure. Okay. So, uh, and I think Councillor Cruz addressed this a little bit too. So just to make you aware, um, and I didn't realize how much money was in this account myself until I, I got here. Um, we've already had one meeting with Mr. Lindy. He's got a pretty extensive wish list of things he feels BCA needs. We're going to do some due diligence with him on identifying reasonable budgets for reasonable items. But I am committed to putting that money towards what it was intended for. <laughs> So we're talking about um, repairs that are needed at the building. We're talking about upgrades of equipment uh, that he says is necessary. And we are talking also about the possibility of community radio, which would expand services directly to the residents. So 
you know, we are looking at all of those things and have already begun the, that review. And, you know, I, that will take a little bit of time, but we are committed to seeing where it makes sense to, to reinvest for the benefit of the residents into BCA. So I've seen your director of communications and BCA liaison out and about. Mm -hmm. um, does this 41,000 re reference the full salary or is that 80% of the salary? No, that's his full salary of which 80% will be coming from that revolving account and that salary is exactly to the penny what the previous person who didn't do the exact same thing but the person who had the most similar who job that duties person? that would have been Lauren D. Filippo. Okay. Thank um, you. And that's the exact same salary gross that the previous person was making. Okay, so can you explain to me how your director of communications in your office as the mayor of the city is performing cable work for this money? Because I don't understand how a director of communications for a mayor's office right. can really be working for a cable company. Right, well, as, so as you're well aware... I don't that, know if I believe it. Okay, so... That person obviously is doing some communication stuff that doesn't have any connection to BCA, and that's why we did 80%. Um, but beyond that, uh, as you're well aware, this person has worked for years for BCA um, and is still, I'll give you an example, was up working with BCA on the production of the high school basketball game yesterday at, the, at Brockton High. Uh, he's been involved in training some new employees over there. Uh, we're looking at how BCA, we can get more BCA equipment and coverage for government functions. Um, another item that we're looking at is being able to also do live broadcasts from the little theater at the high school so that the school committee meetings can also be carried live, uh, similar to council. But if we did that, there would also be a benefit to the students and to the community because now some of the smaller productions and performances and things that are done in the little theater could also be televised live. So we're looking at a number of things and he's also going to be doing some more work specifically with the website and with video and those will be linked with BCA videos. So one of the things you'll see that he's spending a lot of time working on right now is tying video and BCA to a new City of Brockton website that we hope to be rolling out on or about March 1st and you'll see some video capabilities on there that we've never had. Um, much easier as an example to watch these um, city council meetings with a video box and just one click on the, on the front of the website. So there are actually a lot of activities he's involved in that have a BCA link. Doesn't say that he has to be an exclusive employee of BCA. He's a BCA liaison. He is coordinating community services between BCA and the mayor's office to benefit the <coughs> folks who pay the rates to Comcast. Yeah, I, I, I guess I just see it as a benefit to you, but that's fine. Um, and I appreciate um, you wanting to staff your office with good people. I guess w you'll find that unlike some people, my decisions in government are based on personalities and someone being a good person or not and if they deserve the job or not. Really it comes down to the spending of people's dollars. Mm -hmm. And I see what I'm seeing so far in the first couple months here is that the whole reality of Brockton's finances is somehow now changing and we have all this money to spend um, per our CFO and, and you. We no, have all I'm, this I'm now, not saying we have all have kinds of money to, to spend But we have all, money to counselor. spend that wasn't there before. It, it, that is just a fact. And I see that Mayor That's, that's your perception, Council. No, that's not any way anything that I've Mayor, said. Because that $36,000 that we're going to be spending on the part-time, uh, the full-time attorney for five months wasn't there last year. We raised taxes. We had no money. We were all, nothing could be certified because we, unless we agreed to raise taxes. We couldn't pay people back bills that we fraudulently charged them for water because we had no money. And now we have, we have a mayor's office that last year, the, with the last mayor, the budget was $407,000, and this year it's $504,000. If 41 is coming out of a revolving fund or not, 41,000, it doesn't matter. It comes down to what are we spending well, first of, of all, the people's so I, I, dollars. I need to, you're just a little off on a couple of things. Part of this money that's in here, and it's only a portion of it, but I believe it's 14,000 of this transfer that I'm requesting, is for separation costs for the former employees sure. from the prior 
administration. So it's a total of about 40. Who's, whose office put this together? I did, my office. Great. So when I look at page two, um, I see uh, the names, Balzotti, Mullen, no, Cappiello, that, that, Carvalho. Excuse me, Counselor, you showed me the page one and you asked me who performed that. I had nothing to do with it. I don't know about it, the page two. Okay, we'll just talk about page two for a second. Balzotti, Mullen, Cappiello, Carvalho, DiFilippo, D'Oliveria. Oliv so those names are from Balzotti's administration, and the salaries add up to $407,000 and some change. Cap under Carpenter's staff, two of your staff members are just left off on this page. So, I, I mean, I, I understand yeah, that I, Cappiello, I, I know you know didn't do it. At, right? I understand that Cappiello and Carvalho or holdovers that you decide to keep on because they're great people and good for you, but that doesn't mean they don't add to your bottom line. And when you add up the people, the salaries on this front page, it comes to $504,631. Right. That's before benefits. Excuse me, Counselor, if you're going to do a fair comparison, you have to subtract 80% of the salary of uh, that person who's coming out I'm of a not separate doing account. It. I'm not doing it. Well, that's, that's you can, the reality. You can say that, but I'm not doing it. But that's, then we're not asking that for that to can, be funded. You can do that, but I'm not going to. Um, then when you look at the, uh, the carpenter salary, that's $504,631, and you subtract $407,799, dollars from that, you get a difference of $96,832 more that your office is spending on staff members than the previous no. administration. We're so I would, I, let me just please, about I think I'm still So Mayor, if you could let the council please speak. Sure. Thank you, sir. So the difference there, I understand what you're saying, that 80% of $40,000 or what is that, roughly $30,000 $30, is coming out of a different fund that's in your realm of control. But you, in your office, is still expending $504,000 for your staff in your office, where the previous administration, who has been labeled as a spend freak, I, I know, um, was actually spending $407,000. So your office is actually spending Ninety-six thousand more dollars than the previous administration, and when you add on the eighty thousand plus benefits that we're now going to be spending on a new city solicitor to this ninety-six thousand dollars, that's two eight sixty and a hundred and seventy thousand dollars more. And then we look at the hundred and forty thousand we're going to be spending on a new commissioner, and the seventy thousand dollars that we're giving to the captain Gomes to to nullify his chief contract, we're looking at a lot more spending. So some of these things, I'm just going to more or less, if this is what you want to do, you can go right ahead and do it. But I'm just letting you know, because you were not here, that the world seems to have flipped on the head, its head since you have become the mayor. I don't understand why. I'm not saying it's your fault, that's for sure. But just a few months ago, the sky was falling, and no one had any money, and we had to raise taxes, and nobody could afford city services, or the world was going to fall apart. And now all of a sudden, we have you know, over $300,000 that we can just spend on new staff members because we have so much money. So I just hope that you're not in for a rude awakening come budget time, because I'm just sick of raising taxes based on people's coming before us and saying we can afford it and then at budget time saying nobody can afford it and we have to raise taxes and don't worry because it's only going to mean ten dollars to the average homeowner those ten dollars first off that isn't true I'm almost never told really what it's going to cost the average homeowner on their bill so I'm just sick of the of the twisted tales that I'm being told. And I'm sorry that you are getting the brunt of it, but when I look at these numbers, they just don't make any sense to me. Can I respond now? Okay. Sure. Okay. So, um, Council, I, do, I don't agree with your portrayal of the figures. What we have in front of the Council right now is a net increase of about $50,000 a year um, that we're asked to be funded. I told all the councils back in December I was looking for funding for one additional position. 
I think that these are uh, critical services to be delivered. I think that there was a clear consensus from the past three administrations that the mayor's office was badly understaffed. I think the efforts of some of these people are going to help us generate additional revenue. Um, it's, it's, we're, we're adding funding for one additional person in an office that the last three administrations agree was understaffed. And the city solicitor's office is understaffed, and the DPW is understaffed, and the fire department is understaffed, and the police department is understaffed, and all these departments are understaffed, but the city, up until you becoming mayor, couldn't afford to hire anybody. And I'm just, I just want you to know, person to person, that the whole world has seemed to change since you've become mayor. And we found all this money. And I'm not saying, again, that it's your fault, but we are now appropriating more money in the last month since you've been a city, since, since you've been so, the mayor. So far, we've appropriated $35,000. No, not the, not the way I'm saying another, it. This will be another not, not over a 12-month cost. When you look at what we're spending over the next five months, when you extrapolate that out over a 12-month cycle or a two-year cycle, or a four-year cycle, depending on how long everything goes the way it is, these costs are much more than just the five months that you're presenting to us. So just because, there's, because we've seen it perfectly, $35,000 for a city solicitor for five months, first off, that doesn't count benefit costs. And then that extrapolates out to a full year that's $80,000. So these costs that are added to your budget Good or bad, I'm not, I'm not making an opinion on if these are the right things to do. But when you look at the money, when you look at the numbers and the amount of money, when you know about the side agreement and you know about the new police chief and the police commissioner, and you know that the, in the side agreement that you made with the police union, you're giving them a 1% salary raise. And in the side agreement, you mentioned a deputy police chief. All these added expenses. Yeah, yeah. All these added expenses, what, what is going to happen at budget time? It makes me very nervous. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Council Thank you. Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Council. Mr. President, can I, can I respond to the Councillor? Uh, you may. Okay. So um, I understand your concerns, Councillor, uh, but I think that um, you're throwing around a lot of numbers that just aren't the numbers that add up. I think that as any of those items, uh, as we work together going forward on the police department, I will address all of those issues and figures. Captain Gomes did not receive any additional compensation whatsoever. His settlement was for exactly what he was due under his contract, no more, no less. Um, so we'll, we'll approach those things when we get there. I think that historically, mayors have been, new mayors coming in have been given some leeway in terms of how they set up and structure their office. And you're right, the city council gives the, the mayor a bucket of money to try to do the best they can with the mayor's office, um, but I, I think I'm fully aware of what the budget challenges are. Uh, I think I'm committed to not raising taxes, and I think that's going to involve a lot of tough decisions, absolutely, and I'm going to work with you on that. Mr. Mr. Chair, I understand what you're saying, Mayor Carpenter. I do. So you, you, it isn't like I don't understand exactly 100% what you're saying, but these numbers are on paper. And the $70,000 that Mr. Gomes is getting through the multiple different side agreements in the side agreement letter, yes, that is what he would have made it through 2015. And he's making that on the front end, and then he's going to be able to make a uh, captain salary, which he can get overtime on. I'm not saying that you are not in your right to propose these things. I'm not saying that in the end it might not help the city. What I'm saying is if you're just looking at the numbers, and you can deny it as much as you want, but if you're looking at the numbers, the numbers have been going up in the last two months of expenditures that we are projecting that I can project because I can look at pieces of paper and subtract one number from another. So they are going up. So you can say that they're not, but at some point, it, the numbers are going to tell the tale. And if people can't see it, well, I, can't, I can only help them so much with basic math. Well, and my, my final comments, I know you want to move on, is yeah, just that the items that are in front of the council tonight are for transfer of funds to cover a period of time in the next five months. 
as you talk about what these positions will cost going forward into next year, obviously they will be all part of the budget that I bring forward to the council that's subject to full review of the council that the council has the ability to make cuts from and we'll work together on that budget in the, in the 1st of June. Uh, Councilor Sullivan, and let's, uh, I know the chair has given a lot of leeway, but let's try to stick to the, uh, the uh, issue before us. Councilor Sullivan. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I just had a couple questions. First of all, I'm a little dismayed because I was going to question you as my colleague from Ward 6 did. When a document is submitted to a committee, I would expect and hope that it's accurate. And this isn't an accurate document. Which one? The, the, the dollar amount of 392 is not accurate on, on the ledger on the right side because of the fact that you did not factor in Capio and Carvalho. Yeah. So I'm a little disappointed on that. Well, again, Council, just for the record, no, I... Can you I, stop interrupting? You've I been doing it all night. Okay, I didn't Thank submit you. that. Thank you. That's erroneous, so that needs to be corrected in the future. Mr. Conner, I have a question to you, sir. I, I want to know how these positions could be created and how the mayor can have these people working already if the appropriation hasn't been ratified by the council under Chapter 44, Section 33A? Well, he has an appropriation, and if there isn't sufficient funding in it, he'll have to do uh, steps to reduce the uh, salaries that are paid to his employees through the end of the year. So is it the position from the mayor's office that there was no need to come prior to tonight for these positions? I, I think his ability under the law, Councillor, is to set the salaries in his office subject to an, an amount appropriated by the City Council. There is an appropriation for the Mayor's budget. If this additional money isn't allowed, then the Mayor will either have to reduce the salaries paid to the staff he's got from what's on that budget, or he'll have to lay somebody off. But he doesn't, uh, he has it within his discretion to allocate the monies that he's got in the, in the manner he chooses. Have the separation costs already been spent and paid out? For the ones who were laid off? Yes. 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 They have been paid already? Yes. So this order here has language in there that's not correct? I'm sorry? The order in here has language that's already, it's, it's a moot point, right? Separation costs have already been paid, right? Yeah, so because this, they were this too. dollar amount of separation in here, it's explaining uh, staff of two mayors, separation costs, for okay, administrative staff, that's already been paid. Well, that's just an exhibit. The one you're looking for wasn't prepared by the mayor's office. It came out of the personnel office, and the intent of giving it to you tonight was to allow you to be able to see on a side-by-side -side basis the salaries that no, were no, in... No, no, I'm talking about the actual order that's yeah. here that, that stipulates separation costs. And my question is, has that already been paid? And I believe paid. it has. Yes. So again, this is erroneous as well. So that's two strikes tonight. I'm, I don't understand this. The third strike, in my humble opinion, is that my colleague, Mr. Rodriguez, who admirably served... Uh, and I know this because I was the president and I met with Harrington on a regular basis. He served in a position that was about three of these jobs here. So I have a lot of questions and concerns as a councillor at large, not as a chair and president, that excessive spending is happening. And I'm only one of 11, but I hope my colleagues wake up to the fact. I know Councillor Dubois is. But listen, strong council, weak mayor, we speak to the voters. You can't spend without raising taxes. It's simple math. You don't have to be an economist to understand that. So. Thank you very much. No further questions. Councilor Stewart. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. So I actually think in the, in the last Finance Committee meeting, you, know, you may love or hate me for this, but I'm the one who actually uh, uh, requested that uh, we get better numbers from you on what this looks like. And that my concern was I'm seeing a, a additional expenditures and I'm not seeing, sa uh, seeing any savings in you. Right no, in, in, and in retrospect, I will say to the council that um, that was my first finance committee meeting coming up, and I wasn't able to be here because I was out of state. And if I had to do over again, I should have held it for this meeting and had this filed in advance. And that's why, in response to the your and other councilors' concerns at that last meeting, we had this prepared and ready for you. So um, my um, concern at the last finance meeting was really simply that, that I just didn't have a complete picture of what you were proposing. However, um, I do believe that you were elected, um, that I believe in elections, uh, and I think that it's uh, our duty as much as possible to make certain you have the latitude you need to put in place your team. Um, and I've always been baffled by the fact that mayors would run for office bashing the previous administration's performance and then come in office and keep the same team. Never made sense to me. So the fact that you're moving in a direction where you're trying to build a different team at different layers of your 
administration makes sense to me. Um, and I think sometimes, this may not be the best analogy, but it takes, sometimes you have to spend money to make money. So what I'm hoping, what I'm hearing from you is that you're making investments up front so that you have better talent, which makes better decisions, and we get better outcomes, and that we'll start to see better management, which then obviously is where we go in terms of reducing the tax burden, all that sort of stuff. But I mean, that, that storyline isn't clear to me yet in terms of how you're getting from these early expenditures to the savings in year two or whatever your projections are. I'm assuming as you're stating, you're going to sort of start to lay that out for us in the, in the budget season. So I do have concerns about the additional spending. Uh, I think, and plus, I've always been the one who has indicated that I believe the mayor's staff has always been under-resourced. Um, and even in the last budget cycle, when my colleagues <laughs> voted to cut the mayor's budget, I voted against that because I felt that office was already stretched. And I know all offices are stretched, but if the mayor's office is stretched, and that's the leadership office in the city, um, I just think that places us all in a, uh, a less than advantageous position. So I'm... Uh, in support of what you're proposing here. Um, I think people put you in office and so we should give you the, the chance to deliver on your commitments in a way that you think you can. Um, and we'll see, I think we'll see what the budget looks like coming in this next fiscal um, season and we can have an opportunity to have a more vigorous yeah. debate at that and point. And if I could respond to that something that I didn't say earlier, the, um, the business and government liaison person uh, a large part of his time is going to be spent implementing a um, data collection and management tool used by municipalities now known as CityStat, but now in Massachusetts the name's been changed to StatNet. Yeah, um, this is going to be a huge step towards all of us being able to do a better job, allow the mayor to do a better job in making management decisions based upon the actual data from city government, and it's also going to allow the mayor and the council to make better budget decisions by having real data on what the money is actually being spent on and what's being able to identify exactly what services are being delivered to the residents, how much is it costing us to do it, getting away from this old type, it's going to be a performance-based budget. And Somerville is, has instituted Somerville, that very well. Somerville, is, that's exactly what it is. Um, it's city stats started in Baltimore, mm -hmm. but the best local example is Somerville, where it's been implemented for a number of years. They are providing far superior customer service to the residents while holding the line on the budget and getting a lot more bang for the buck. And the state believes so much in this that they are funding through the Collins Center at UMass Boston some funding to help municipalities get into what's now referred to as StatNet and uh, we're on the list and we'll either get on sometime between February and July. They're right now working with about 40 cities and towns already in Massachusetts that are implementing this data-based uh, information technology that will provide real data that we can then have to make decisions on managing city government and funding city government. This is being adopted across the country. It's the way to do it now but it is a big job to implement it into city government and we need a person who's going to be the point person on adopting StatNet, CityStat into Brockton and one of the reasons I selected this person is because he's just come out of <coughs> the master's program at the Collins Center and has familiarity with StatNet and has relationships with the people at the Collins Center that are going to help us implement it. So and I so I think this is a small investment for something that has the potential to save us a lot of money. So I think what I'm hearing from my, my colleagues is that they're, I mean, I certainly am, and perhaps they are, and, and just haven't articulated as such, is I think folks are looking for this sort of, um, how we get from where we are now to where you envision we're going in terms of investments that <coughs> leading to better return on investments and all that sort of stuff, and that, but that's your call to make and how you articulate that. Um, I, have, I have just pretty basic questions at this point considering the evening. So what's the distinction between a director, a manager, and a liaison in terms of how those folks operate in your office and what those titles mean? I don't see a, I mean there's not a distinction in pay necessarily. I think it's it's more in the, in, in the job duties and the types of things that they do. Liaison would indicate 
working with other entities and organizations. Director would indicate overseeing directly services being provided by the office. Okay. All right. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I will say that I will support what you presented today. Um, and uh, in the spirit of making certain that you have what you need to deliver on your commitments. And I think we should allow you the opportunity to exercise uh, what your, your vision is, what your judgment is. And we all know that these elections are every two years. And I feel as if we give you uh, what uh, you need as long as it's not you know, irresponsible and uh, threatening that um, we should give you that, afford you that opportunity and respect the folks who put you in office to give you the resources you need to um, put a vision in place that people voted for. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you. Thank Mr. you, Council Store. Council Rodriguez. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, again. Um, I believe I, I owe the, uh, the public that's watching us um, and the folks in here uh, possibly a quick explanation because I was actually the guy that negotiated along with the, uh, the outside attorney the, the cable contract that we have in place. And, and, and also at the same time, uh, I, I do appreciate the fact that you try to expand your office a little bit because I remember when I was in the uh, Harrington administration, there was five of us, including the mayor, in the office. And uh, as it's been mentioned here, uh, I think I did three of the jobs that you have listed mm -hmm. within the, sure with the different bodies in here. So I do appreciate the fact that you tried because it was, it was overwhelming at the time. But you know what? It was done no matter how you look at it. it you know, it's, if you can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen and go do something else. But um, as far as the uh, clarification for that, um, for the cable contract, there was an MOU that was actually um, put into place long after the contract between the city and the BCA, the uh, cable organization, because we worked hard to uh, negotiate a contract that was um, equitable for the city of Brockton, I believe. It took a long time to get it done because we felt that Comcast was kind of uh, shortchanging the city. Um, it's, they're in the business of making money, and, but we're also in the business of negotiating the best deals that we can possibly negotiate with, uh, with the businesses that do business in the city. So that being said, we were able to negotiate a contract of which 75% of the total fund that was coming into the city was supposed to go directly to BCA. The reason why the revolving account was created is for the other 25%. The other 25% was intended for uh, equipment and cable-related costs. Equipment to the high school, to BCA, and to Massasoit. The reason why that amount has actually grown into, and I'm actually going to explain if you, uh, Mr. Chair, if you allow me to, the $550,000 that's uh, itemized in the budget for BCA the reason it was done is because it was basically uh, we were trying to hatch the egg that came out of the cable contract. We weren't exactly sure how much money was going to be generated from the contract because it's based on percentage. So we basically put in a safe amount into the mayor's budget to fund BCA at $550,000. Now that wasn't supposed to be a $550,000 forever. Uh, uh, amount. That was the initial amount and then the MOU came into, uh, into play that those funds were supposed to increase as we go along up to 75 percent of the total uh, amount. And that money for some odd reason somehow it stayed at $550,000 now for the, huh. for the eight years or so that it has been in place. And BCA hasn't gotten a dime. I think the last time the BCA got any, any monies from the city for equipment upgrade. It was when I still was still in the Harrington administration and basically provided the funding to BCA to do the improvements that they did. But since that time, uh, during the, the Belzardi administration, they got absolutely no money for it. So that's why that money has actually grown into a million dollars. You know, and I, I want to make sure that the citizens of the city that just don't think that the city has five, you know, a million dollars stashed away that you know, it could have gone to the, to the rate payers because right. that was a negotiated contract. Now, where the city is not uh, fulfilling its, its part of the contract is the fact that no funding has either increased for operating costs for BCA or for equipment that the city is basically sitting on and not giving it to both the high school, Massasoit, or BCA. Yes, that sir. needs to be 
that right. just needs to be clarified because, and as Council Cruz was saying about these cameras, we actually did do the cameras over uh, when I was in the office, and these were the, later cam uh, the, the latest of the cameras that existed at the time. So that's why, I mean, I, they're a little old now, and it's not necessarily the camera that's making you look the way you do, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> But, but we, did, we did do what we had to at the time, you know, both in putting the, uh, the large screen TV that you, had up, that you see above the door. We did this, you know, once we negotiated the contract. But I just needed to, to clarify that so, because, it, I mean, I heard, you know, the Harrington right. administration going back and forth, back and forth, and I wanted just to clarify Thank you, that. Counselor. Counselor, if I could respond for a moment. Um, I understand a lot of what you're saying, and that's why I mentioned to one of the other counselors earlier I've been in office four weeks. We've already had the first meeting with Mr. Lindy and BCA. He's already brought forward a number of needs that he's looking for us to fill. School better equipment there, improvements in the building. <coughs> but we're going to look at all of those. We already have started to. But Mr. Mayor, what I wanted to bring forward is the fact that that money is not the city's money. That money that's sitting on that revolving account is not the city's money. It's monies that were intended for equipment and cable-related expenses. It's not a savings account right. that the city has. So sitting on that money or going back to BCA and telling BCA how to spend whatever they need, that money is, is for, for cable-related expenses that was never given to BCA, the high school, or Massasoit. Right. And so it needs to be, in reality, we are in violation of that MOU that was signed by my boss back in the days because the previous, the previous administration to yours never, never fulfilled the, the, the mandates of the MOU, and it should be. So the fact that the city is thinking that it has this little savings account set aside with a million dollars or so, it's not the city's to spend. No, and we're not, I can only speak for myself, but I'm not thinking that way at all, and the intention is to use it for uh, cable-related expenses that will benefit the residents of the city in terms of um, cable access <coughs> and uh, related expenses like the building, the equipment, improved equipment and services up at the high school that we talked about, community radio stations, which I'd like to inc include in there that will also bring benefits to the, to the rate payers. And I think the other phenomenon, Councillor, and I'm, you know more about it than I do, but I believe that that Comcast contribution each year has been declining. It's not as large as it used to be, as you know, many people in the city are using other options other than Comcast. Yeah, it has declined, but it hasn't declined as, uh, to the level of five hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. No, no, no. no year, I think it so. was seven hundred and something yes, thousand this year. Which is a lot more than. The, yeah. But another question, Mr. Chairman, if I could. Sure, um, Councilor. The um, the pro the proposed position that you actually have for the business and government liaison. That, in reality, is actually going to be doing a lot of what the 21st Century Corp actually does. Right. Um, uh, not exactly, but I, I think it's someone that would probably work closely with them. And, and I no, think no, but th the reason why I'm bringing this up is because I, I've lived in this city for quite some time. Uh, I know I, I speak with an accent, and um, you know, I speak a few different languages, so people think that I actually just got off the boat. But I... And I I, I graduated from Brockton High School, if you can believe that. I know, I know it was done some years ago before the high school. No, it was still the old high school. I mean, the, the high school that we currently have. So I've been around for a while. But the 21st Century Corp <laughs> was created at, at a time that the planning office wasn't functioning properly. So instead of fixing the planning office, we go out and create the 21st Century Corp to basically do what the planning office is supposed to do. Now, at the same time, when you travel throughout this, throughout this commonwealth and you see the BRAs at various different locations conducting business that actually is what the 21st Century Corp supposed to be doing, is supposed to be doing. So we, 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 we instead of dealing with the businesses, that, uh, dealing with the issues that aren't really functioning, what we tend to do is create remedies to resolve those issues. So the reason why I'm saying that is because I see the creation of this position, and I agree with you in the creation of the position, but if the 21st Century Corp isn't doing what it should be doing, we're talking about creating a planning office, we're talking about um, an existing BRA that we have in place, uh, why should we 
continue to fund, for instance, the 21st Century Corp, knowing that, one, it's not functioning the way it should be. I mean, they, they basically, at least from what I've seen, they have been nothing but the landlords of the stadium and the, and the conference center. Uh, not really doing much in terms of bringing businesses into this community. I think businesses are falling, you know, falling on the laps of our city. Uh, we don't have a great deal of individuals going out looking for businesses to come into the city. So instead of dealing with the issues that we have, here we go creating another, another position to resolve an, a, a, a situation that's not functioning properly. Uh, my question is to uh, to you and to my fellow uh, uh, councilmen, in a sense, is when are we going to start looking at uh, positions, departments that aren't functioning properly and dealing with those forthwith so that we don't somehow continue to create positions in, in, in departments and organizations to, to remedy situations that we are either afraid of dealing with or basically take on and solve for the citizens of this commonwealth. Yep. So I, I mean, for, the, for the city. Uh, th and thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Councilor. So I, I share a lot of your concerns around both planning and economic development. Uh, I share your opinion of the current status of B21. Uh, we are already doing a ton of work in these areas, and I will be bringing things to the council before the next budget. Um, I uh, look. I'm looking to do a complete revamp of what B21 is and does. I think we need to look at places like Lowell and Worcester and see where it's been done effectively and how that should be adopted here. Um, I've got a couple members from uh, the city of Lowell coming to visit me in Brockton next week, including the head of their community development corp. Subsequent to that, a week or two later, I'll be going up to spend a day up in Lowell, really taking a hard look at the Lowell plan and how it's been implemented there. And uh, I want to see how we can adopt a lot of the strategies that have been used in Lowell to bring to Brockton and where I think the place that may be most likely to do that is rather than having a Brockton plan, it would be a revamp of B21 in the model that's worked up in Lowell. I'm also very committed to the planning office as I said to the counselors uh, in our individual meetings. Uh, I would just like to come back in front of the council and I will be in the very near future to look at a p possible yeah. tweaks, just tweaks to the ordinance and the job description of the, of the city planner. Because I do think that where I look at where this has been successful, particularly in other Massachusetts cities, that planning and economic development are two separate functions. I want a great city planner working with us, and I also want a great economic <laughs> development person. I just don't think they're the same person. So, uh, and I've got that view from many other communities from both planners and economic development people. It's different skill sets. Um, but we are committed to getting that planning office launched ASAP after reviewing it with the council and coming to a consensus as to what the best model looks like. And you're right, that model ties into what are we doing with the planning office, what are we doing with BRA, what are we doing with B21, and I am working and planning to come back to the council and have all those conversations. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Bond, you had a follow-up? Uh, yes, uh, just one more thing. Getting back to the monies um, in the order, the that cable fund that's paying 80% of the Director of Communications and BCA liaison, in the MOU, uh, well, actually, back up, were you aware of the MOU that my brother mentioned with the that revolving fund? I have not seen the exact MOU, but I think I had a pretty clear understanding of how the money was accumulated and what it's intended for. Okay, so um, is there nothing in there that uh, requests or that demands, I guess, pre-approval or some kind of transfer um, request? Because every other money that's, uh, that no, I've seen so far, they've, they've been requests for transfer from this, that, or the other thing. So, I mean, is this just like something no, somebody can tap the, into and pull to somebody, something else without asking? The difference, Councilor, is this account is already in the mayor's office, in the mayor's budget. We're not going out into another budget. That money is already in the mayor's budget. Okay, but as I understand it, it's not the city's money to spend. It can so be spent on cable-related expenses. At your discretion? It's within the mayor's or budget. At the mayor's discretion. Okay. 
unlike the other transactions where there are different accounts that right. are outside and we're asking to transfer, that money is already in the mayor's office and so long as I stay within the guidelines of what's an appropriate use for it, that money is already in the mayor's budget. It's been in the mayor's budget every year. I agree with the councillor. I don't think it should have been accumulated the way it was and I think we do need to work on getting it expended for cable related items that are necessary and this is one piece of that big puzzle. Okay. Can that MOU be made available um, so that we can see sure, what... It's a public what document but I've never seen it. Right, but if you've never seen it and we've never seen it and you're spending it, I think we need to kind of well, be familiar I, with it. Well, I think I have a clear understanding of what the account is. Yeah. We, um, uh, you know, I had opinions from both the CFO and the solicitor in terms of what that account is and what's the purpose of it and I think we're well within the guidelines. And also how it's been accumulating over the years. I right. think Those that would probably be a good idea to see prior that. prior administrations that accumulated it, not me. Right, but it, it's like a like a bank account or, or like a um, a CD or something. When your grandmother buys you, you know, twenty five dollar thing when you're born, and then you you cash it in, it, there are records of the accumulation of and the interest and things. So I mean, and I don't does it acquire interest? I mean, I'm just I'm just curious about how that money is able to be um, just dispersed out, and if if it needs any kind of approval, and if not, why is there a two hundred fifty thousand dollar cap on it? If, if I remember correctly, I mean there's just so many things going on. I I guess I'm just really confused to that particular account and where it's going, and why it's going, and how it's getting split, and why is it eighty percent? And yeah, yeah, sure. Just just to, to and then to find out that there there were some parameters around the use of that money at one time that kind of, um, you know, well, first of burned all, with the mortgage. I don't think I've ever seen the MOU. I mean, that, that was negotiated under the Harrington administration. However... It's a problem because we're already spending it. But no, the revolving account that's been set up has always been constructed in accordance with what was the anticipated use of it. If we're generating something like $700,000 a year and if $550,000 is going to the, the cable group, then more than 75% of that 700000 is already being dedicated. Every year, the council approves the use of everything over that 550000 up to a limit of 250000 to be spent in that year for cable-related activities. The council authorizes that every year. When you make that authorization, a report is given to the council. It shows what the receipts were the year before, what the spending was the year before, and what the balance is it's carrying forward. When you authorize it for the next year, that balance that balance then becomes available for future fiscal years. The reason that it is accumulated to such an extent is that $250,000, in addition to what's supposed to go to the cable group, $250,000 isn't being spent every year. That's why it's been built up. No, I, I, okay, I understand that, but now that yields another question because either the counselors just kind of signed off on whatever monies or whatever figures were presented or, or because Councilor Cruz and I believe Councilor Dinapoli also, they were shocked that there's like a million dollars in there. Right. Or else it's not being reported appropriately. No, it's being reported, accurately. Councilor. It's being reported. Every year the, the order which has the revolving fund in it, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, it is being reported. Okay. The auditor's office prepares that report every year. The revolving fund letter asking for, there's a number of revolving accounts, asking for the authorization of those accounts indicates in an attachment what was spent in every one of those accounts, what was earned in every one of those accounts, and what the balance is that's being carried forward. Okay. I just don't want to fall into some further, you know, litigation because, like, we are on, on the cusp of well, approving a much, new yes, solicitor, I so I don't want to be involved in any litigation that we are in violation of this um, contract that uh, Councillor Rodriguez mentioned well, that we possibly could be in violation Barnes, of, but nobody knows because no, nobody's seen that. Mark Lindy memorandum. has been involved from the beginning, so I don't know if he's been making requests to the mayor to increase that $550,000 appropriation from year into year next. What's come through my office has been an appropriation every year for $550,000 out of the mayor's, mayor's office to support them. The addition and over that is the revolving account. Maybe we should find out, too, if he's been coming to ask for more money and what the response has been from whomever he was Council, asking. Council, why don't we file a resolve, have Mr. Lady, Mr. Khan, okay. and, and the mayor come before us. I think everybody here on the okay. same page will get thank the you. answers. We should all sponsor that. Do you have any more questions, Council? No, sir, thank you. Council Denapoli, do you have a follow-up? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I have two questions. First of all, uh, all right, well, since Jay's up there, we'll go with Jay first. Um, 
The separation cost for unemployment insurance, 24200 mm -hmm. Is that is that a true number, Jay, or is is that money already been paid? Has it, has that already been paid? Well, the separation costs are a part of the fifty-four thousand dollar appropriation, but the payment has already been made because those dollars were due the employees. Payment was already made. Yes. Where did it come from? It came from the existing appropriation, the mayor's appropriation. It came out of the existing appropriation. But it, we we have it in front of us. I'm sorry. We, don't we have it in front of us? No, you have a request for an addition to the appropriation that already exists in front of you. But out of the appropriation which existed, there was a balance in that appropriation. The monies, the monies were due to those individuals that had to be paid under the law within a certain period of time, yes. and it was paid. If you, I think I explained, if you don't approve this to the full extent or some lesser amount, the mayor's going to have some decisions to make. He'll make those before the end of the fiscal year. <coughs> He's not going to overspend his budget. Mm -hmm. But he will have a decision to make if he doesn't get all of this money because he now is not going to have the amount of money in his budget to pay the people he has on his staff for the balance of the year. He can fix that by reducing the amounts or by not paying everybody that's on the on the Correct. employment ro roster. Okay. No, that, that part I understand because, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're here to uh, make the city a, a better place. And everybody's telling me, give him a chance. Give him a chance. So... Bill, we're going to give you a chance. Uh, can I talk to the mayor for a minute? Because you said uh, you were, you hit my uh, my nerve when you said community radio. Sure. All right? There are two FM frequencies available for us as a municipality to apply for an FCC license for an FM. Right, and okay. that's the conversation we started to have, Council, and, and my vision, and still needs some work to be done on it, my vision would be to have two community radio stations, one English la language, one foreign language, and operate them much like DCA operates the TV under the same statutes where we are providing community services to the ratepayers, the members of the city. And uh, I think that, you know, instead of relying on the one commercial station in town that's been very shaky in its operations over the, Do we have the last few years, yeah, um, <laughs> that I think there could be a lot of really good public service provided um, you know, both with an English language station that broadcasts these meetings and other board meetings live and high school sporting events and news in the morning and at the same token have a foreign language uh, community radio station so that the various communities within the city could have um, uh, programming for their specific communities and bring the same type of information and services. And I think the funding is possible under everything that Councillor Rodriguez described. And, well, and we've already begun those conversations. So do we have it all figured out? No, I've been mayor for four weeks, but I can tell you we've already begun the work on it. All right. Well, I'd like to be involved in that. As for, as for the foreign language stations, Bill, we already have them on the air. Mm. So we don't need well, them, okay? Illegally. But but, but we, 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 we can set up uh, a real so let's station. Stay on point. Let's go. We, we are, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. That's it. Council Dubois, you had a follow-up? Yeah, I just have two. Um, uh, Mr. Condon, uh, thank you, Mayor. I would like a copy of the expenditures on the revolving count back to when it was created. So okay. it's some Please. detailed expenditures, and maybe you could send it to everybody so we can look at it. Yep. And yep. anything that goes in, anything that comes out, and where it goes? Um, Is that what it's going to say? Well, I'm not sure how far back uh, that It goes back would to go. Harrington, so... Well, I'm not sure how long ago I can get you the detail of every expenditure out of the account. What's created for the council every year is a summary of the expenditures. I would like the detail. Yes, I'm saying to the extent that it exists, I'll get it for you. But I'm right. not sure how far back those records go in terms of the actual detail of every dollar spent e okay, each year. Okay, so that would be, let me just think here. So uh, Balzotti was four years, and then Harrington was four years. That's eight years. Yep. And that's when it was created, or did units create it? No. no. It was created under the uh, Harrington administration. So I would think that, you know, if the regulators came in and said, I want the details for this account going back uh, eight uh, years, you could get I them. I understand, <laughs> Councillor. All I'm saying is I will get you the detail to the extent the records exist. I don't know the auditor's office. We have to tell me how much it goes back in terms of having retained the purchase orders for every one of us. That's what we're talking about. That would be great. I would okay. love that. Okay. And I'd also like... Um, a copy of the detail for the unemployment um, account that we are taking money out of. Yep. I'm just a, a little un, un, 
uncertain because I've heard $60,000, I heard maybe more later, we've got all this money coming out of it, I didn't even know the account existed. So I would love to have a detail of that too, going back, say like four years. Money going in, money coming out. So I can just get four it years, educated. Four, four years of history on unemployment expenses? Yes, please. Okay. And then, uh, thank you so much. And then Solicitor Nasrella, please. <laughs> I would like a copy of the MOU because it's exactly what Councillor Barnes is saying. If we have created a revolving fund account that goes against the MOU, we should adjust our revolving count. Someone made a mistake. We should fix it. Or maybe it's perfectly fine. But I think we all deserve to, at least now that it's been brought to light, be able to, you know, have a moral compass of our own to be able to read the document and make sure that the expenditures are being made in the proper way. Just because a previous administration made them wrong or right, we should be able to know and it should be something that any logical person could read and understand, wouldn't you say? I agree. Thank you. Would you be able to get us a copy of that? I have never seen it. I, not, I am not aware, I am unaware if it exists in the law department because it has always been a, uh, a product, a document contained in another office. What other office? Uh, usually the mayor's office in previous administrations has had it. I have never seen one. I okay. checked uh, while the conversation was going on earlier. I inquired of Ms. Florio, who has been there longer than all of us. And she has never seen the document. She looks better than us, though. Remember yes, that. Yes, she does. It's not hard to do. Mayor Carpenter. <laughs> I'm talking about you and I. Thank you. Yes. Mayor Carpenter, um, could you work with your city solicitor to get us a copy of that MOU if it's in your office and yeah. not in his office? I don't I know, know anything. I, I will certainly pledge my cooperation, Councillor. I have no idea. Perhaps. Yeah. Council Rodriguez can help us look uh, where it would be located. I would like but it to be an official, official document. Even if Councilor Rodriguez had it at his house, who knows what version that is. So I would hey, like it to hey, come hey, from hey, the hey. city. Well, there aren't... <laughs> I mean it in a respectful way. Council, I've got to tell you, there aren't a whole lot of records that were left behind in my office. There's been two changes of administration since that MOU would have been done. So I mean, to, to whatever extent you know we can help locate it, I'm certainly committed to trying to find it for I you. I appreciate it. I just have to say that since this has been brought to light to me that we don't have the MOU that supposedly was the basis for this revolving fund, I'm not going to be voting for another revolving fund for this money until we get that governing document on what it is based on. Because if you don't have the governing document, you just have this vague idea of what you think it might have said, I, that's just not acceptable for me. So I'm actually having a problem voting on that portion of this, of this, um, this order. So I don't, I, I, I don't know how this vote is going to go, but if these documents aren't presented to me by the time this goes to a final vote, I'm either going to, I'm going to move to carve that one employee salary out. So I'm hoping that we can either, I guess I'm going to move to postpone this to the next finance committee meeting, this Second. item. On the motion. Yeah, Councilors, we have a few follow-ups from your colleagues. I'm sorry. Councilor Staninsky. A question for Attorney Nazarella. Is it improper? Is there some reason why we can't ask Mark Lindy if he doesn't have a copy of that? Is it improper? An MOU would be ours. In his, right? It's not been, I can tell you it's not been in the custody of the law department. Right. So we would not have it. Uh, I can't speak for the prior administrations as to whether or not they existed there or so they've been destroyed. Know, is it improper, it is, illegal is it? to ask Mark Lindy if he has a copy? No. Okay. Thank you very much. Councilor Monaghan, you had a follow-up. I was just going to, uh, <coughs> speaking of Tom, what time is it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> past my bedtime. I know in the past that uh, Mark Lindy has asked for more money for the BCA. Uh, he's requested funds, and I don't think he's gotten them. So I, but I, he knows that MOU inside and out, as far as I can tell, from what he's told me numerous times. So he has, he has requested uh, more than the uh, 550, I think it is, that he, that he gets for different things. And I think they did give some money a few times for some improvements to the high school or what have you, but I don't think he's probably gotten his, everything that he's wanted for, so I'm not 100% sure on that. We're here by back in session, councillors. Mr. Chair, I would like to withdraw my motion to postpone. Councillor Dubois has uh, withdrawn her motion to postpone. Does anybody else uh, have any follow-up questions? Um, Mr. Chairman, I actually like the motion to have it postponed. 
I would like the motion to have it Council postponed. Council Stewart is now making a motion to postpone. Is there a second? Second. Council Stewart has made a motion. It's been properly seconded. Postpone to the next finance committee meeting. The next FinCo. Was it, who is it? Ianeri? Yes. Council Ianeri uh, seconded. All in favor of postponing until next FinCom, please raise your hand. Motion fails. Now, I, uh, Councilors, I'm going to entertain a motion. Motion to recommend favorably. Second. Motion has been made by Councilor Cruz, properly seconded by Councilor uh, DiNapoli, a favorable recommendation to full city council. Vote. I'm going to take a roll call vote on that, uh, Madam Clerk. You could read, please read the roll. Shirley Azak. No. Shana Barnes. No. Timothy Cruz. Yes. Dennis DiNapoli. Yes. Michelle Dubois. No. Dennis Ianeri. No. Tom Monahan. Yes. Moises Rodriguez. Yes. Jazz Stewart. Yes. Paul Studensky. No. Robert Sullivan. No. Motion is hereby uh, unfavorable. It's, it's unfavorable. Referred unfavorable. Six to five vote. Full city council. Uh, Councilor, uh, Councilor Azak's resolve is agenda item number 17. If you could please read it. Resolved that the Executive Director of the Board of Health be invited to appear before a committee of this Council to discuss possible regulations relative to frying oil management and disposal symptoms in restaurant operations management technology that would protect the public from a spill such as we recently discussed by the Council and that would increase employee safety. Invited Louis E. Tataglia, Jr., Executive Director of the um, Health Department. Move to continue. Second. Excuse me. Excuse me. Council Azak, it's your resolve. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to move this to the next finance meeting. Second. Second. Motion's been made to continue the next Fen comments were properly seconded. And again, we did get notice that uh, Mr. Tataglia was under the weather tonight. All in favor of, uh, of postponing until next Fen call, please raise your hand. All opposed, matters continue. Thank you, Shirley. We've done 18. Uh, Madam Clerk, 19, please. Resolved that Mayor Carpenter, Captain Gomes, a representative of the Police Supervisors Union, be invited to the next Finance Committee meeting on February 3, 2014, to discuss the plan for transition in the position and in the department. Further, please submit the letter of agreement that was brokered between the Mayor, Police Supervisors Union, and Mr. Gomes to the City Clerk's Office. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, Emmanuel G. Gomes, Police Captain, <coughs> Lieutenant Donna Mills, President of Police Supervisors Union. Where are we now? The Mayor and Lieutenant Mills are in attendance tonight. Lieutenant Mills, I want to thank you so much for coming here tonight and waiting all this time <laughs> to hear this resolve. I really appreciate you and your work as a, in the union, as well as your work protecting the city and your dangerous position as a police officer. So thank you so much. I really thank you. appreciate it. How long have you been a police officer? Uh, 20 years. 20 years, that's a long time, right? Yep. All right. So what do you think of this side agreement? What can you talk about on this side agreement? This side agreement gives um, the members of the Police Supervisors Union uh, a 1 percent pay raise related to gun, um, your, what is it called? It says, effective July 1, 2014, as an internal compar comparability adjustment annual compensation for firearms training under Article 19.5 shall be increased from 5% of the base pay to 6% of the base pay. Okay. Were, were you part of these negotiations around this, this number, number 10? Yes. Yes. And can, what can you talk about? How did this get into this agreement? How did, how did a pay raise for the union members, and I'm, I, I think you deserve a lot of money because you put your life on the line for everyone, but how did a pay raise for union members get into, you know, what otherwise might just be a separation agreement with, with, Captain, with Chief Gomes? Well, this is agreement between three parties, one of them being the Brockton Police Supervisors Union. Um, as you know, contracts are mutually beneficial to all parties involved. That's right. Um, Mr. Gomes is a former member of the Brockton Police Supervisors Union and upon his resignation as chief and returning to the rank of civil service permanent captain, he would be re-entering our, our, our ranks, our union membership. The city and Mr. Gomes wanted to enter an agreement to square away what he would be owed in his chief's contract that would carry him through March of 2015. In doing so, he would be coming to our union and receiving an additional stipend that no other member or no other captain 
would be getting. For me to sign such a document, I would obviously have to confer with the membership for ratification, um, and I was confident, confident that such ratification would fail uh, by the general membership if there wasn't some... Sure. You know, I apologize to say it, but for lack of a better term, if there wasn't something in it for the entire body. That's life. That's what a union is all about. Um, how many captains are there before, man, before Captain Gomes goes back to the, to the ranks? Uh, well, I think to properly answer the question is there's a total all the time of six captains in the police department. However, Captain Gomes is on a leave of absence, so there was five serving. Okay, so there were five serving captains, and Captain Gomes' salary was not budgeted, and this is just for, for this isn't a question, because I know it. Captain Gomes' sick salary wasn't budgeted in the police department to cover him because we had him as a police chief for that year. Correct. Therefore, he's going to now go back to the rank of captain and collect what he's due as a captain in the Brockton Police Dep Department. This has nothing to do with him personally. It just has to do with me making a verbal announcement that this is added, added costs because we, ha we can't just have him go back to the captain's position and then have nobody in the leadership of the police department because that would be highly unsafe. And we wouldn't want that. And that's why the judge denied, in my opinion, um, the supervisor's union's um, injunction the other day. It was just about safety. You can't be without a leader of a ship. Every ship needs a leader. Every, every department needs, needs a chief, right? Everybody needs a chief or a commissioner. So that is, that is why I had you come here, just to talk over to me, to let me know that you saw this as a union contract, correct? Uh, it is a union contract. Well, if I must go back to start your question, yes, you are correct. If you were to look at our previous budget, um, then Chief Gomes was at the top when it came to personnel. As Chief Gomes with his chief salary, the next block down would be captains. His name appeared again, but next to his name would be just one dollar. Yeah. So you are correct. When he comes back, that one dollar now gets filled out to his captains, plus the makeup that we just signed. Um, that is a memorandum of agreement that's a side letter to our last contract that expired on June 30th of, this, uh, of last year. 2013. I really appreciate it. I um, appreciate you being here and I appreciate that there are other issues that are going on with the transition in the department that um, I think that we're going to be talking about tomorrow night. If I'm not uncertain, will you be here tomorrow night? Yes, I was asked to attend. Okay, so tomorrow night the City Ordinance Committee is meeting at the City Council's Ordinance Committee meeting at 6 p.m. here at City Hall, and they're going to be discussing the ordinance pertaining to creating a commissioner's position with additional salary added to that. So that's kind of like a public announcement for everybody at home so they can be reminded that there's a meeting here tomorrow <coughs> night on Tuesday night. Um, so that, you know, I'm sorry to make you stay here as long as you have for just that question for me, but that is what I wanted to ask you. My fellow counselors may have other questions for you if you don't mind just sticking around a little bit longer. Councilor Bonds. Okay? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilor. I done? just have a question, one more question for the mayor. Okay. Yes, Councilor. Hi, Mayor, Mayor um, Carpenter. So I've discussed this with the City Council's attorney, um, Attorney Mark Gilday, and he's not here. Oh, he is here. Sure he is. He can speak for himself. Yeah. So first I'm going to ask my question. You should apologize to him, too. No. Why would I have to apologize to him? For keeping him so late. You apologize to the Lieutenant. It's his job. All right. He doesn't mind All right. here. Um, just like I won't apologize to you because you ran for the job. You want it. You want to be here. So this is a collective bargaining contract and agreement. And um, there is a law that says any, um, that you shall submit to the appropriate legis legislative body, and I'm quoting, I emailed you this law, mm -hmm. um, within 30 days after the date on which the agreement is executed by the parties, a request for an appropriation necessary to fund the cost items contained therein, provided that if the general court is not, oh, that's a different thing. So I think I know what you're going to say in that you negotiated a raise for this union body of 1% of all the um, supervisors in the union. I think what you're going to say is that you're not going to be putting this before um, the 
appropriate legislative body, which is us. But before I say that, because I didn't have a conversation with you, Yeah, we're going to be making a filing, as you mentioned, within 30 days. You will be. So I'll be making a filing with the council, asking the council co to concur with that uh, agreement. And what happens if we vote no? I'm just asking. Does anybody know? Yeah, other than making the union mad, I'm not sure. I think you've already done that. That's fine. Um, <laughs> I think... Um, We're going to have legislative counsel, please uh, <coughs> pipe in here. I would love it. Thank you. What the statute says is if the legislative body rejects the cost item, then the parties go back to the bargaining table. Okay. Thank you so much, Attorney Gilday. Thank you, Attorney. And um, those are my questions. Okay, so I, can I just complete my answer? Um, I, I think just for the purpose of clarification about the 1% on the firearm allowance, um, we did... Uh, because there was a question of, of Captain Gomes getting his chief salary for the upcoming year because it's owed and due to him under the contract, and we're obligated to fulfill uh, the financial terms of that contract, um, I think that the attorneys and the union worked out the best way to do that, and that required some cooperation with the union and making sure everyone was on the same page in doing that up front. In the course of those conversations, the supervisor's union brought to my attention what they felt had been a long-standing inequity and something that they've asked to be addressed, and that was that the supervisors, the ranking officers, were receiving 1% less than the patrolmen for their firearm allowance. So it was an equity issue between the supervisors and the patrolmen that had been standing that they asked for me to address. I looked at it. I thought it was a fair request. I felt like it was something that we would be doing in the upcoming bargaining anyhow, and that in the spirit of cooperation between all the parties and trying to improve morale and trying to get this department back on track going forward, yeah. that it made sense. Yeah. And it's a, you're right, there is an expenditure involved. It will cost us in next year's budget about $30,000 total for the year in the budget for that 1% adjustment on their firearm allowance. I didn't have a great explanation as to why they should get 1% less than the patrolman. Might um, someone have the exact number, Mr. Condon, or will you have that when you come before us for the, for, with this contract? <laughs> How much number um, 10, the increase um, on the, uh, the, the salary for the, for the union members? How much exactly is that going to cost? Just a little bit under thirty thousand dollars, but this fiscal year at zero. Will you give us that exact number when when you put present this before well, the council? I, I can give you what the exact number would be were it to occur this year. Uh, I, I would know. like the exact number on what it would be if it were to fiscal occur next year. Fiscal 2015. I'll look at that, but I don't know what the exact staffing in that uh, in that rank complement is going to be next year. It depends upon who's in there and what their steps are. Maybe you could do it based on um, the rank and staffing of the employees at the time you present this before the City Council. In that case, I'll get you that as it exists today. I would really appreciate that. And then um, my next question is, so there is going to be the daily rate for transitional consult consulting differential shall be as follows. FY14, $115 a day for a total of 150 days from February 1 to June 30th for a total payment of $17,314. And then in the following year, the pay is $127 for consulting fees for the outgoing chief. Um, and that totals $37,896. 30, oh, thirty-four thousand eight hundred ninety-six dollars. Thank you. And then there is another. There's another amount. Uh, there's going to be a lump sum paid for sick time, and that is around twenty thousand dollars. And then um, I think there's another. And then the use of the vehicle. These add up to around seventy thousand dollars in compensation to the outgoing chief. 
in two fiscal years between now and March 31st of next year. Correct. And $30,000 for the union members. Approximately 30, just Approximately, a little under 30. Approximately, yep. And then there's this other item. The city agrees to negotiate in good faith with the union regarding the creation of a new civil service position of deputy chief during the negotiations of a successor contract. Right. So how much do you think a deputy chief might make? And that's all new, all new expenses. How much do you think? Uh, well, we haven't even got to the table over yeah. that, so I don't know. I'm going to guess that... It's probably more than $100,000. Could be if a city agrees to it, but yeah. the city has no obligation to agree to it. Yeah, and so I, I have to say that that concerns me because that's another cost item that we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg on, so okay. to speak. And not to say that if we do go through with this ordinance and create the position of a commissioner, I find it almost um, irresponsible not to have a police officer who's a real sworn police officer and meets all the requirements of that in the number two position. That's how they do it in Boston. So there's a police commissioner in Boston, but there's also a number two that isn't even below him. It's kind of like right up there with him who's actually an in-service officer. Yeah. So this is another concern of mine. I appreciate you being here. I really appreciate Lieutenant Mills coming this evening and spending your time with us and, and the mayor, of course. As a point of information, in Boston, again, we're talking about Brockton. In Boston, the Commissioner Evans is not a civilian commissioner. He is a law enforcement Thank personnel. you for the correction. Thank you, Con And through you, Mr. Conn, and that 1%, that's not a one-time fee. That's going to be a reoccurring Ongoing. expense. It's in the that's contract that's baked yes, in. Yes, that's right. Thank you. <coughs> Council Bonds, I'm I sorry. Do. Thank you. Um, actually, the question or statement I have is for the mayor. Um, I didn't bring a copy of the side agreement letter, but I do have it on my mobile device. And I just wanted to kind of go back. Um, you said earlier, one of the, the other discussions where money uh, was, was, was being talked about, I think it was in number 12 for the, um, the solic assistant solicitor. It, it, I think Councilor Dubois brought up the fact that um, the, all the police stuff and asking for all the information that's in this side agreement. And if I remember correctly, I think you said that uh, Chief Gomes is not getting anything additional to what he would have already gotten in his capacity as captain when he took his demotion. No, as chief. In other words... No, I think you said captain. You said right. that what he captain, would be getting... Going to receive, no, but I, I know what I said. I said would he be receiving... In other words, he has a three-year contract with one year remaining. We had obligations that were due to him. The purpose of the agreement was to fulfill our obligations to him. Right. And what I said is what he's getting and the way it's structured is to make him whole for what he's doing in the contract. The difference between the captain's pay and the chief's pay and a big chunk of that money also is buying back sick days from him, which we would have been buying back one year from now. Right. He was entitled to sell those back to us. Right. So if we're ending that agreement now when he's going back to his captain status then we need to in essence settle up on what he's due on his chief's contract right so he goes back and picks up where he left off as captain so that a lot of that language around the stipend and this and that that was just a mechanism that was crafted to pay him the difference between captain and chief okay so now i have i think i have question 2a and 2b because if that's the case then the language in here Number four, in exchange for Gomes' um, consultative and advisory services, he will receive additional regular weekly compensation up to, and then it gives the times, um, to be called transitional consulting differential. So that sounds to me like additional to what he was go he's going to get. No, I'm just counsel, that additional and then there's something in there about the sick pay. So there are two different things in there, but if I understand you correctly, uh, right. Mr. Mayor, you, you said that this language was used to cover that sick pay that he would have already gotten. Am I wrong? Okay. And I'll get, I'm going to turn it back to Jay because obviously okay. the CFO and all the attorneys crafted the exact language. Right. What I'm telling you is that the first thing that you read off regarding that additional compensation, that represents the difference between his captain's pay and his chief's pay. And it just outlines some duties as to why it's being paid. But it's a fulfillment of the contract. The sick pay is a separate provision, which he was entitled to under his contract. He has the right 
to sell us back. It was only for his unused sick days under his chief's contract, not going back to his captain's time. So two separate issues, and I'm going to let Mr. Condon explain it in more detail. Two separate issues, one making him whole on his pay, one making him whole on his sick days. We paid him. We had an obligation to pay him what he, had, what he was due if he was exercising his right to go back to return to his slot as captain, which he was guaranteed the right to do. Uh -huh. right. So number four has nothing to do with number three that says, in addition to those responsibilities of him going back to captain, um, that Gomes agrees to consult and advise the incoming police chief and slash or commissioner of police as necessary until March 31st, 2015. That's why I asked that, because you said that he was getting nothing additional, because in three, it says what I just said, but then in four, it directly um, I'm let Mr. Condon uh, try, obviously refers I'm to what job. was in three as additional consulting, this, that, and the other. And then it goes on to what Councilor Dubois said about the $17 and the 34000 and this and that until March and the car and the, all that other stuff. So I, and, but then it goes on, too, to, to say something about the sick time. So I know they're two separate things, but again, am I wrong that it sounds like it's being presented as that's one big thing as a 2A and 2B, but it's all one section. Well, that part I don't understand your question, Council. I'm going to focus on the word additional. Okay. Okay. Please. What is meant by the word additional is that it is in a sum of money in addition to what he will earn as captain. It is not in right. addition to what he would have earned as chief. Right. And the calculation of it is what would he have earned as chief compared to what would he have earned as captain to make him whole for that is the additional compensation for what he will earn as captain. So that his compensation, exclusive of overtime and the other stuff, but his compensation will be captain's pay plus the stipend, the calculation of, it w of which was intended to get him fully paid for the salary he would have earned as chief through March 31st, 2015. That's what the stipend does. Okay. And then just with the, the contract negotiation, I'm, I'm not up on that. Um, so with with this document being used as a contract negotiation, we agreed to that earlier? Yes. Okay. So with the rest of the police department still kind of being in, you know, um, in negotiation or in flux or whatever for three and a half years as it was determined earlier, is this, um, is this appropriate or is this, I, 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 don't, I, I don't know really how that works, but it sounds like the chiefs and the supervisors they cut a side deal to get a little bit on a contract that's been in flux for three years and the other guys are kind of just hanging out in the breeze waiting for somebody to, to cut them a deal. The, first, let me just say it is the Patrolman's Union that has been without a contract for okay. three years and seven separate months. Unions oh, the separate? Uh, okay, I, I wasn't sure. That's why that, I wanted to make no, that's to fine. Clear. Um, okay. The Supervisors Union back in February brokered a deal with the last administration that caught us up from July 1, 2010 okay. through June 30th uh, of 2013. Okay. However, yes, you are correct, and we are outside of a up-to-date collective bargaining agreement or memorandum. Okay. However, I do not have a Juris Doctorate, but the attorney I retain tells me that it is proper that we could enter into a side letter of agreement because all of our contracts have an evergreen clause that means if we run into a situation where a union is three and a half years without a contract, mm -hmm. the last memorandum stands in full force and effect until a successor agreement can be reached. Okay, so this, this extra doesn't affect the patrolman and it doesn't affect what the supervisors will be doing going forward? Correct. So it's extra? It was an extra, yes, it was an extra uh, percent in our firearms pay to allow a one member of our union to receive a stipend that no one else gets. You got to understand we also have a past practice clause in our contract and the practice here for the last 40 years has been that a member of this union has moved up to the rank of police chief while his salary went to one dollar in the budget. This is the first time in my 20 years and my understanding the 20 years prior that we have someone serving as chief of police returning to the union. Okay, so, so you said this, this, doesn't, this doesn't have the past practice? Um, That's only a side letter of agreement. If you went to our collective... Okay, because I would say it's right That here. will be attached. But okay. if you... The original contract has a past practice clause. Okay. okay. So that 1% going forward gets incorporated into the supervisor's contract going forward. Right. Th but that's not why I was, the office. Yeah, that's why I asked. This, yep. What's in Sorry. here 
it has effect going forward, yes. but not for the other guys. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, um, Lieutenant. Thank you. Any further questions, Council? Uh, not from me. Thank you. Uh, Council Cruz, then Council Stewart, and then Council Dubois. Thank you. Uh, it's more a comment than a, than a question. Um, Lieutenant Mills, you said that you entered into an agreement, your union, last spring? Yes. So you have a new contract as of last spring? We have a small memorandum of agreement. Uh, it was a very modest increase that uh, my association you, felt you, was bad. You came to an agreement last spring? Yes. And, and I guess all I want to say is, you know, Mr. Mayor, we've talked about this. The 1% add-on is not just trying to fix a it was used, and I understand negotiations, it was used to placate the union over Captain Gomes coming back and looking towards the civilian chief. Let's not couch it and say that it was, to, if this union came to an ag agreement six months ago, uh, ten, ten months ago, and, and now we're saying, oh no, they got that one percent because of the patrolman union. They negotiated one thing, different unions look for different things. This, and again, I've told you I'll work with you on this, but let's not pretend that this 1% was to make up for the fact that the Patrolman's Union has a different, has 6%, not 5% or whatever it is on the, that was done as a way to, to placate the union because Captain Gomes is going back and you're looking to do a civilian, civilian chief. And that's all I want to say is it's, you certainly may. I, I guess my question would be, my question yeah, would be, a, a, if that's the case, if the case is that that's what it, what it really is, then certainly we understand that they'll be, underst they'll understand that union that they'll be looking for less next time around because they've already received that item. It is a point of fact that the patrolman's union does receive Well, I understand that, but what I'm saying is they negotiated that. Different unions, when you sit at the table, and again, we're not privy to negotiations as a legislative body, but in general, when a union sits down, their membership tells their leadership, you know, we're looking for this. The firemen last year wanted very strongly the 24-hour uh, shift. They looked for that and are willing to give up other things for that item because to that union that was an important thing. So when the patrolman's union last negotiated theirs, they negotiated a percent higher on that than you did. Theoretically, and I don't know what it was, you as a union looked for something else and, and took it. All I'm saying is let's not try to treat the people at home like they don't understand things. It was done as a negotiating tool to make this move forward. And that's how negotiations go, but let's not pretend it's something else. That's all I'm saying, and thank you. Council Cruz, thank you. Council Stewart. Uh, I'd, I'd like to respond to it if I can. Could answer that. To the council? Okay, sure. Um, you just tacked one little thing on at the end that I don't think belongs in the conversation. You said and also about the civilian police commissioner. Uh, I'm no, actually, I'm wrong I'm, about that. Right, I'm quite sure Lieutenant Mills' yeah. union is quite opposed to the, to the civilian yeah. police commissioner, and they didn't give us any concession on that. Um, but, you know, I'm a firm believer in the sanctity of the collective bargaining process. The union had a seat at the table. Um, it is an unusual situation because Captain Gomes is only 51 years old, and so usually when chiefs retire, they're older and they're not looking to go back to their old job. In this case, he wanted to go back to his old job. I'm very happy to have him back at his old job. Um, I'll tell you that some of that consulting language that Councillor Barnes referred to has already gone into effect. This afternoon, I had Captain Gomes and Chief Hayden in my office for over an hour working on transition issues <laughs> so that, uh, that there is a real benefit to Captain Gomes sticking around and Absolutely. continuing to serve. And I think we're very fortunate. It's like going out and hiring a great captain, and we're able to go out and hire one. So that's the conversation we'll have tomorrow night. Uh, but do you want to say there was some sort of a concession to the union? Yeah, there is every time. There was three parties at the table that all had different interests. And to pull everyone together, you, you, you address issues. And that was an issue that I agreed to address. As far as the deputy chief thing, starting to talk about that, you know, all, all I said was, I'll talk about it next time around. There was no commitment to do anything other than to agree to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Council Stewart. Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, Mr. Mayor, uh, to me, uh, so a as the mayor, there's sort of typically in cities, the, there are 
sort of three big principal departments. There's police, fire, schools, and some can argue you can add to that list, but that's typically where you, you are. It seems to me that this conversation around this negotiation really has to do with the fact that there was a police chief who had a contract that extended well into the end of your term. Um, you ran on a campaign uh, where you essentially indicated that you were not happy with the strategy uh, that was in place. So it seems reasonable that the CEO would want to have a person who they have confidence in. So this, this, this issue around the cost and the expense of this transition is less about the mayor needing or wanting to have someone who he has confidence in than it is that these contracts are extending into uh, the next mayor's terms. And so it seems clear to me that we need to make the, the police chief's term coterminous with the mayor so we're not having to negotiate these exorbitant agreements. And I, my fear is that this is going to happen again if we have this civilian police commissioner for a year and we end up then having in that person's place another police chief with another three-year term, the next mayor, and it could be you, but it, which may solve that problem, but if it's not you, will be faced with a similar situation of two options. One, keeping a person they may not have confidence in to save the city money or feeling they need to <coughs> expend those funds to make sure they have the right person to deliver on the strategy. Yeah, so I, I would say you made a pretty uh, effective argument for charter reform and I would tend to agree with you. My personal opinion is mayor should be a three-year term with all the department heads on coterminous three-year terms. Or the, contracts so have, or the contracts don't have to be three years and they can be coterminous with the mayor for two years. I mean, that's right, but a simpler I, my solution. My personal opinion is three and three and then when the voters vote to make a change, they understand that they have the opportunity to change the whole team. And if they elect a new mayor, they're also giving that mayor the ability to bring in their own team. But you're right. The chief or whoever runs the police department, and well, this is really for tomorrow night's topic, but right. you know, I, I think um, it's a critical position. And uh, I think the mayor should have the right to put the person leading the police department that they choose, that they have complete confidence in. Right. And, and so, so we can have this conversation tomorrow. I wanted to make that point. It does concern me. I do have a concern that the city would be asked and taxpayers would be asked to absorb this kind of expense when we're trying to create a position for a person and that person is being asked to serve in that position not for strategic reasons or issues of capacity but because of political favor. So that's something that I just want to make certain that we are well, I would just disagree with that word of political favor. I think I'm bringing the most highly qualified person I can find to lead the Brockton Police Department. And uh, as far as Captain Gomes, I, this additional expense idea, the cost is the cost of hiring a captain. That's, that's at the end of the day when you spend all this time going through all these lines, the additional cost in the change in leadership is that Captain Gomes is reassuming his captain's position. Captain's positions are very expensive. Right. And for I agree. Of, well, but for the city of Brockton where their medium income is well below what a captain makes, to have that additional captain, well, in, in, to have that additional captain there when that, that, to have that captain there when in fact that position was not necessary because that captain was a chief, and now to have that captain and a civilian commission on top of that is a real expense. Um, the expense is the cost of one additional captain. It, it, you, you can't count the same salary twice. So Gomes's salary is now being used as the captain. You're right. The cost of the commissioner uh, is in essence, well, the cost of Gomes' salary as captain is the additional cost. We, we filled a captain's position that was vacant. I think it's a, you know, a solid decision. Everyone agrees we need more police. This is the first police officer I'm hiring. I'm hiring a captain. We'll hire cadets in the future, but we're hiring a captain. Well, I, don't, I don't know. People can debate if that's yeah. the right decision in terms of the kind of policing capacity we need. But, well, and I, but I, I, my point really was to make certain we understand that this argument is really based on the fact that we have terms of a police chief going into a mayor's the full length of your, of your term or whatever that person's term, which, is, which forces this kind of decision to be made. I believe there's strong support both within the community and within the rank and file of the police department to affect change, and that's what I'm doing. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Constance DeWater, do you have another question? I just have, I just have one more question, and I'm sorry that I got um, caught up in this little side conversation. It's for Lieutenant Mills, please. 
Can you just, I know it's late, and that might be why I need you to explain it to me again, but could you please explain to me this past practice business about the 20 years you've been on and the 20 years before and the chief returning to the, to the captain's position? Can you kind of like just explain that again? Okay. It's in your contract or something, you said? Past practice is a clause in a contract. Yes. Council, what's the relevance on this relative to the resolve that was filed, the past practice definition? Because I'm just trying to figure out how uh, Captain Gomes was allowed to go back to his captain's position, and, and then this is, contract is about him going back to his ca captain's position. So uh, that was just what I was wondering, and I was wondering if it was connected to what he had said about the past practice. So I was Lieutenant, just, can you, Lieutenant Mills, can you answer that question? Well, I disagree. Bob Bacali was never chief. He was interim chief. That's right. He didn't have a contract. No, we didn't have a contract. I'm sorry. Your question. Do you feel comfortable in answering that question? Well, the whole past pra the past practice thing applies to the police supervisors union. When when Mr. Gomes left his permanent position and left our union and entered into an agreement with the city with a chief's contract, that's kind of hazy. I was just trying to make a point. I was asked an earlier question about the budget, and I was saying the past 40 year practice has been a member of the supervisors union has taken charge of the police department at chief therefore their salary went down to one so the difference was the difference between the chief's pay and in Mr. Gomes's case the captain's pay so this is the first time in 40 years he's coming back to the ranks and because of the stipend we allowed he is initially taking his chief's pay down Okay. And there's nobody going up to buffer the. Right. So there's still six captains. All the positions are filled instead of five captains with one there's position. one on leave being chief. Being the chief. I get you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant. Mr. Chairman. Point of information. Uh, there's six cap, but there's been six, six captains before with the chief, and they've all been filled. Not to leave. Correct. Le Le uh, chief Conlon was a lieutenant, correct? Usually the chief is a, is a lieutenant. It's, this is the first time in my career that a captain's taken the position. Usually chief Stadensky actually became chief as a lieutenant, stepped down to be promoted to so captain. So we, we had all six captain seats yes. filled? Yes. Thank you. But then we had a lieutenant vacant. So I have a vacant. We, only exactly. had, we had one less lieutenant. And that's set by contract, that they were allowed to come back? Yes, here. they take a leave of absence to perform the duties as chief. Constance, we have breakfast being delivered in 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Councilors, any other questions relative to this? Add number to a vote. Motion to, motion to send that back favorable. Second. Second. Favorable recommendation. Uh, properly seconded. All in favor? All opposed. Motion carries. Favorable recommendation. Motion to postpone number 20. Second. To when? The next finance committee meeting. <coughs> Motions please. were made to postpone properly seconded. The next FedCom meeting. Number 20. All in favor? Postponement? All opposed? Po -po postpone until next FedCom. Number 22. I'm sorry. Number 22 on the agenda, it's yours? Oh, yes, I want to actually have that postponed as well. Oh, okay. So we might not get breakfast, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> uh, motion's been made to uh, postpone the next Fed call second. properly. Second. All in favor? Yes. All opposed? Motion carries. Councilors again tomorrow night. Uh, Councilor Yanieri will be chairing 6 o'clock here, Ordinance Committee. Thank you. Meetings here by adjourned.